And now, our feature presentation. Berlin, Germany, 1999. The guard at the east door of the old flak tower in what had once been East Berlin came completely alert and stepped out of the deeply recessed doorway where he had sought shelter from the bite of the spring wind. The big man who had parked his car on the corner and was approaching him looked like bad news. The guard himself was a big man, bigger in fact than the smiling stranger. But something about the man's purposeful stride and his cold blue eyes set off alarm bells. The guard's hand slid into the pocket of his overcoat, wrapped around the grip of the 9mm Makarov PM pistol, and flicked off the safety. The stranger had a Berlin guidebook in his left hand and held it out, open to a street map. Uh, do you speak English? I'm looking for the Hohenzollern Dam. Buzz off, Joe. The stranger's facial expression didn't change at the rude rebuff, but his ice-blue eyes grew even colder as he triggered the silenced Walther PPK concealed in his right hand. <laughs> Boland tilted his head and spoke into his comm link. Mine's down. Mikado here. Copy. In CISO reporting, so's mine. Are we go, Red Team? Hawkins here. Copy, rock and roll. Gene to the go. Manic, hold up, I've got a... No, it's okay, I'm go. What was it? I thought I had a stray bandit, but it was just a guy in a leather jacket running to catch a bus. Bolin then radioed to Yakov Katzenellenbogen at their mobile command post parked several blocks away. Here we go. Copy all go. Wait for gadgets to kill the surveillance system. Roger. Herman Gadget Schwartz's voice came on the line a moment later. You're go for entry. That is go. Repeat. Phoenix is a go. All right. Let's do it, mates. On McCarter's command, the six men slipped through the doors leading into the ground floor of the tower. Bolin and Phoenix Force were on the move. Heinz Blotz pulled the German-made 85mm RPG rocket round out of its plastic shipping canister to check that the somewhat fragile nose fuse was intact before repacking it and putting it into the nylon bag on the table. Normally, he wouldn't have needed to inspect the rockets, but these particular rounds hadn't come to him directly from an arsenal. They had been in the hands of black marketeers since the fall of the wall and could have been damaged by improper handling before they came to him. Blatz was intimately familiar with the Russian-designed RPG-7 anti-tank rocket launcher. Before the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the German Democratic Republic, he had been a sergeant major in the once-feared East German border police. The communist forces had been armed with Russian weapons, and he had fired the RPG launcher hundreds of times in training. It was good at what it did, and he liked it. The RPG was not only a superb weapon for busting armored vehicles, it was useful for opening bank vaults as well. A single shot was all it took to blast a hole through up to three feet of concrete, and vault doors were a snap. He and his men had an appointment with a bank in a few hours, and he wanted to be ready for it. This would be their fourth bank job in the past six months, and the last one before they took a well-earned vacation in Spain. Blatz's comrades in the bank business were all ex-East German border guards as well. The border police had been an elite unit and had attracted many of the same kinds of men who had enlisted in the earlier Nazi SS. It could be said that the border guards had been very good at following orders and not very good at considering human life to have much value. That decided lack of regard for human life made Blatz's gang as good at their new profession as they had been at their old one. Anyone who was unfortunate enough to get in the way during one of their bank jobs simply ended up dead. Blatz had shot so many East Germans trying to flee the now defunct worker's paradise that adding a few West Germans to his body count was no big deal. As soon as the RPG round had been checked, Blatz turned to the man loading 7.62 millimeter rounds into AKM assault rifle magazines. Are you done with those, Dieter? Former Corporal Dieter Glantz answered, holding up the magazines. Yeah, we have four magazines each. The radios all check out. 
Of all the gang members, Franz Beckmann had been with Blatz the longest. They had served together for many years, and as far as he was concerned, the banking business, as Blatz called it, was almost as much fun as what they had done with the border police. Gunning down runners, as they had been called, had been fun, but it hadn't paid very well. At the most, they had received a small bonus for every man, woman, or child they blew away in the wire, and maybe a party for the unit. Reaching around for another RPG rocket from the open wooden ammo crate, Blatz's eyes swept past the bank of video monitors mounted on his workbench. All of them were blank. He figured that the surveillance system had gone down again from a power surge and punched the reset button. When the cameras didn't come back on, he reached for the handheld radio. Conrad! Conrad! He checked to see that the battery indicator on the radio was lighted before trying again. Conrad! Gunter! You bastards! Damn it! Where are you? Listening to his boss, Glenn stopped loading magazines, reached for his AKM, and pulled back on the charging handle to chamber around. He had served with Gunter and Conrad for a long time, and if they weren't answering the radio, something was wrong. Blatz quickly followed his subordinate's cue and reached for his own weapon. Send Manny and Heinrich down there and find out what the hell is going on. Yes, sir. The ground floor of the old flak tower was being used as a service station and parking garage. Left over from the dark days of World War II, the anti-aircraft artillery structures still dotted Berlin. They had been built so well that they had withstood the storm of bombs and artillery shells that had obliterated so much of the Third Reich's capital. Because of the thickness of their reinforced concrete walls and floors, good use had been made of them after the war. A dozen cars were parked against the walls by the maintenance lifts, and gas pumps were positioned by the main door for drive-in service. Leading up from the garage area was a spiraling ramp that provided access to the upper floors and more parking places. Katz had been able to secure a plan of the massive structure, so the Stony Man team knew that there were three floors above them as well as two below ground level. The plans also indicated that there were office spaces on the upper floor, and that was where the strike force was headed. As well as the ramp, an elevator shaft connected the floors, but that wasn't the optimal avenue of approach to the upper floors. Getting trapped in an elevator was a good way to die. After making sure that the ground floor was clear, the commandos shucked their thick civilian overcoats, freeing themselves for action. Calvin James and T.J. Hawkins led the way up the spiraling ramp. They were making the turn onto the second floor when they heard their opposition. Any chance they'd had of surprising the gang evaporated. James reporting, we're about to encounter resistance. James and Hawkins pressed themselves against the walls on each side of the ramp, their silenced MP5 SD submachine guns at the ready. The two men descending the ramp carried paratroop AKM assault rifles, but they weren't held in immediate firing position. With the two Phoenix Force commandos hidden in the shadows, the Germans didn't spot them until it was too late. Two down. We're right behind you. Keep going. Heinz Blatz heard the scuffle and the silence that followed. He reached for his radio. Manny! Heinrich! When there was no immediate answer, Blatz signaled for his men to take cover. Somehow, his hideout had been betrayed, and their only chance to survive was to fight. Snatching up one of the RPG launchers, he quickly stuffed a grenade into the front and thumbed back the hammer. Firing an RPG in an enclosed area was admittedly risky, but if this was a police raid, he might need its firepower before it was over. The Phoenix Force commandos knew that the tactical advantage always lay with the guy holding the high ground. That axiom of war was as true when you were fighting in a building as it was in open ground combat. The way to overcome that advantage was to attack, and James and Hawkins were more than happy to do it. Flashbang? Thought you'd never ask. The reflected flash of the grenade illuminated the dim ramp like an arc light. McCarter risked a glance from his cover and spotted their target. The dossier he was given before the mission had a picture of Heinz Blatz. He saw their target bringing up his RPG launcher. There wasn't much time, but their orders were to bring him in alive. That one! Manning, take him down, now! Manning drew the CO2-powered dart pistol from the special holster under his left arm and took aim. When the Germans saw the long pistol aimed at him, he dropped the RPG and tried to dive for cover. The dart caught him while he was still in the air. Slamming into his back, the auto-injector flooded his system with enough tranquilizer to instantly knock him out. McCarter wasn't in the mood for a language lesson right at that moment. In the sudden silence, Manning crossed the floor and knelt beside the unconscious Blatz. After checking his pulse, he quickly pulled his arms behind his back and slipped plastic riot restraints over his wrists. Is he out? Oh, he's out. Ugh. 
Manning picked up the unconscious man and draped him over his shoulder. Let's get out of here. Leaving the bodies in place, the Phoenix Force commandos hurried back down the ramp. Even with the tower's thick walls, someone would have heard the flashbang grenades, and the efficient Berlin police would be on the way. In a world at war with terrorists, America needs a covert last line of defense. A special operations group unbound by standard rules and procedures, and answerable only to the Oval Office. A team of battlefield commandos and cyber warriors takes the most direct approach, stemming the tide of global terrorism and high crime. As the court of last resort, they handle the dirty work no other government agency can touch. Graphic Audio presents Don Pendleton's Stony Man. Narrated by Terence Aselford, with performances by Nanette Savard, Richard Rowan, Thomas Penny, Christopher Graybill, David Coyne, Jeff Baker, Karen Carbone, Casey Jones, Dolores King Williams, and Mort Shelby. Stony Man number 39, Breach of Trust. Jack Grimaldi sat behind the wheel of a Mercedes van parked at the corner of the block. The tower took up most of the block, but a ring of small stores and shops had been built around its base. Grimaldi's white van bore the elaborate red, pink, yellow, and green advertisements of a local flower supplier on the sides. The markings were printed on magnetic plastic sheets that could be removed easily and replaced with another logo. James had said that the gaudy van looked like a pimp's delivery wagon, but in a flower-loving city like Berlin, dozens of vans exactly like it could be seen on the streets almost any time of day. It was the perfect getaway car. Herman Gadget Schwartz sat next to him, bouncing his leg up and down. I sure wish you were standing by somewhere with a chopper. I'd sure as hell rather fly out of a situation like this. Not in Berlin, you wouldn't. They got the most restricted air traffic control in all of Europe. We'd never be able to get out without a chase. Looking at the traffic in this damn town, I don't see how in hell we're gonna get through it on time. This is nothing. You should try driving in Athens. That's some real traffic. We're ready for pickup. On the way! Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Yakov Katz and Ellen Bogan's face showed on the video monitor in the Stony Man computer room. It wore a big grin. Katz here. Stryker has just reported closure. Grimaldi made the pickup, and they're headed out of town now. For this operation, Katz, the Stony Man tactical advisor, was running a mobile command post out of a van emblazoned with prominent CNN markings. Since the equipment and antennas he needed to talk to the farm were the kind of things one would expect to see on a TV van, it was a perfect disguise. The target was neutralized, and the Berlin police have been tipped off, anonymously, of course. They should be closing in on the flak tower any time now. Good work, Katz. As Stony Man's mission controller, Barbara Price always felt a deep sense of satisfaction when one of her plans went off without a hitch. This had been a little more difficult than their usual mission, and had carried risks the Stony Man teams usually didn't have to deal with. Conducting a raid in broad daylight in one of Western Europe's largest cities without the knowledge of the local authorities always raised the stakes. Had the Berlin police stumbled onto the Phoenix Force's operation, it would have been all over for the Stony Man commandos. They would have been incarcerated as terrorists until high-level behind-the-scenes negotiations could free them, and the political fallout would have been catastrophic. Headlines about U.S. secret operatives being caught committing a terrorist act in a NATO nation wouldn't have been helpful. Nonetheless, the president had decided that it was an acceptable risk. Did they make the snatch? Hal Brignola was chewing on the stub of an unlit cigar clamped in a corner of his mouth. He had quit smoking a long time ago, but still had to get his nicotine fix somehow. The snatch was successful, and I've made contact to initiate the transfer. Very good. Hopefully they'll be able to find out what the hell is going on over there and give us more leads to follow up. On the rolls of the federal civil servants, Brignola was listed as a high-ranking official of the Justice Department. In reality, he was the man responsible for the activities of the covert organization known as the Sensitive Operations Group. Being in charge of the nation's most closely guarded secret operation was no easy job. 
balancing the realities of sensitive operations, as they were called, with Washington, D.C.'s political wishful thinking played hell with the lining of his stomach, particularly at a time like this, when he had to wait for information from halfway around the world so he could pass it on to the president, who would then let the Russians know what had gone down. The irony of his situation this time wasn't lost on him. The Stony Man teams had been formed to fight international terrorism that, more times than not, had been sponsored by the old Soviet Union. With the fall of the communist regime in 1991, however, America's Cold War opponents had become their new allies. Since then, the struggling new government had asked for American assistance several times. In particular, they needed help dealing with the fast-growing criminal element born out of the democratic reforms. Under the Soviet Union, criminal activity had been a monopoly of the communist government. However, with the transfer of power to the Russian people, the opportunity to do evil had been given to them as well. Unfortunately, certain elements of the new Russia had taken advantage of this opportunity with a vengeance. Every vice of the Western world could now be found in any small Russian town, and since most of those vices were the same crimes as those in the West, they were supplied by criminals. Also, since the transition to a capitalistic economy wasn't going well, there was money to be made in the control of scarce commodities and goods. That meant price gouging and smuggling, two more enterprises where criminals excelled. While the DEA and FBI worked closely with the Russians providing training and advice, they had come up against something they couldn't deal with even with that help. This time, the Russian Mafia, as these criminal gangs had come to be known, was taking its operations to new heights. All of Europe, not just Russia and the new eastern nations, was suffering from a Russian-sponsored crime wave surpassing anything ever seen in the West. And the Russian government found itself helpless against this new onslaught. When intelligence indicated that the Russian mafia was actively expanding its operations into eastern European states, from Latvia to the Ukraine, Russia decided to ask the United States for more active assistance. The president had turned that request for action over to Stony Man Farm. You know, I never thought I'd see the day when we'd be fighting alongside the Russian government against a Russian-backed Euro Mafia. This is just a little too weird for me. Well, no one ever said that the Russians aren't an imaginative people. They looked around, saw how well-organized crime was doing in the West, and decided to try it themselves. But Bear, it's not just a Russian problem this time. All of the old Eastern Bloc nations are having problems with organized crime right now. How long are Stryker and Phoenix going to stay in Munich? As long as it takes for the Russians to interrogate the prisoner. Then we'll reevaluate the situation and see what we can do next for them. There'll be something. You can take that to the bank. They won't be able to get a handle on this themselves. According to Minister Valensikov, the Russian agencies are riddled with spies that let the gangs know every move the government tries to make against them. Nothing ever changes over there, does it? No, unfortunately. Gregor Rostov, ex-colonel of the 105th Guards Regiment, sat in his office complex several miles outside Moscow, going through a stack of reports. Rostov was a dynamic man, tall and fit, and his rugged good looks had served him well, both in the Red Army and his new civilian career. Watching him in action, it was easy to believe that he would do anything he said he would, whatever that might be. While he never had spelled out his long-range plans, they did include becoming the most powerful man in what had been the Soviet Union and its eastern satellite nations. Though he was still a few years away from meeting his goals, he was already one of the most powerful men in the criminal underground of the new Russia. As he had discovered, gaining power in a democracy required thinking on one's feet while taking risks, and Rostov was a well-known risk-taker with an agile mind. The men he had gathered into his organization were also quick-witted, but their greatest value was their loyalty to him and his plans. Come. We may have a problem, sir. Former Major Boris Detloff came to attention as he reported to his old CO and now his civilian boss. Like Rostov, he too had been dismissed from the Red Army and had loyally followed his colonel into his new venture. And that is... I believe the Americans are sticking their long noses into our business. Though Rostov ran his organization like a military unit, he insisted that his men always refer to themselves as businessmen, and what they did as a business, which in a way it was. But their business was what other people usually called organized crime. 
By whatever name the business was called, it paid well, and Rostov was quickly becoming one of the new Russia's wealthiest men. His followers were becoming wealthy right along with him, which served to cement their loyalty even further. What happened? The scheduled operation in Berlin was intercepted. A strike force hit Blatz's headquarters and wiped it out completely. It's all over the German TV news. Hmm. Let's have a look. The converted SS-22 ICBM missile launch complex Rostov called his business headquarters hadn't been stripped of its military electronics before it had been offered for sale on the civilian market. One of the disgraced colonel's old Red Army contacts had been the officer in charge of demilitarizing excess military property before offering it for sale. As a result, the facility retained all of its military computer and communication equipment. Even more important, this particular complex had been what the old Soviet military had called a mother center. Not only was it an ICBM launch command post, but it was also a military satellite communications facility and a computer control center. It had been built to command other launch sites if their links to central control were broken. With this sophisticated equipment intact, Rostov owned a facility unmatched by anything in civilian hands anywhere in the world. Only major military forces operated the kind of equipment that Rostov had been able to purchase for next to nothing. One of his mainframe supercomputers alone was worth more than he had paid for the entire complex, and three such powerful mainframes had come with the deal. Entering what had been the launch control center, Detloff seated himself behind one of the computers and punched in a command. Been a major incident near the Berlin Wall. Reports vary, but from what we've been able to ascertain, persons unknown stormed a nearby flak tower and killed seven men. A brief search throughout the facilities uncovered over seven million dollars. Officers suspect that this money is connected to the recent string of high-profile bank robberies. At this moment, we do not know the identities of the men who destroyed this sophisticated laundering operation, but officers are not ruling out a rival gang or a federal sting gone awry. Reporting live from Berlin, this is Chris... We needed that inventory. Rostov made it a point to always use business vocabulary as part of his overall security plan. He headed a business now, and the use of military terminology wasn't compatible with business activities. It set the wrong tone when he had to deal with civilians. The brutal reputation of the old Red Army hadn't faded yet. Why do you think that it was our American competitors who blocked this transaction? It was certainly not the German police. I would have heard about it from our representatives. As an ex-GRU or military intelligence officer, Detloff ran Rostov's network of representatives. But by whatever name, a spy was someone who supplied needed information. With Rostov's wealth, he could afford to hire as many representatives as he needed, and to make sure that they stayed loyal to him, he paid them well. What do our Rome and Paris representatives have to say about this? They were just as surprised about it as I was. Then you don't think that it was a move by one of our European competitors? In Rostov's lexicon, Europe's old line criminal enterprises, the Italian Mafia, the Union Corse, the French narco gangs and others were his friendly competition. They, however, didn't quite see things that way. There was nothing friendly about what Rostov was trying to do. The established European gangs had long agreed to a live-and-let-live live mentality that gave everyone a cut of the pie, and turf wars were rare. Rostov didn't hold to such gentlemen's agreements and was crashing the party. One thing that made Rostov's criminal enterprises different from the norm was his eagerness to rush into any venture, no matter how dangerous, that could turn a profit. Where the old line European gangs had been reluctant to deal in matters that might bring them to the attention of NATO or other military forces, Rostov simply didn't care. Since many of his operatives were veterans of the Afghan war, they had an expertise in weaponry that most of Europe's underworld didn't have. And he wasn't shy about unleashing it. The military nature of Rostov's operation had created a level of criminal violence beyond anything ever seen in the West. Fighting turf wars with RPGs and AKs had become a trademark of his operations. It was not our European competitors. They would not have left the inventory behind. Apparently nothing was missing and the police are saying that they recovered almost eight million dollars worth. You are completely convinced that it was the Americans who did this? Yes, sir. 
If you remember, I predicted this when I learned about Valinsikov's secret visit to the White House. And this is not the first time that they have cooperated with the government in this manner. As you know, the FBI, the DEA, and other agencies have been advising Moscow on so-called crime issues for some time now. Mm, it is truly a sad day when we Russians cannot govern ourselves without having American big brothers watching over our shoulders. What branch of the American intelligence apparatus do you think is most likely to be the one involved in this action? You think the CIA? This was not a CIA action. They simply do not operate that way. Had they been planning an operation against us, they would have coordinated with the German government and the Berlin police before they did anything. They would not have struck without warning, as was apparently done. So, you think that it was some deep cover clandestine organization? Yes, I do. I have heard rumblings of a group known as Phoenix Force. What do you think we need to do to protect our operations? I think that we should devote some of our resources to eliminating these particular competitors. Mm, that's what I think too. Start planning it and put out the word that we want everything we can get on these men. No matter how undercover this Phoenix Force is, someone has to know something about them. I think that some of our new associates may be able to help us with this. Perhaps one of them has come up against this group in the past, and they may have information we can use. One of the things that made Rostov's operation different from all of the other Russian mafia organizations was that he recruited followers from outside Mother Russia herself. Using his old Red Army and ex-KGB contacts, he had invited the IRA, the Red Brigades, and various other terrorist groups to join his plans to dismember the new Eastern democracies. With these groups providing experienced foot soldiers to back up his Red Army veterans, Rostov had more firepower than many of the emerging national armies he was targeting. Good idea. See if anybody knows about this Phoenix Force. At once, sir. Berlin, Germany. As Jack Grimaldi had predicted, he had no difficulty weaving his way through the congested Berlin traffic. The number one rule of the road in Germany seemed to be that the bigger vehicle automatically had the right of way. In the van's passenger seat, Hermann Schwartz kept a death grip on his seatbelt harness until they reached the Stadtring, the freeway that circled the city. From there, it was a fast trip to the entrance to the Frankfurt-Berlin Autobahn. Once westbound on the Autobahn, Schwartz relaxed a little. He looked out the window as a solid stream of cars passed them in the fast lane. This isn't so bad. It's just like the Santa Monica Freeway. Hell, the fast lane zipping right by us. We're only going... 150? What's that at miles per hour? 95. Schwartz resumed his death grip on the harness. Oh, shit. You had to tell me that, didn't you? Hey, you asked. At the first roadside rest stop in what had been East Germany, Grimaldi pulled into the parking lot and stashed the van between two long-haul rigs to wait for the arrival of Katzenellenbogen's CP van. When Katz showed up half an hour later, the still unconscious Heinz Blatz was transferred to the larger vehicle. As the team's medic, James checked him over and gave him another shot to keep him out until the Russians arrived to take him off their hands. In the meantime, the team slipped into the rest stop canteen one at a time to get coffee and something to eat. When the black Mercedes sedan finally arrived, Blatz was transferred to the custody of the Russians and they drove off with him. In accordance with the agreement the president had made with the Russians, they would handle the interrogation of any suspects who survived the Stony Man operations. As soon as the Mercedes was out of sight, Grimaldi took the removable Berlin florist shop markings off the van and replaced them with the logo of a Frankfurt chemical company. That would be their stopover destination while they prepped for the next mission. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Hal Brignola was glad to hear that the transfer of Blatz had gone off without a hitch. He might not enjoy working with the Russians, but this wasn't the first time that the Stony Man teams had undertaken a mission in cooperation with the new democratic Russia, and he knew that it wouldn't be the last. This operation had been kicked off when Valensikov, the Russian Minister of the Interior, made a secretive, unofficial visit to the Oval Office. After providing the president hard evidence of the threat posed by the criminal gangs, he asked him to help his country put an end to this threat to the democracy they both wanted to survive. As Valensikov had pointed out, the Russian mafia had gained so much power that the government could no longer control it. 
Moscow's fear was that if the Russian military command felt that the nation was slipping into anarchy, it would take over and impose a new dictatorship. Since America's best interests were for Russia and Eastern Europe to join the West in becoming strong and independent democracies, this wave of criminal violence represented a clear and present danger to U.S. national security. In the spirit of democratic cooperation, the president offered the Russians the services of America's most experienced covert action agency. The president's offer had been gratefully accepted, and Phoenix Force, as well as Able Team, who usually operated domestically, were dispatched to Europe to follow up on the one lead Valensikov had provided. Now that the bank-busting gang had been eliminated, they would wait and see what leads came from the interrogation of the prisoner. Brignola knew that the one raid wouldn't put an end to the problem. The Stony Man warriors would have to fight again before this situation was turned around. But for the time being, Brignola had good news to take back to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. After putting Boris Detloff to work, finding out what had gone wrong in Berlin, Gregor Rostov went to his private office. The room in the launch complex reflected his old occupation as a combat soldier more than it did his new one as a wealthy criminal. It was sparse to the point of being little more than a small room with a desk, lamp and chair. While the rest of Rostov's complex had state-of-the-art communications gear and computers, this office had only a single military field phone on the desk. As humble as it was, this simple brown plastic instrument was probably the most important telephone in all of the new Russia. Rostov's field phone was hooked up to a single user line, and the phone on the other end sat on the desk of an old Red Army comrade of his, General Pavel Belislav. In forced retirement since the abortive coup attempt that had put Boris Yeltsin in office, Belislav hadn't been content to sit in his dacha and drink himself to death. Instead, he had put together a clique of other dissatisfied officers who intended to overthrow the faltering civilian government and install army rule to halt the slide of Russia to third world status. So far, they had done little except plan and recruit while they waited for the right opportunity to make their move. Though he was running an independent criminal organization for his own benefit, Rostov was an integral part of the Belislav group as well. In fact, his criminal enterprises were the major source of support for the general's plans. With the Russian economy as bad as it was, it was difficult for anyone to acquire enough money to support something like a government takeover except through criminal activities. For this reason alone, the Americans had to be dealt with quickly. The Berlin raid had been a major setback, and it would take several months for him to make back the losses. Heinz Blatz and his unit were particularly valuable assets for his operation. They had the discipline that most of the new partners lacked, which was why he had given them the mission of acquiring bank assets. Now he would have to train another unit to take over their assignment, maybe one of the Irish teams. But to ensure that something like this didn't happen again, his priority had to be eliminating Phoenix Force as soon as possible. While the Americans needed to be taken care of immediately, their actions might be the triggering incident General Belislav had been looking for. For the Russian government to have relied on a covert American military strike force to deal with a domestic problem was an affront to every Russian. The modern Russians might be pale imitations of the heroic men and women who had struggled to bring their nation out of the Dark Ages under Lenin and Stalin, but they still had pride. Sometimes that pride was hard to see in the ragged people who walked the streets of Moscow nowadays. But Rostov knew that it was still there. In the breast of every Russian beat the heart of the same men who had beaten back the Nazi hordes and defeated the Third Reich. The Russian people could be great again, but the soul-sucking capitalists had to be put down before that could happen. Rostov knew that Valensikov had invited the Americans in to deal with his organization because he couldn't trust his fellow Russians to do it. And he was right. Between Rostov and Belislav, they had an interlocking web of spies and informants that reached into every nook and cranny of the government. Their access into the police and military was almost as good. When sole power eventually fell to Belislav's military clique, Rostov wouldn't claim a spot in the general's new government. He had no need to massage his ego through the accolades of others. He would be in the heart of government, but he would never be in the spotlight, any spotlight. He had seen the fate of others who chased after public acclaim. They either died or their efforts were stymied by the jealousies of others. He would let General Belislav and his cronies bask in the glow of public worship while he ruled an empire larger than Napoleon's. 
First, though, he had to brief the general on the failure of the Berlin operation. He wouldn't tell him about the Americans until he had worked out a plan to deal with them. Belislav tended to get excited when Americans were mentioned, and he didn't want to deal with that right now. It was time to call the general. Rostov? Comrade General Belislav, we have a problem. As well as being Gregor Rostov's right-hand man, Boris Detloff was also his in-house computer wizard. Unlike the United States, the new Russia wasn't living in the Internet. Few computers existed outside the government and the military, and even there, there weren't many except in the rocket and space forces. And, of course, the GRU, the Military Intelligence Service. As an ex-military intelligence officer, Detloff had been well-trained in the use of cyberspace to gather information. The facilities of the launch complex Rostov had procured had been designed to function as the center of a Russian version of the Internet. From there, he was able to access almost any computer in Russia, including those in use by the Russian offices of Western companies. When he logged into the computers of the Interior Ministry, he was shocked to learn that there had been a survivor of the Berlin Flak Tower shootout and that he had been turned over to the Russian government. Since all of the former East Germans knew enough about Rostov's operation to be dangerous, he wasted no time. Hello? Is this Stanislav? Speaking. This is your contact for Rostov. Your superiors have a man named Heinz Blatz. He is not to talk under any circumstances. I want him silenced. Rostov will be pleased if you were to make this happen. Do you understand? I understand. Thank you for trusting me with this. I will not let you down. I should hope not. Rostov wasn't concerned that Detloff had ordered Blatz's death without consulting him. He trusted all of his top men to make decisions when they were needed. He only reserved the right to make the ultimate decisions, like how to deal with the Americans. Rostov answered the call. This is Detloff. Good to hear from you. Have you come up with any ideas on how to deal with this American commando team? Actually, I have. But I came to the conclusion that it might be better for us in the long run if I did not have them all killed outright. I am listening. As I thought would happen, several of our new associates were able to give me bits and pieces of information about this unit. After going over it, I started thinking that it might be a mistake to have them all killed. It would take care of the problem for now, that is true, but it might invite more attention to our activities than we need at this time. Attention from the CIA. If, however, a few of them were to be killed under circumstances that point to their having been sold out by the Russian government they are supposed to be helping, it might get the Americans out of our business completely. Regardless of what their president says about his willingness to cooperate with Moscow, they do not trust us any more than we trust them. If he loses valuable assets because the government can't keep a secret, he might change his mind. <laughs> I like the way you think, Detloff. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Hal Brignola's sense of satisfaction about the Berlin operation quickly faded. No sooner had he returned from reporting to the White House that the Stony Man team had pulled it off than he was informed that a problem had come up during the interrogation of the prisoner. The prisoner from the Berlin mission died in custody. My God, what happened? <sighs> Belenzikov wasn't kidding when he said that the Russian Mafia has their people planted everywhere. This guy was in a high-security cell, and they still got to him. Does that put us back to square one? Not really. The Russians have come up with another lead that may prove to be even better. The team will have to go to Prague to check it out, but it should be well worth the trip. What's there? The headquarters of one of the biggest drug distribution operations in all of the eastern countries. That sounds like an interesting proposition. It should be, because we were given the names of a couple of the major Czech players there. The team should be able to make contact with them and then play it from there. Give me the particulars and I'll start putting the operation together. They're going for it. My contact says Valinsikov has been notified that this Phoenix force is headed to Prague to follow up on the lead they were given. Good work. One thing, though, when you take them out, I want you to capture some of them, if at all possible. Like they did with Blatz? Exactly. 
Since these people have made themselves my enemy, I need to know as much as I can about them. I want it done in a way that keeps them from learning that I am onto them. That should be no problem. My team is well trained. I expect no complications. When are you leaving? This afternoon. This time, the gathering of players in the farm's war room didn't have the sense of urgency that the pre-mission briefings usually did. This wasn't crisis management, merely a skull session with the farm team to go over the last few points of the Prague operation with Hal Brignola so he could bring the president up to date. Having Yakov Katz and Ellenbogen in the field with a mobile command post was working out well. Katz for short, Katz and Ellenbogen received his training working for Mossad in Israel. There he gained untold skills and experience and lost his right arm to a landmine. He had been tapped as the tactical operations officer in the field for Phoenix Force for this mission, due to his ability to speak seven languages, including German and Russian. Since the Stony Man van was equipped with full data uplink capabilities, the computer room staff was able to get data to him almost as soon as they got it. By the same token, Katz could keep them instantly abreast of any changes on his end. Barbara Price opened the meeting. Okay, people, here's the drill. We are go for the attempt to infiltrate the Russian Mafia's narcotics operation in Prague. We have the names and contact numbers for two of the biggest Czech players, and Able Team will make the initial contact. They'll be posing as overseas agents for an American Mafia group that wants to make a connection to the Afghan pipeline. Why not try for the Iranian heroin connection? That's a bigger network, isn't it? It is, but we chose the Afghans because they're starting to figure prominently in the European drug trade. Even with the country in the hands of the Taliban fundamentalists, they realize they need cash flow, and it makes sense that U.S. dealers would want to get a piece of that action. Our buyers will know that means making a connection with the Russian mafia, since they have a monopoly on the Afghan hash production. Even with the bad blood between the two nations, the Afghans know the Russians and are used to dealing with them. The way Katz has set up this scenario, Rosario will be playing the role of the Mafia capo with gadgets as his money man and Carl as the muscle. Everyone smiled at that lineup. Rosario Blancanales, known as the politician, was perfect as a modern Mafia frontman, and Carl Lyons was as tough as any gunman ever needed to be. What's Phoenix's role going to be in this? Katz wants to hold them in reserve this time. He doesn't want to have too many people exposed at one time. But they'll be standing by and ready to support Lyons if anything goes wrong. And even though we're not expecting trouble, Stryker's going along with Able Team as their wheelman. He'll be their instant backup. What's the follow-up plan? After they make the trial buy, they're going to wait a couple of days, as if talking to their principals, and then try to set up a major transaction. A million dollars worth or more. Katz figures that the Czechs will have to call on their Russian partners to supply that much product, and that's when we'll use Phoenix to grab the lot of them. We're hoping that will net us a couple of the major Russian players. If it works, we'll turn them over to Volinsikov again. Hopefully this time they'll be able to keep them alive long enough to find out what they know. Brignola was satisfied. Since the Berlin raid had only been partially successful, the White House was very anxious to see this go down to help the Russians. Anything that would make that happen was welcome. This was a good plan, nothing too flashy, but one that should produce for them. It sounds good to me. Tell them to proceed. They'll make the initial contact within the hour. The Prague operation went well right from the beginning. It didn't take long for the Stony Man team to learn that the information Brignola had received from the Russian minister was right on. There was a large drug ring operating within the Czech capital city, and they were ready to deal with the Americans. A meeting place was set up for the first buy. Carl Lyons didn't look out of place on the streets of Prague. There were a lot of tall blonde men in the city, and the Stony Man team had gone shopping for European clothing during their layover in Frankfurt. The one thing that always marked Americans visiting Europe was their distinctive Yankee clothing. Everyone had packed away their blue jeans and gone in for a complete makeover. Schwartz was also dressed in Euro clothes, but he had insisted on wearing his cowboy boots with his new threads. Rosario Blancanales was a clothes horse anyway, and now he looked like he had just flown into town from Rome or Milan. When they had outfitted themselves, they had gone for the Armani look all the way, with footwear by Gucci. And since he was playing the capo, he had to have that expensive look. 
American drug dealers weren't shy when it came to flash and spending money on clothing. None of the Able Team trio was wired for this meeting. Checking for wires was now a standard security measure throughout the world's professional criminal underground, and they couldn't risk it. Plus, if their information about ex-Russian military personnel being involved in the European gangs was true, they could also expect to be swept for electronic bugs. Luckily, the only bugs the team had were their emergency beepers covertly placed in their boots. The beepers used an emergency one-way coded transmitter that gave their location to Stony Man Farm. Virtually undetectable, the transmitters were given out in unfamiliar areas where the team could get separated. On the day of the buy, Able Team stopped by Katz's CP van for a last-minute briefing. Are you guys ready for this? As ready as we're ever going to be, let's do it. Katz handed Schwartz a thin black briefcase. But Agnola wanted me to remind you not to lose that on the way to the meeting. If you do, it'll come out of your allowance. That's 200 G's, right? Sure is. That's a lot of allowance. And he'll charge you interest while you're paying it back. Bummer. David McCarter was in the CP van to see Able Team off. The rest of Phoenix Force was waiting in their rented van four blocks from the meeting place, ready to go into action if they were needed. The fact that McCarter had left them to watch the operation with Katz, however, meant that he didn't think there was going to be a problem. With Mac Bolan behind the wheel of Able Team's leased Mercedes sedan, they drove to the east of the town to the empty factory building that was the designated meeting place. With the rapid pace of economic re-engineering in the Czech Republic, it was cheaper to abandon older factories instead of trying to modernize them to fit a new industry. In time, it would be torn down to make way for new construction, but for now, it stood and made a good place for a clandestine drug deal. Bolin drove into the factory compound and parked the car so that they could make a quick getaway if necessary. Schwartz, you got the briefcase? I'd never forget the cash. Let's get this on the road, guys. Lyons' eyes swept the abandoned site, looking for snipers or any signs of a setup. Since he was posing as a Mafia bodyguard, he was wearing his Colt Python pistol openly. Gunmen were supposed to be armed. When he stepped out of the car, he pulled back his coat to expose the butt of the big Colt riding in his shoulder rig. Three speed loaders full of 357 Magnum hollow point rounds rode in his jacket pocket just in case. Schwartz and Blum Canellis were both packing Walther PPKs in shadow holsters in the small of their backs. The Czechs would expect that because everyone who watched the movies knew that the Mafia never left home without being strapped. Two Czech hardmen with subguns stood outside the door. When they saw that Lyons was carrying a weapon, they stiffened, but they let him pass. They didn't try to pat down Schwartz or Blancanales. One of the guards showed the trio into a room that had to have been the main office when the factory was in production. All that remained of its furniture was a single table that stood in the middle of the room. The two Czech contacts they had met with previously were standing behind the table with a third man they didn't know. Three more armed guards occupied the corners of the room. Do you have the goods? We do. Do you have the money? Blancanales turned to Schwartz. Show him the green. Dozens of rounds hit Schwartz and Blancanales, and the blood was flying with each hit. To Lyons, everything was moving in slow motion. He had his Colt Python at the ready, moving almost too fast for the eye to follow. The first Python shot took the Czech in charge right between the eyes. The second shot doubled up one of the submachine gunners. He took aim for a third shot. The blast threw Lyons through the door and slammed him against a wall. Shaking his head, he got to his feet. He felt a wetness running down his right arm, but he ignored it. He could still hold his peace, so he sprinted back into the cloud of dust obscuring the meeting room. The burst of AK fire sent him back into cover. To rush in would be suicide. Fuck! Bolin heard the authoritative roar of Lyons' big 357 Colt Python and brought up the Beretta Model 12 subgun from the seat beside him. As he sprinted for the door, he saw Lyons stagger out, firing back into the factory as he came. Bolin brought his Beretta to bear. Where's Paul and Gadgets? Go! Just go! Bolin emptied the rest of the magazine and followed Lyons back to the car. Bolin slammed the Mercedes into first and dropped the clutch. Reaching out the open passenger side window, Lyons emptied the Python again to cover their escape. 
Bullen twitched the wheel, throwing the Mercedes sideways to round the corner at the end of the block. Checking the slide, he powered the vehicle down the almost deserted street, backing off only when it was apparent that they weren't being followed. What happened? We were set up. When Gadgets opened up his case to flash the money, they cut loose with their weapons. There was no warning at all, no argument, no nothing. They just started shooting at us. I was standing by the door, playing the bodyguard. And by the time I could get my piece into play, they were both down, shot to pieces. They both took over a dozen rounds. I saw the hits, and they went down. Then someone touched off a couple of grenades, and I was blown back out the door. He turned to Bolin, his face a controlled mask. Jesus, Mac. They're dead. Bolin remained silent. There was nothing he could say. Keeping the Mercedes to the legal speed limit of 50 kilometers, he punched the speed dial on his cellular phone to connect him with the CP. Cats here, speak up. We were ambushed. Gadgets and Paul didn't make it out. Carl picked up a round and I'm bringing him in. My God, Stryker. Do you have confirmation? Do you want me to call in Phoenix? I don't know what's there for them to deal with, but I want to try to recover the bodies if at all possible. Tell them to be ready to pull back though, if they see any police presence. We were set up, and the Russians may have called the cops in. I understand. Inside the Prague factory, Boris Detloff smiled as he looked down at the motionless figures of the two American secret agents on the floor. He loved it when a plan came together, especially a plan against men as good as these were supposed to have been. He was a little disappointed at how easy the takedown had been. He had expected it to be a little more difficult, but they had completely fallen for the trap. If it hadn't been for the reaction of the big blonde man, it would have gone without a hitch. Even so, the only casualties were the checks, and they didn't count. If these three were the best covert operatives the Yankees could put in the field, Rostov had nothing to worry about. He didn't know what had gone wrong in Berlin, but Blatz had to have really screwed up to have been taken down so easily. Detloff turned to the ex-Red Army sergeant he had brought with him. Get them out of here, and get ready to blow the place. What about the checks? Leave them behind for the police to find in the rubble. And make sure that you leave the hashish behind. When the police investigate this, it has to look like a drug deal gone bad. Detloff didn't mind the loss of the Czech gang members at all. They had been good foot soldiers, but men like them were a dime a dozen. He would have replacements for them before the night was over. In a place like Prague, there were always dozens of street-level pushers who were eager to move up in the organization. Detloff picked up the black briefcase containing the money that had been intended to make the buy. It was turning out to be a very profitable day. As soon as the two Americans had been loaded into the back of his Mercedes, Detloff slipped into the front passenger seat. The soccer field. And be sure to watch the speed limits here. Yes, sir. Three blocks away from the factory, Detloff hit the switch on the small radio transmitter. Looking into his side mirror, he saw the column of smoke billowing into the air over the factory. The demolition charges should have dropped the walls of the building, and the police would have to dig out the rubble before they could start their investigation. But with the police there, the Americans wouldn't be able to learn that the bodies were missing. At the soccer field, a Russian Army Mi-8 helicopter with Czech military markings was waiting, its rotors spinning. As soon as the two bodies were loaded on board, Tetlov slid the door shut and jerked his thumb upward. At the controls, the pilot pulled pitch and the chopper rose into the air. Feeding a little tail rotor control, he turned the nose of the ship to the north, toward the border with Poland. Twisting the throttle up against the stop, he stayed at low altitude all the way. As soon as the MI-8 crossed the border, the pilot sat down on the ground long enough for the co-pilot to jump out and strip off the bogus Czech tricolor markings to reveal the red and white Polish army insignia underneath. The rest of the flight to the small airfield in southern Poland was uneventful. There, the two Americans were loaded into an A-26 turboprop transport with civil markings and flown the rest of the way into Russia. When Phoenix Force reported that they couldn't get to the site because of the Czech police, Yakov Katzenellenbogen recalled them. There was no use throwing away their lives as well. Lyons had seen his teammates fall. For now, all they could do was go on the defensive while he reported the incident to Stony Man Farm. Katz sat in the CP van and stared at the blank video screen in front of him. He didn't want to make the call to the farm and report that Herman Schwartz and Rosario Blancanales had been killed. He was no stranger to death. 
The Black Angel had visited those close to him many times, and many more times he had delivered death himself. But these weren't common deaths. Feeling very much alone, Katz reached out and punched in the code for the SATCOM video link to Stonyman Farm. Kurtzman's face filled the screen. Aaron, I need to talk to Barbara. Kurtzman saw the look on Katz's face and knew that bad news was coming. He also knew that Price had been chosen to take the burden first this time. In her office at Stonyman Farm, Price clicked on the monitor on her desk, and one look at Katz told her that he bore bad news. What happened? I regret to inform you that Herman Schwartz and Rosario Blancanales have been killed in action. Barbara felt her heart sink. Oh no, Katz. I'm afraid so, Barbara. We haven't been able to recover the bodies yet and confirm, but both Stryker and Carl believe them to have been killed. How is Carl taking it? About as well as can be imagined. How did it happen? Somehow our cover was blown before they even walked in. According to Carl, the meeting was going well when the Czechs suddenly started shooting. Gadgets and Paul were gunned down immediately and Carl received a minor wound before a grenade blew him out of the room. That's the only thing that saved him. Stryker went to his aid, but they were both driven off and had no choice but to retreat. I sent Phoenix in, but by the time they got there, the police were on the scene and they had to withdraw as well. What's your next move? We're more than finished here. I am going to pull them back into Germany while we try to figure out what happened. Then we'll have to see if there is anything left that we can do. At this point in time, I cannot make any predictions. I understand. We'll be standing by if there's anything we can do for you. Thanks. We'll be in touch. Price sat back in the chair for a moment to gather her thoughts. She was the mission controller, and one of the things she was paid to do was to pass on bad news. Nonetheless, it had been a long time since she had heard news this bad. Usually the bad news was that some part of an operation hadn't gone off as planned. This was different. The worst thing about her job was that she couldn't allow herself the comfort of showing emotion. She steeled herself and dialed Brugnola's extension. Hal? I'm here, Barbara. Hal, there's been an incident in Prague. What happened? She relayed what Katz had told her. Barb, have they confirmed the deaths? Lions saw them killed. Get the chopper ready. I need to inform the president immediately. It's being cranked up right now. I'm sorry, Barbara. So am I. Price looked around her office and suddenly felt very small. Her eyes stopped on a framed picture of Able Team. Lions, Schwartz, and Blood Canales. She stared at it and began to cry. Time to reload. Stony Man is continued on the next CD. Even a place like the farm, where all business was conducted on a strict need-to-know basis, news got around fast, particularly bad news. And there hadn't been any news this bad in a very long time. The sense of sadness, almost thick enough to see, fell over the entire operation. With the sadness, however, came a grim determination to do everything possible to get revenge for their friends. It wasn't only the field teams who burned to see payback. Direct and final, delivered to whoever had killed Schwartz and Blood Canales. Everyone from the black suits to the kitchen staff had payback on their minds, and they were willing to do anything they could to make it come to pass. Since everyone was accustomed to looking to Barbara Price to call the shots, they turned to her to offer their help. One by one, they came to her, offered their condolences, asking them to be passed on to Carl Lyons before offering their services if there was anything they could do. All she could do was thank them and say that she would call on them if she could use them. The problem was that there was nothing they really could do. The decisions that would be made would all be made by the men in the field. All she and the rest of the Stony Man team could do was stand by and wait for developments. Katz took the Able Team tragedy as a call to action. It was obvious that they had been set up, and whoever had betrayed them would pay for that betrayal. But that would have to wait until adequate measures had been taken to protect the rest of the team. Right now, they had to get out of town and find a safe haven to regroup. Nuremberg was only a three-hour drive away, and it made sense to go there. 
Lyons and Bolin were in the van with Katz. Katz, we need to ditch this vehicle. We can't do that just yet. We still need it for our CP. But we do need to change its appearance. Get rid of the CNN logos, and I'll take the antennas off the roof. Can do. When Lyons left, Katz turned to Bolin. Stryker, I think we need to have a conference. With a farm? No, not this time. I think we need to talk this through among ourselves. We've suffered a serious loss and we need to regroup before we go on from here. If, that is, we decide to go on with it. Are you thinking of abandoning this mission? I honestly don't know. Something has gone wrong here, terribly wrong, and we need to find out what it is. We got sucked in and cut apart like amateurs. But since we aren't amateurs, that means we were shopped. Being shopped was intelligence jargon that meant they had been sold out, betrayed. This was a serious allegation, and if it was true, it meant that the farm had been compromised as well. If that was the case, continuing the mission would only bring more deaths. You don't think that it was simply an act of God? You and I both know the God of War a little too well, Stryker. He's capricious at best and brutal all the time. But we also know that he has favored us for a long time now, and he's favored us because we're damned good at what we do. All of us have gone into the fire countless times and have come out whole. He tapped his artificial right arm with his left hand and smiled grimly. Not completely whole, granted. We all bear the marks of a warrior's life, but this wasn't a capricious act of a brutal god of war. Able team was set up and cut down. It's as simple as that. And before I put the rest of you on the line again, I want to know what the hell is going on here. And I want to make sure that everyone knows the situation. Then, and only then, will I get back in contact with the farm. Bolin needed no reminding that they were in a brutal, nasty business. Every man on both Phoenix Force and Able Team were among the best that had ever put their lives on the line for a cause. This tragedy hadn't come down because they didn't know what they were doing. But, as he well knew, even the best men in the world could be betrayed. You're right. Let me gather everyone and we'll continue this when we've reached Nuremberg. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Barbara? Is Hal back from Washington yet? He just got back in. Why? I think you two need to come down here immediately. What is it? Just come down here, please. When Price walked into the computer room, she saw that Kurtzman had a very serious look on his face. Brignola looked as confused as Price felt. What's going on? Katz and the mobile CP have gone off the air, but they sent us a message before they signed off. Watch. Katz's face flashed up on the main screen. Every eye in the room turned in that direction. In light of the Able Team ambush, we have decided to stand down until we can determine how and why this event happened. Since our covers blown here in Prague, we're pulling back to Nuremberg to get out of the line of fire. Then we're going to discuss this incident, review everything we have on it, and make a recommendation on how and where we will proceed from here. Until that time, we will be out of communication. I tried to call him back, but all of their lines are dead. Oh, shit. Brignola's hand automatically went into his jacket pocket for the roll of antacid tablets stashed there. This had started out so well, and it had looked like his stomach was going to get a little rest this time. More news like this, and he'd be living on the things. I suggest that we all go to the war room and talk this thing out ourselves. Without a word, Brignola turned and headed for the door. Price had called ahead, and a coffee service was waiting in the war room by the time Kurtzman arrived. The computer man stopped his wheelchair by the table and poured himself a cup before taking his place at the end of the conference table. It wasn't the high test brew he made in the computer room, but it would do until he could get back to the good stuff. Okay, considering everything that's gone down, what's our next move? Before we get into that, Hal, if you don't mind, I'd like to take a time out. What do you mean? We have to get this mission back on track. What I mean is that we need to stop and take however long it takes to go over this entire thing and see if we can find anything that points to a leak that could have contributed to Able Team's ambush. Do you really think that a leak from here is likely? Not a leak from this end, no. But I want to do it anyway. When Katz calls back, I want to be able to reassure him that their communications with us are safe. Then, as long as the teams remain in the field, I want to cut the White House out of the loop for the rest of the mission. Particularly, I want to cut off information to the Russians, and the only way to do that is to shut the President out. Nothing against him personally, you understand. But as you well know, anything we tell him, he'll pass on to them. 
You know I can't do that, Barbara. And you know that we only exist at the President's pleasure. I agree with the sentiment, but I'm afraid that's a no-go. Then I strongly recommend that we immediately go into mission closure. If we cannot ensure that our people aren't being betrayed, we have no business being in the business. This isn't the first time that something has gone wrong with one of our missions. Oh, don't give me that bullshit, Hal! <sighs> I'm more aware of that than anyone else around this place. If you'll remember, Hal, I've been the mission controller for some time. What I'm saying is that we have to... I really don't want to hear what you have to say unless you want to tell me that your first and only concern is to protect the lives of our men in the field. Anything other than that is political crap, and I'm not in the mood to listen to that right now. Two of my friends are dead. I don't want to lose any more of them. Brignola couldn't meet her gaze. She was dead right, and nothing he could say would change that. They had already lost two men on a mission that didn't immediately affect the security of the United States, and he didn't want to lose any more either. Okay. Let's stand down until we can go over the mission from the beginning and see if we can find out what went wrong. And you will keep from informing the President about what we're doing until it's over? I'll try. You'd better try hard, Hal. When Schwartz regained consciousness, he found himself lying face down on a bare concrete floor with his hands and feet bound. His head was swimming, and he felt as if he were coming off of a week-long drinking binge. His head ached, his mouth felt as though it were stuffed with cotton, and he was having trouble seeing clearly in the dim light. The last time he had felt like this, he had been drugged. He lay where he was, breathing deeply to try to clear the toxins from his system. When his vision cleared a few minutes later, he twisted onto his side and saw that Rosario Blancanales was lying a few feet away from him. Even in the dim light, Blancanales looked like he'd been worked over with a baseball bat. His face was swollen and covered with blood. Both of his eyes were closed, and Schwartz couldn't see if he was breathing. Whatever had happened in that abandoned Prague factory, it had been a major disaster. All he remembered was that the checks had opened up on them out of the blue. He remembered feeling the slugs hit, and then there was a blinding flash followed by blackness. Apparently, they had been hit by a concussion grenade, and the fact that he had been standing a little behind Blood Canales probably accounted for his waking up first. His friend had taken most of the blast, and he showed it. Since Bolan and Carl Lyons weren't sharing the cell with them, it meant that the two men were either dead or they had escaped. Schwartz opted to believe that they had escaped and would be mounting a rescue. He had no proof for or against that conclusion, but that was how he was going to handle the situation until someone proved him wrong. And that was going to require showing him the bodies before he would believe that they had been killed. Lyons had been standing by the door, and he should have been able to escape when it all went to hell. He had no idea what had set off the checks, but something had, and all he could do now was hold on and hope that Katz figured it out. He started to inch across the floor toward Blancanales to see if there was anything he could do for him. With his hands tied behind him, that really wouldn't be much, but regardless, he had to try to help his teammate. As he crawled, he became aware of his own injuries. He felt like he too had been worked over with a baseball bat and was glad that he couldn't see his own face. He was afraid that it would look as bad as Paul's. When he reached Blancanales' side, he saw that his teammate was breathing, but just barely. Paul, wake up, man. Wake up. Paul. When there was no response, he put his ear to Blancanales' chest to see if he could detect his heartbeat. It was there, but sounded weak. Hey, we need help in here. Guard. Guard. Schwartz twisted to face whomever had opened the door. He was surprised to see a tall, well-built man who looked out of place in civilian clothes. He had expected a goon, not someone who looked like he had stepped out of a James Bond movie. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Gregor Rostov. And, if I am not mistaken, you are Hermann Schwartz. Your teammate with you is Rosario Blancanales. I am sorry to inform you that your other teammate, Carl Lyons, died of his wounds. You may be comforted to know that he died fighting. Where's his body? It was disposed of properly, but without much fanfare. His grave is without a marker. And what are you going to do with Blancanales? He's hurt bad and needs medical attention. Both of you will be seen to immediately. I do not want you to die on me. And then what? And then we'll talk. Four men dressed in white lab coats walked in and removed the restraints from both Schwartz and Blancanales. 
As he was lifted to his feet, Schwartz saw the dark splotches covering the front of his rumpled clothing. They looked like bloodstains, but he felt no wounds. Looking closer, he saw that the stains weren't blood. This was some kind of fake blood like they used in movie special effects scenes. It became clear that he and Blancanales had been shot at with special effects cartridges so that lions would think that they had been killed. You bastard! You faked our deaths! <laughs> it was necessary so your comrades will not come looking for you. They think that you two are dead and that their cover, as you Americans say, has been blown. Now they will go home. That'll never happen. Oh yes, it will. One way or the other, they will cease their operations and go back to America. When it is learned that a certain prominent minister in the Russian government invited a secret American strike force into our country to kill our Russians, I can assure you that your friends will be invited to go home. And it can't come soon enough for me. Your government has no business sticking their long noses into our affairs. The so-called American century is over. And the sooner your people discover that, the better it will be for all of you. This wasn't the first time Schwartz had heard a Russian nationalist say that the U.S. needed to butt out of their affairs. But it wasn't the time nor the place to get into a long discussion of the role of the United States in world politics. That would take place later, preferably when he had a weapon in his hand. Nuremberg, Germany. The trip from Prague had taken a little over three hours, and it was early in the morning when the Stony Man warriors reached the small hotel outside the medieval town of Nuremberg, Zum Wildenbach. Katz knew the place from numerous visits and had recommended it for its remote location. Until they decided what their next move was going to be, they needed to keep a low profile. After grabbing quick showers in their rooms and breakfast in the hotel's dining room, the commandos went back to the parking lot and crowded back into the back of Katz's CP van. It was a tight fit, but Katz's electronics scrubbers could make sure that their meeting wouldn't be overheard by eavesdroppers. Carl Lyons, Gary Manning, David McCarter, Raphael Enciso, Kelvin James, TJ Hawkins, Jack Grimaldi, and Mac Bolan all barely fit in the van. As soon as everyone had found a place to sit, Katz began the meeting. Okay, we all know what went down, so I won't go over it. The question is, what are we going to do about it? I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I know what I'm going to do. No matter what comes out of the farm over this, I'm not going to stand down. Nor am I going to let Hal tell me who or what to target. I'm going after the bastards who killed Gadgets and Paul, and when I catch up with them, I'm going to kill them. Katz didn't reply to Lyons' words. He had expected no less from the Iron Man. Lyons hadn't picked up his nickname by being indecisive. He also was certain that the rest of the men felt that way as well, and for the same reasons. Anybody have anything else? I agree completely with Carl. And I would like to suggest that we take a serious look at completely cutting ourselves off from the farm until this operation is concluded. From the way that ambush went down, it is readily apparent that Able Team was bloody well set up. Now, I'm not saying that anyone at the farm let something slip. We all know that didn't happen. The problem is that we are, in effect, working for the Russians this time, and I don't trust them. You're saying that you think the Russians leaked the information about the Prague operation? Who else? Carl and his people were working on a tip we received through the bloody Russians. They went to the meet that had been set up, and it exploded on them. That wasn't happenstance. And it wasn't simply bad luck. Hal gave our plan to the Russians, and they shopped us. Oh, we all agree that the Russians leaked us, and we need to shut them out. Yes. 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 Okay, then. What do we tell Hal? How about having him tell the Russians to stuff it in their bloody kit bags? This isn't our fight, cats, and we never should have been called in on it. There are more than enough problems in the world that directly affect the states. Let the bastards take care of their own damn problems. Even if it means that the Russian army puts itself back in power to impose order. Hey, Stony Man can't do everything. We have to protect American soil first and foremost. I don't particularly care what you tell Brignola. All I can tell you is that I'm not going to do what the farm tells me to until I'm done here. If you like, in effect, I have just tendered my resignation from the Sensitive Operations Group. Keeping the Russians out of this and talking to the farm are two very different things, guys. I agree that we need to cut the Russians out of the loop, 
But if we're gonna go after these guys for some serious payback, we're still gonna need the farm. We need the Bear and his people to do our background work for us. If we try to go this on our own, it'll take us months, if not years, to track those guys down. Oh, come on, Gary. I used to be a cop. I did my own legwork for years, before the farm was even invented. Well, we're good, Carl, but we're not as fast as the Bear's electronics. We need his cyberspace connection, the satellite overwatch, and all the rest of the input that we've come to depend on for so long now. This isn't like the days of the Mafia Wars, when Stryker was out there banging heads all by himself, with a Texaco roadmap in one hand and an AT&T phone book in the other. I had help even back then, guys. And some of my best information came from a Justice Department guy named Hal Brugnola. Yeah, but that was before Hal became joined at the heap with the White House. He has a new boss now, and as has happened all too many times in the past, the man in the Oval Office isn't necessarily on our side. But how do we cut out Hal and still keep getting the information we need from the farm? Yeah, if we're going to get some payback for Gadgets and Rosario, we're going to need the farm big time. Katz looked over to Jack Grimaldi, who had been silent so far. Jack, do you want to get in on this? Not really. Whatever you guys decide to do is okay with me. Since we don't have anything to fly this time, I don't care. Fair enough. All right. What if I have a talk with Barbara and Aaron? I will explain our concerns and see what they might be able to do to secure this operation and keep feeding us information. Do what you want. I'm gonna see what I can come up with on my own. I solved crimes for years without the help of any damn computers. I'll come with you, Carl. The two of us will be able to cover more ground than if you try to do it on your own. Lyons just smiled and got to his feet. Yeah, let's do it, Stryker. First, I want to move our focus away from the Czech Republic. We got burned badly there, and since we really don't know who our opposition is, I don't want to go back there right yet. I'd like to go to another major city here in the West, where we might be able to keep out of sight a little better, and we can start all over again at square one. How about trying Dresden? It's in Germany now, but the Russian connection is still pretty strong there. How long will it take to get there? You can be there and ready to go by tomorrow morning. That'll do. How soon can we be on the road? As soon as I pay the bill here. I don't want the German cops after us for dining and dashing. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Aaron Kurtzman was deep in thought. He still couldn't believe that Schwartz and Blancanales were dead. A world without gadgets and the Paul was going to be a poorer place. He would be willing to trade ten years of what was left of his life if he could somehow get out of his damned wheelchair and stand beside Carl Lyons when he extracted his vengeance for their deaths. It was a nice thought, but it wasn't going to happen in this lifetime. The only thing he could do to help bring those responsible to justice was to do what he did so well. Kurtzman was the monarch of a cyberspace kingdom that knew no boundaries, and everything that he ever needed to know was somewhere within that kingdom. With Huntington Weathers, Akira Takedo, and Carmen Delahunt as his assistant wizards, everything would be known before they were through. And that knowledge would put Lyons and his friends in place to extract the price for his partner's deaths. After stopping to fill his coffee cup from his ever-brewing pot, he wheeled himself over to his workstation and parked his chair in front of his keyboard. Emptying his mind of everything except the problem at hand, he started trying to find out how Able Team had been betrayed. He would start from the beginning. As everyone in the computer room had expected, the in-depth review of the Prague mission buildup didn't reveal anything on their end that might have contributed to Able Team's ambush. Every line of every message and briefing paper had been assessed, and the secure communications equipment had all been tested. The error hadn't occurred at the farm. Unless they were ready to accept that plain old bad luck had taken down Able Team, the only answer could be that the leak had originated with either the White House or with the Russians, who had asked for the President's help. While the inhabitants of the halls of power in Washington, D.C. weren't the favorite people of anyone who worked at Stony Man Farm, no one was ready to put the blame on them without positive proof of betrayal. The Russians, however, were entirely another matter. After all, it was the Russians who had passed on the information about the Czech drug dealers that had sent Able Team to Prague in the first place. Belinsikov himself had warned the president about the level of infiltration the Mafia had made into the government, so it had to be the Russians. Kurtzman was reaching out to punch the intercom button to Price's office when he saw that he had an incoming message from Katz. Flashing it up onto the screen, 
He saw that it had a readme prolog. After reading it, his finger reached for the intercom button. A few minutes later, Kurtzman and Price sat side by side at his workstation, reading Captain Ellenbogen's read once message as it slowly scrolled down the monitor. When it reached the end of the text, the message would disappear into cyberspace where all erased messages went, never to be retrieved. It also had a tag in the code that prevented them from printing a hard copy of the message. They had to read it and get it the first time. In short, concise terms, Katz outlined what Carl Lyons and Mac Bolan had decided to do, adding that Phoenix Force had signed up with them as well. In effect, he was delivering their mass resignation from Stony Man Farm. He did, however, say that if Kurtzman and Price wanted to help them, they would accept their assistance. He gave them a radio frequency he would be monitoring if they wanted to discuss the matter, and then the message blinked out of existence. Well, I'd say that we have a problem. That's putting it mildly. What are we going to do about it? I'll be damned if I know, Aaron. I really don't. Do we talk to Hal about this? No. If we do that, there's a risk that he'll tell the president, and the man will declare them rogues. One of the few ways that a nation, any nation, could control the activities of their field agents was to hang the threat of their being declared rogues over their head. Such a declaration would have every police officer and intelligence agent in the world after them with orders to kill on sight. It was rarely invoked, but when it was, the rogue agent didn't last very long. So then what do we do? We take care of it ourselves. But I don't know how. It's going to be hard to hide what they're doing from Hal. I guess that they're going to have to go off the air then. Isn't that a little too obvious? I mean, every team in the field that wants to cut out the bullshit from headquarters just goes off the air? Oh, I think they can get a pretty good alibi. After all, if it's on TV, it has to be true. Particularly if it's on CNN. Aaron, what do you have in mind? Well, I think we can do two things. First, I want to talk to Katz about putting together some razzle-dazzle moves. Then we need to go into a serious deception mode around here. We're going to have to hide everything we do from Hal, because you know damn good and well that he's not going to see this thing our way. That's an understatement if I ever heard one. Get on it. And remember, Barbara, don't believe everything you see on the six o'clock news. I know better than that. I've worked with the Lords of Illusion for years now. Boris Detloff was chagrined to learn that the American covert action team had pulled out of Prague, particularly when he didn't know where they had gone. His Czech operatives had been caught off guard and had let them get away unseen, presumably to the west. He now realized that he should have put some of his ex-KGB people on them, but he'd been caught off guard himself. The Americans had stumbled into his ambush at the factory so easily that he had discounted them, but he wouldn't make that mistake again. If they hadn't left Europe yet, he had no fear that he'd be able to get a lead on them before too long. The Rostov organization had hundreds of eyes in Western Europe. He also had no answer to Rostov's question about the Americans pulling out entirely. His informant in Volinsikov's office indicated that the minister had had no new information from the White House since before the ambush in Prague, not even hearing that the mission in Prague had gone awry. It was obvious that the American government had silenced itself. The question was, why? Since he couldn't afford to wait to find out what was happening, Detloff decided to talk to his boss about trying to get the information directly from their American captives, by any means necessary. The Russians were masters when it came to the fine art of interrogation. There was always danger of a drug reaction from the original chemical interrogation, but Rostov had an experienced ex-KGB doctor on his staff, so the risk to the valuable prisoners would be minimized. Rostov needed those two men alive, and he also needed access to the information in their heads. Hawkins looked around the busy streets of Nuremberg. Do you really think this is gonna work, Katz? This is a little too much like something out of a made-for-TV movie for my tastes. It should work. If we're being tracked by the van, this should put them off our trail for a while at least. After making contact with Aaron Kurtzman back at the farm, Hawkins and Katz had remained in Nuremberg, while Bolin, Lyons, and the rest of Stony Man went on to Dresden to start their new mission of retribution. 
Their first move in implementing Kurtzman's deception plan had been to steal a white Mercedes van they spotted in the back lot of a furniture factory. It was the same model as the one the team had been using as their mobile CP, and with the CNN logos applied to the side and one of the spare antennas fixed on the roof, it was difficult to tell the two trucks apart, particularly since they had removed all the vehicle ID number tags on the new van, including the one on the engine block. Knowing that the police would examine anything they left behind, the commandos had purchased several used televisions and computers from secondhand stores and had installed them in the back. When that was done, Katz's original CP van was suitably disguised with a quick partial paint job. The vehicle's front fenders and doors were now blue, and the side carried the logo of a well-known publishing house. The van was then parked directly across the street from the biggest TV studio in the city. Hawkins turned to check the connections for the detonators to the incendiary devices he had planted in the cab in the cargo area. I'm ready. You ready? I'm go when you are, TJ. Give me time to get to that phone booth on the corner of the square, and then do it. I'll meet you there. As soon as Katz reached the phone, Hawkins hit the timer and exited the cab. He had only 60 seconds, but he forced himself not to hurry. This was no time to attract attention. He was still a few yards from the corner when the truck exploded. Katz had dialed all but the last number of the TV station and hit the last button when the truck exploded. Then that's good. Can I help you? In addition to English, Katz spoke six other languages. German was one of them, and his accent was flawless. Look out your front windows. There is a Yankee TV van burning in front of your building. We do not need imperialist propaganda in the new Europe. Who is this? As he had expected, it took less than a minute for a small group of people to come running out of the TV station, several with video cameras in their hands. As the blaze burned the truck down to the frame, it was all caught on camera. One of the spectators, obviously a reporter, even started doing the voiceover to be used with a broadcast later. Katz and Hawkins watched from the darkness until the fire department showed. That should do it. I should have set that timer for a couple more seconds. I damn near got my buns toasted real good that time. The two faded into the night and headed for the truck they had parked two blocks away. By morning, they would be in Dresden and would link up with the rest of the team. The explosion of the van in Nuremberg made it onto CNN headline news that evening as part of a story on the new wave of terrorism that was sweeping Europe. The vehicle's destruction was blamed on drug gang violence and was linked with the earlier raid on the Flak Tower in Berlin and half a dozen other recent terrorist acts in Western Europe. CNN had put one of the overseas big guns on the story to apply the network's characteristic the sky is falling spin. The fact that CNN's European bureau wasn't missing a mobile van was either not known or covered up. Every network liked to be a target, particularly during sweeps month. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Aaron Kurtzman and Barbara Price called Hal Brignola down to the computer room to watch the tape from Europe. Eyes glued to the big monitor, Brignola looked as if he was going to chew right through his cigar. Was that the team's van? It sure as hell looks like their van. Were any bodies recovered? Uh, we don't know yet. Brignola watched until the end of the tape, then turned and started for the door. Keep me informed. I need to know the instant they get back in contact. Will do. Well, that's that. Do you really think this is going to work very long, Aaron? It does seem a little too much like a movie. I think this is the only thing we can do. For the guys to be able to do what has to be done, Hal and the White House need to be out of the loop. It was either this or call it quits and accept everyone's resignation. So if this doesn't work, we can always try our hand at chicken farming in Arkansas. For two guys who didn't speak the language very well, Mac Bolin and Carl Lyons were making good progress on their first day on the streets of Dresden. The town was booming with the new construction brought about by reunification. That meant that a lot of money was changing hands, and the drug trade always followed money. They started out as if they were operating in any large American city. They went to the center of town and looked around. The initial step was taken with the first street dealer they ran across, a guy in punk rock clothing dealing single hash joints to support his habit. Hey mister, you want hashish? Bolin and Lyons exchanged glances and went into their routine. With Bolin blocking the line of sight from the other passers-by, Lyons simply stepped up to the guy, spun him, and snapped his right arm into a come-along hold. Hey, 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 what? Ow! 
Be quiet or die. Where did you get your drugs? I cannot say. Ow, 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 ow. Luba, Luba. See Luba four blocks down the street. He's tall, balding, in the alley behind the flower shop. Thanks. Dump your pockets. Bullen ground the joints into the cobblestones before sending the guy on his way. Finding Luber was easy. They came across him in the middle of a deal. He didn't seem to know much English at first, but Lyons' python seemed to jar his memory, and he spoke it better than most diplomats. According to his story, his wholesaler wasn't a German. He was a Serb who had immigrated during the Bosnian War and had taken up the drug trade. He conducted his business out of a small tobacco shop in a part of town that wasn't being rebuilt yet. After getting a street address, Bolan turned the punk loose, and the guy disappeared fast. After calling in their intentions to David McCarter, Bolan and Lyons drove their rented silver BMW to the outskirts of town. As their informant had said, there was a tobacco shop at the location he had given up. Parking their car at the curb in front, they stepped out, ready for business. The man behind the counter took one look at Bolan and Lyons as they walked through the door. Oh, shit! Oh. Lyons caught him halfway out the back door and dragged him back inside. We'll make this easy for you. You talk, I won't kill you. Oh, you're the bad cop? No, he's the good one. Oh, shit. Exactly. So, are you gonna talk, or should we start demonstrating our own brand of good cop? Ow! Oh. Bad cop! Ow! Oh. If I talk to you, I know that the Russians will kill me. You say that you will kill me if I don't talk, so it doesn't matter. Either way, I am dead. That could be. But there is the matter of what happens to you before you die. If I kill you, it'll only be after I'm convinced that you really don't know what I want to know. And I promise that it will take a lot of convincing before I'm satisfied. It will be painful. But I'm not going to do anything time-consuming like beating you. That's a complete waste of time. I'm simply going to start cutting things off, starting with your balls. And if that doesn't convince you to tell me what I want to know, I'll work on your eyes next. When I'm finally done with you, I think you'll be ready to die. So if you like, I'll put a tag on you so the authorities will know which particular piece of street shit you are, because no one will ever be able to recognize you. Well, you Americans don't do things like that. I know all about how your DEA and your FBI works. Bolin decided to enter in the negotiations. I'm sorry to report that we're not from the DEA or the FBI. We're not even from the CIA. We're just two Americans who have decided to get into business here, and we want to buy from the top man, not some scumbag like you. The light came on in the Serb's eyes. Oh, you are from the Mafia. Bolin's wolfish smile served as an unspoken answer. I get my supplies from the Russians. And where can we find these Russian friends of yours? There is a Russian-owned restaurant on Muller Street off the Cathedral Plaza called the Moscow. The Russians use it to make their deals. The man you want to see there is called Boris. Oh, they're all called Boris. Does he have a last name? I only know him as Boris. You can't miss him. He's a big bastard. Tell me about this Moscow restaurant. I want to know how big it is, how late it's open, and where the doors are. Do you have a piece of paper? I will make a drawing for you. The Serb carefully penciled in the windows, doors, and even the tables, bar, and kitchen area, giving dimensions in meters. Hey, that's pretty good drawing. I was an architect in Sarajevo. You might want to go back to that profession. Drug dealers are going to become unpopular around here real soon. I have a cousin in the building trade in Berlin. I can always go work for him. That's a good plan, because if I ever see your face again, I'm going to put a bullet in it. The Serb shuddered as he looked into the big blonde man's face and saw death personified. You will never see me again. I promise that. Get out of here. The Serb didn't even bother to take his coat from the back of the chair. What was an inexpensive jacket when he had been given his life? Lyons took in the Serb's goods. Most of it was hashish, but there were a few blocks of tar heroin as well. What are we gonna do with this shit? Burn it. We don't have time to waste calling the police about it. What doesn't burn, the fire department will take care of. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Until all of the reports were in from the firebombing of Phoenix Force's van in Nuremberg, Hal Brignola would refrain from telling the president anything. But the way it was looking so far, he half expected the man to want to shut down Stony Man Farm. 
Regnola hated to see it happen, but maybe the time had come for it to be closed out. The farm, while it had been active, had been an overwhelming success. Phoenix Force and Able Team were without a doubt the two best covert action groups that had ever taken to the field. And with Aaron Kurtzman's cyber crew backing them up, they had provided America with muscle that could be applied without having to go through the labyrinth of petty politics that had doomed so many U.S. covert operations in the past. Stony Man Farm had been spawned from the wonders of the online revolution and had always relied on the computer room staff's ability to know more than they ever had any right to know. Without the work of Aaron Kurtzman's computer people, the action teams wouldn't have been half as effective as they had been. Having the world's best fighting men ready to unleash on the target wasn't enough. In the brave new world of online snooping and black hat hackers, information was the most potent force of all. Now that he was thinking about the cyber room, Brignola started to wonder why Kurtzman's crew hadn't been able to come up with more information about the Prague and Nuremberg incidents that had befallen the teams. Almost everything Kurtzman had reported to him so far were things that had originated from the TV news broadcasts and print media reports. So far, his extensive computer skills had uncovered nothing. Brugnola knew that some of that could be put down to the shock that everyone was feeling about the loss of Blankenomis and Schwartz, as well as the uncertainty about the fate of Stryker, Katz, and Phoenix Force. The overt grieving for their dead comrades had passed, but the shock was still felt. But now there were the rest of the men to worry about, too. Everyone was feeling the strain, even him, but he'd thought that Kurtzman was tougher than that. He always had been before. Wanting to think this through before he said anything to Kurtzman or Price, he stepped outside the farmhouse to take a short walk around the grounds. As always, the view of the Shenandoah Valley and Stony Man Mountain was magnificent. The peach orchard was blossoming, and a couple of the farm hands were doing a little pruning. Another group was working on the tractor and machinery they'd use in a few days to start the spring plowing. The farm really was a working farm, and the agricultural work always had to be done to keep it operational. Walking behind the main house, he recognized two men from the Black Suit Security Force who were talking to John Cowboy Kissinger as they loaded crates into the back of one of the farm's unmarked vans. That wasn't unusual, but what piqued his interest was the startled look on Kissinger's face when he was spotted. And even stranger was the weaponsmith walking over to meet him. Deciding to meet him halfway, Brugnola got close enough to read the markings on the crates. They were marked in both German and English, and he could clearly make out the words FedEx Air Freight Holding Facility, Frankfurt. I wasn't informed of any shipments going to Europe. Oh. Oh, that's just some stuff cats wanted sent over. And since we have the time, I thought I'd get it over there so they can pick it up when they need it. That made sense. Once Phoenix Force and Stryker surfaced again, they would need the shipment, whatever it was. But why was Kissinger so jumpy? Okay, well... Keep me informed, Kissinger. Will do, boss. Aaron Kurtzman caught Brignola coming down the hallway on the interior security camera and hit a code on his keyboard. Instantly, his monitor and the monitors of everyone else in the room changed. Brignola walked in a few seconds later. Anything new, Aaron? Not really. The Frankfurt police are still doing their forensic examination of the van, but they haven't released much yet. Any news on the bodies? Not yet. According to the media reports, burned bone fragments had been found in the incinerated wreckage. Since CNN claimed no personnel missing, the identity of the dead was yet unknown. They had also claimed not to have a missing van at all, but little notice had been taken of that inconvenient fact. I guess they're still trying to get DNA readings on the bone fragments. Ah, oh, well, keep on it. As Brignola turned to leave, it suddenly hit him that while Schwartz and Blancanellis were still being mourned, there was a decided lack of similar concern for the fate of Katz, Stryker, and Phoenix Force. To be sure, concerned questions were being asked about them, but the same sense of impending doom wasn't in the voices. It was true that no one had reported them dead yet, but considering the spectacular destruction of the CP van and the fact that they still were not back in contact, people should be frantic, and they simply were not. Brignola was beginning to think that someone was putting the shuck on him, as Hawkins would say. Knowing that he would get nothing but innocent looks from Kurtzman, he went looking for Barbara Price. He found her in the hallways leading to the war room. Look, Barbara, I just figured out what's been going on around here, and I think we need to talk about it. What's that? 
You've set me up with a perfect alibi to give the man, haven't you? I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. Damn it, Barbara. The van. You had cats blow up the damn van to cut Phoenix loose. We didn't blow up the van, Hal. And as far as Phoenix is concerned, you know as much about where they are and what they're doing as I do. You get every report that comes into this place. It's what's not being reported that bothers me. I don't want to see on CNN that half of Europe has been destroyed in some sort of rampage. While the average Stony Man operation went well beyond the normal level of hardcore covert operations, there was a limit to what even they could be authorized to do. Even on one of their scorched earth missions, there was a limit on who or what could be a target. The fine line between covert operations acting in the national interest and state-sponsored terrorism was razor thin, and it was all too easy to cross. The president isn't going to be very happy about this when it's over. Price looked him straight in the eyes. We serve at the president's pleasure, Hal, and he can ask for our resignations any time he wants. Just give us the word and we can be out of here in a couple of hours. I'm not threatening anyone. I just want to be let in on what's going on over there, so I can help all of you cover your collective asses. If a war's about to break out in Eastern Europe, someone is sure to put two and two together and come up with Stony Man Farm before too long. There's only so many people who can pull off something like that. I guess we'll just have to worry about that when it happens then, won't we? Have it your way. But don't ask me to bail your butts out when it all goes to hell. Don't worry. We can always ask Minister Valinsikov to vouch for any activities that might take place over there. After all, we are supposed to be working for the Russians this time, aren't we? Suddenly it clicked. Katz had decided that the Russians had leaked the Prague operation, and he and Barbara had decided to break contact so they wouldn't get burned again. It made sense, and in the same situation, he probably would have done the same. I just hope you know what you're doing, because I sure as hell don't. She smiled. That was exactly the way she wanted it. Russia. Gregor Rostov brought Schwartz and Blancanales into a conference room. He showed them chairs across a table from him, and his body language, not to mention the four armed guards in the room, conveyed in no uncertain terms that it wasn't a suggestion. That was the first time the teammates had been in the same room together since waking up in the cell. Neither one of them was sure how much time had passed since they had been captured. All they knew was that they had slept several times since they had arrived wherever they were. They both looked, somewhat groggily, at their captor. That is quite an organization you belong to, and it has such an interesting name, Stony Man Farm. What's Stony Man Farm? Oh, don't give me that shit. You told me earlier, or don't you remember? Bullshit! You haven't even brought out the rubber hoses yet! You really didn't think that I would waste my time trying to beat the information out of you or anything primitive like that, did you? Oh, I'm hurt. Russians understand interrogation techniques, and we know how to get the information we want. I know that the old KGB had a reputation for brutality, and it was a well-deserved reputation, I might add. But they were brutal for fun. They did it because they enjoyed it. When they really wanted to get information from a man, or a woman for that matter, quickly, they simply used chemicals. They used a mixture that translates into, I think you would say, babble juice. It is extraordinarily effective. Now the two Able Team members knew why they had awakened feeling groggy. They had been drugged. Whatever was used, it could have been put in their food, or they simply could have been gassed while they slept. Rostov glanced down at the printouts on the table in front of him. Even though I have some information on your operation, I still have questions. If your methods are so good, why do you even need to talk to us? What do you think we're going to tell you that you don't already know? Mm, the chemical interrogation works strangely. It provides only some of the information I need to know. Uh, for instance, I know the eye color of the lovely woman who seems to be your operations officer. But I still do not know much about the way she thinks. The same goes for what I learned about your leader, a Mr. Hal Brognola. I find it a bit odd that he is from the Justice Department instead of one of your intelligence agencies as one would have expected. The stony men showed stony faces. Now, what I need to know is how this Brognola will respond to the news of your death. Will he think that you were betrayed by your Russian allies? Or will he just take it as bad luck, 
But more importantly, how will your Phoenix Force comrades respond? Will they follow their orders like good little soldiers, or are they going to try to avenge your deaths? Oh, uh, what do you think? Rostov studied Schwartz for a time. That is the only question, isn't it? I think I will learn the answer before long. So what happens to us? You will remain here as my guest until this has been played out. Then what? Then you may be freed. Or killed. It all depends. Schwartz knew that the Russian was playing with him and didn't let it get to him. Rostov wanted him to cling to the faint promise of life and not do anything to risk that chance. He knew full well, however, that it was pure crap. There was no way that the Russian was going to let him and Blancanales live, not with what they now knew about him and his organization. To release them would be to invite retaliation. His only realistic option would be to kill them when they were no longer useful to him. Schwartz did, however, plan to take someone with him when it came time for him to go down. He still had confidence in Bolin, Lyons, and Phoenix Force, but if they didn't make it in time, he'd still bite the dust. But there was no way that he was going to go out without taking someone with him. And this Rostov guy would be a good one to take to hell with him. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Now that Stony Man's covert European operation had entered the realm of complete and total deniability, Aaron Kurtzman finally had time to do something that he should have done before this mess had been allowed to get started. Namely, he was going to do an in-depth background workup on the topic of the Russian Mafia. All of the information they had used on the pre-mission workup had come from the Russians. And even though Kurtzman didn't trust them any further than he could walk unassisted, he had to admit that the Berlin mission had gone off without a hitch. The information they had provided for that raid had been spot on. Because of that success, he had accepted the Prague information without hesitation. His main question now was, since the Prague mission had been a Russian Mafia setup, and he had no doubts that it had been, why had they allowed the Stony Man team to take out their Berlin operation? It made no sense that they would willingly give up an asset that valuable. That told him that they hadn't been in the loop when the Berlin raid went down. Even though they had their moles and operatives inside the Russian government, they had been asleep at the switch when the team took out the flak tower. The speed of their reaction, however, told him a lot about this shadowy organization. They had heard the wake-up call and had taken immediate steps to eliminate the threat. The fact that they had limited their reaction to taking out Able Team instead of targeting the entire Stony Man force could be because of a lack of intelligence on their part. It could also be that their response had been measured for some reason. That was only one of the more critical questions that needed to be answered. Shifting into the zone that he used to channel half-thoughts and random hunches directly from the deepest recesses of the right half of his brain through his fingertips to the computer, he started drawing in everything he could find about the activities of the Russian Mafia. He purposefully limited his search to the past 36 months for this phase. It was only in the past three years that Russia's criminals had grown beyond being a problem in just a few large Russian cities. If he didn't find what he wanted in that time period, however, he would expand the search. He didn't know exactly what he was looking for, but he knew that he would recognize it when he saw it. In general, he was looking for a guiding mind behind these operations. He was looking for the traces of a personality, those traits and quirks of an individual mind that couldn't be hidden. Right now, it wasn't as important to be able to put a name to this figure. That would come later. If he could find those keys, he could use them to project the moves this person might make in the near future. And right now, that's what he needed to know most. Since Katz and the team had gone freelance, they had lost the information stream the Russians were supposed to provide them to plan their missions. Without that input, however devious or misleading it had been in Prague, the team needed every bit of intelligence he could come up with so they wouldn't get sandbagged again. As Kurtzman ran through everything in his cyber files about the Russian Mafia, a picture started to form deep in his mind. Unlike with the American crime families, the Russian Mafia didn't appear to be a family business. But then again, the crime wave hadn't lasted long enough to be passed on to the next generation. Left unchecked, though, it could turn into the family business it was in the States. From everything he was seeing so far, the Russian Mafia had been born in the late 1980s when Mikhail Gorbachev had tried to put curbs on the state-run vodka industry in a vain attempt to limit drunkenness. 
If the man had bothered to take a good look at the American experience with prohibition, he might have had second thoughts about trying to dry out the Russians. But he hadn't, and all his good intentions got him was the same organized evil that prohibition had given America. Now, the Russian mafia was practically a shadowy government in the mother country. Like the legendary Hydra of a Thousand Heads, their hands could be found in almost every aspect of Russian life, from making vodka to issuing the permits needed to open a small shop. There was hardly any area of life that they didn't influence to some degree or another. It was easy to see why Belinsikov had been so eager to get American help to deal with this problem. Kurtzman quickly saw the genesis of the problem as well how the gangsters had gone from being bootleggers to power brokers. At first, there had been hundreds of small gangs, and they had fought one another in the traditional manner, the strong eating the weak. For the past year and a half, however, it looked like the internal gang wars had ceased. In the same time frame, reports of gang warfare outside Mother Russia herself had increased. Particularly, reports grew of attacks against elements of the established Western European crime organizations who had also tried to move into the new Eastern democracies. It was apparent to Kurtzman that the Russian Mafia had fallen under the control of one man, a man whom he was willing to bet his pension was ex-military. And it was also apparent that this man was looking to expand his empire by traditional military means, attack, attack, attack. So far, this all fit with the background information they had from the Russians via the White House. It was good to have that confirmed, but he still had to look deeper into his crystal ball until the face of this mystery man appeared. Time to reload. Stony Man is continued on the next CD. Welcome to the 6 o'clock news. I'm Amanda Hugginkiss. Our top story tonight is the new graphic audio podcast. We go live to Bill Periwinkle. I'm live here on the streets and people have gone crazy. They're so excited about these new graphic audio podcasts, they've started rioting. This is awesome! <laughs> I love graphic audio! Red Bull and Roll! Yeah! Graphic audio! The people demand graphic audio! These people can't get enough graphic audio. Back to you, Amanda. Thanks, Bill. When we come back, Killer Stickies attack Tom Bruise. Jack Grimaldi was at the wheel of the silver four-door BMW 5 Series sports sedan as he drove Mac Bolan and Carl Lyons through the late-night streets of Dresden. Unlike the version of the same car that was sold in the States, this vehicle could crack off 165 miles per hour on the Autobahn. Not that he would be able to open up the machine in downtown Dresden. As with most of the major German cities, the World War II urban renewal, courtesy of the United States Air Force, had left the city planners with lots of open ground to build modern roads. Broad boulevards crisscrossed the town, but even at that time of night, there was too much traffic for that kind of driving. But it was nice to have the power and the handling available if they had to make a speedy getaway. Pull over the corner. We're a block away from the Moscow restaurant. Whoa, shit, Jack. The point is not to bring attention to ourselves. Oh, don't whine. You're not hurt. Now get out there and give them hell. Stepping out of the car, Lyons carefully smoothed the thin black leather gloves over his fingers. For the kind of work he had ahead of him tonight, he didn't want his hands to slip. Opening the BMW's trunk, he pulled out a Spas 12 shotgun. The extended magazine was filled with a special Magnum Buckshot Rounds Cowboy Kissinger whipped up for them at the farm. Instead of packing nine 36 caliber lead balls, his home-brewed rounds were loaded with a dozen 25 caliber frangible steel balls. When they hit their target, they broke apart into four orange slice shaped segments that tore much bigger holes than did the lead balls. A bag of detachable tubular magazines for the Spaz and half a dozen speed loaders for his Colt Python completed his hit kit. Bolan already had his 44 Magnum Desert Eagle on his hip, and his Beretta 93R hung in shoulder leather. From the trunk, he brought out an M249 saw with a sawed-off barrel. The lightweight 5.56mm machine gun was loaded with a 600-round plastic assault magazine. At the weapon's cyclic rate of 725 rounds per minute, that was less than 50 seconds worth of firepower. But a man could do a lot of damage with a saw in those brief 50 seconds. 
a bag with two extra assault magazines for the machine gun, and a second larger bag with prepared demo charges went over his shoulder, and he was ready. They approached the restaurant. After checking to see that the street was clear, Bolin handed Lyons the saw and took out a tapered steel wedge from a side pants pocket. Crouching down to clear the windows, he duck walked over to the front door while Lyons kept guard. After pulling the covering strip off of the bottom of the wedge, Bolin slid the tapered end under the lock side of the door as far as it would go, then pressed it down against the door frame to set the adhesive. For the surprise they had planned, they didn't want anyone to leave by the front door and miss the party. Bolin rejoined Lyons, and the two men slipped down the side of the restaurant to the alley behind. Finding it clear as well, they went to the rear door that their Serb informant reported opened into the kitchen. According to the Serb, this door was always kept locked. That wasn't a problem. The thin titanium pry bar in Lyons' hands made short work of the antique lock. Slipping through the door, they found the kitchen was deserted. Apparently, the staff had been allowed to go home early. Several trays of prepared cold cuts were waiting, however, if the Russians got hungry and wanted something to soak up the vodka they were guzzling. From the empty bottles littering the counter, it was evident that the party had been going on for quite some time. As the Serb had marked on his diagram, the door at the far end of the kitchen opened into a storage area. The strong smell of hash that hit them when they opened it told them that they had found the right place. Opening his demolitions bag, Bolin quickly set the charges around the room and flicked the detonators to remote fire. Okay, that's the last charge. Let's crash the party. Their rubber-soled combat boots made no noise as they moved into position. The kitchen opened into the raised bar area, and they took their places at the top of the low steps that led into the seating area. A quick count revealed 16 men and maybe half as many young women sitting at long bench tables eating, drinking, laughing, groping, and generally having a good time. The two Stony Man commandos stood for a moment, mentally marking the locations of the targets as they waited for a go sign. One of the men, beefy-faced with white blonde hair, focused long enough to see the two black-clad figures standing at the back of the room. He was fumbling for something under his open jacket when Lyons triggered the spas. Two gunmen fired, but Bolin quickly dropped and tripped the saw. Bolin swung the saw back to the left, making sure to miss the women. Two more gangsters collected a handful of 5.56 millimeter lead and collapsed face down on the table. Lion stood at the top of the stairs like an avenging angel. The spas in his hands belched flame and death. Only a man as experienced with firearms as the executioner could have made the cut-down machine gun sing the way he did. Snapping out staccato three-round bursts, he marched his fire from one end of the room to the other. Every time he fired, a Russian went down. By the time Lyons had his fast reloaded, the last gangster was clawing at the front door. Long since glued shut, in a futile attempt to escape the sure death that was being served in the Moscow restaurant. Lyons lowered the smoking spas, drew his python, and carefully leveled the beam. The party girls, long gone, certainly had nothing to do with the operations here. The two quickly rifled the pockets of the dead and collected their wallets and papers. Pocketing the results, they too headed for the rear exit. Come on, let's go, let's go! Not bothering to hide their weapons in the trunk, the two men slid into the BMW. In a flash, he was doing 60 down the cobblestone street. Whoa, watch it, hot shot! I got it, Iron Man! We don't want to be too close when Stryker goes for phase three! On cue, Bolin reached into the glove box, took out the small transmitter, extended the antenna, and hit the red button. Three blocks behind them, a million dollars worth of drugs had been sent to oblivion. Well, that's one. You're counting payback. How many are you going to go for, Iron Man? Lyons' face was set. As many as it takes. The Phoenix Force warriors were crowded around Katz in the CP van, waiting for a reply from the raid. Any news? For the last time, Hawkins, I... Wait. They're out! All right! Yeah! Brilliant! For the start of Bolin and Lyons' rat hunt, Phoenix Force was being kept on standby. Until the two found a target big enough to need their help, they would be working by themselves. That way, if they were tagged and followed, running into Phoenix Force reinforcements would be an unpleasant surprise. Hawkins leaned in closer to his array. With Gadget Schwartz gone, he had stepped up to be the team's new radio and electronics man. I'm starting to get some action on the police emergency frequencies. What do they say? I don't know. It's in German. Patch it to my headset. After listening for a moment to the chatter on his headphones, Katz smiled. It's just the usual response to a report of gunfire and explosions. There's no mention of pursuit. 
They're in the clear. MacArthur, we ready to move on? As soon as I get back. Good, I'll update the bear before we pull out. Cats. Yes, TJ. How long do you think we're going to be able to get away with this? As long as it takes to do the job. I can live with that. Aaron Kurtzman didn't need to have heard from Katzenellenbogen to know what had gone down in Dresden. He saw the executioner's fingerprints all over the TV coverage of the restaurant shootout, and the story read like a page that had been ripped right out of a history of the old mafia wars. The German media was going ballistic over the incident, and CNN was giving it round-the-clock coverage. He had to admit that even for Bolin and Lyons, it had been a spectacular hit. The body count was 17, 11 Russians and 6 Germans. In a brief call, Katz had reported that the team would be moving on to Munich next, and Kurtzman knew that he could expect more fireworks when they reached their new destination. In the meantime, he and his computer room staff would continue monitoring online correspondence for whispers pointing to the elusive Russian Mafia leadership. He felt certain that they would have to respond to the Dresden attack in some fashion, and when they did, he'd get a hook into them. Hal Brignola had also caught the CNN feed about the Dresden shootout. Since he had worked with Mac Bolin longer than anyone, he knew instantly what had happened. The executioner had struck out of the night, leaving death and destruction behind. He had no problem with that, particularly not when the bodies that had been identified were Russian Mafia and their German Confederates. The hit had been a stunning success and should put the Russian Mafia's plans to infiltrate the German drug markets on hold for quite some time. The downside was that since the raid had been made without official sanction, he couldn't report it to the White House. In fact, he'd had nothing to report to the President since Katzenellenbogen had cut Phoenix Force loose from Stony Man control. To keep from having to admit to the man that the Stony Man teams had gone rogue, he'd been playing along with the burned van ploy. But he didn't think such a flimsy excuse would last much longer. Before he got in touch with the President, he had to try to talk to Price one more time. He caught up with her in her office, apparently doing her routine work as if nothing out of the ordinary was going on. Barbara, can I come in for a minute? We need to talk. She swung her booted feet up onto her desk, leaned back in her chair, and grinned. Thanks to Kurtzman's in-house video surveillance system, she hadn't been caught unaware by Brignola's unexpected visit. The computer expert had warned her that he was on his way to her office. What's on your mind, Hal? Pull up a chair and talk to me. We need to talk about the Dresden hit. I need to be able to tell the President something about it. You can tell him anything you like. Just don't tell him that we had anything to do with it because we didn't. Katz still hasn't gotten contact, so I don't know what the situation is with him. Make sure the man tells that to the Russians as well. Damn it. You can't keep this up too much longer, you know. Keep up what, Hal? Damn it, Barbara. I can't help you if I don't know what's going on over there. You also can't help me, as you put it, if the President blabs to the Russians again. You've got to take a stand, Hal. Seeing that this was going nowhere fast, he simply got up and left her office while he still could. Munich didn't look like a place that could be the hub of the international weapons black market, but reports were indicating that it was in fact the source for many of the small arms ending up in the hands of the gangs ex-Russian army small arms. Though Munich was a well-known good time town, it put the word Oktoberfest into the world's vocabulary, it was also the birthplace of the Nazi party. That was a long time ago, but even in the late 90s, the good time Charlies and the raging radicals still mixed in Munich, particularly within its large student population. The radicals still dreamed their worn-out schemes of social engineering, and their plans all required firepower. Munich's geographical location in southern Germany made it a perfect hub giving access to eastern as well as northern and southern Europe. Guns and drugs from the east could easily move on to willing buyers in the rest of western Europe. Katzenellenbogen set up the Munich operation to work the same way as in Dresden, but with one difference. This time, Bolin and Lyons would have assistance from Phoenix Force. David McCarter and T.J. Hawkins also took to the streets in phase one to start working the low-level dealers. One evening's work was all they needed to get their first leads, and Lyons scored first off a street corner pusher. Lyons held out the semi-auto pistol he'd found in the coat pocket of his mark. Take a look at this, Stryker. It's still got the Cosmoline on it. The matte blue pistol in question was a standard military-issue Russian 9mm Makarov PM. 
Looking on the side of the slide, Bolin saw that it had been manufactured in 1988 in State Factory No. 64. State Factory 64 had been in the old Soviet Ukraine, and when the Soviet Union came apart, the Russians had been forced to leave the factory to the newly independent Ukrainian Republic. But they weren't about to leave the factory's arsenal behind. The Russians had loaded all of the factory's vast stocks of weapons for rail shipment back to safety within the new boundaries of Mother Russia. But several train cars full of weapons mysteriously never reached their destination. Not long after that, thousands of Kalashnikov assault rifles and Makarov pistols bearing the stamp of State Factory 64 hit the arms black market, and they were still being sold. Where did you get this weapon? The, the, the streets are dangerous. One of my friends was shot last week, and I wanted to protect myself. So you bought this from the same guy who you buy your hashish from, right? No, no. He just told me where to go to get it. And where is that? When the two sweep teams got back to Katz's CP to compare notes, they had very similar stories to tell. Things are getting serious in this town, Stryker. Of the three guys we busted, two of them were packing. Makarov's, right? Your guys too? Yeah, and our guy volunteered the name and address of the gun dealer. One of mine said he got it from a friend, the other one gave up his source as well. A warehouse on Adlerstrasse? That's the place. Was your Makarov made in State Factory 64? Yes, it was. And it doesn't look like it's ever been fired. Hmm. Rather than just popping the drug wholesalers this time, I think we should take out the gun runner operation as well. That should make somebody sit up and take notice. Good idea, Katz. And let's go for a prisoner this time if we can. Taking out the low-level scum is all fine and good, but we need to talk to somebody so we can get at those Russian bastards ASAP. Hearing Lyons ask for prisoners was something different, but McCarter saw his point. We'll give it a try. While the rest of the team prepared, Jack Grimaldi drove Bolin and Lyons to recon the warehouse that supposedly held the weapons. Like many of the towns in southern Germany, Munich still had much of its original street plan intact. Adlerstrasse was in the heart of the old commercial district and was flanked by multi-story brick buildings on both sides of the street. The address was easy to find, and Grimaldi stopped his BMW a block past it to let the two men out. I'll be on a horn if you need a quick extract. We'll be okay. It's daylight. The two men found an empty building behind their target and took positions on the second floor looking down onto the building's loading docks. From the logos on the sides of the trucks that were parked for unloading, it was hard to tell exactly what was being stored in the building. There were furniture vans, rug suppliers, and wine trucks offloading, as well as others marked only as being from transportation companies all over Europe. The building's back wall facing the loading dock was blank with no windows, as were the side walls. The second and third floors had windows, but they appeared to have been painted over. We're gonna have to move inside to make sure that this is the right place. The last thing we need right now is to hit the wrong warehouse. Right. We'll move in as soon as everyone goes home for the day. The last truck didn't leave the warehouse loading dock until right before dusk. And as darkness fell, the two men saw that several lights had been left on inside the second and third floors of the old brick building. Just what I wanted. Someone to call on. I hate raiding a place where no one's home. There's no one to talk to. Take it easy, Carl. Remember that we need to recon that place first before we start busting heads. I was afraid that you were going to remind me of that. By this time, Katz had the van parked around the corner, ready to move on Boland's command. He agreed that they needed to make sure that weapons were being stored there before they destroyed the place. Figuring that the building's security system wouldn't have been activated because of the workers inside, Lyons decided to try one of the side doors. Locked? Yeah. I got my lockpicks around here. Ah, done. I'll stand guard. Sure thing. Let me just crack this open. Shit. Guard? Coming down the stairs. Russian. Has a subgun. Looked like a scorpion. Sounds promising. Sounds perfect. This has to be the place. Bolin keyed his throat mic and called McCarter. The target is good. Come on in. There's a side door on the east that's open, and we'll be waiting outside. Roger. We're on our way. In the few minutes that it took Phoenix Force to arrive, Bolin and Lyons watched the guard go back up the stairs to the second floor. Hopefully, the first floor would now be clear, and they could make their entry unseen. 
McCarter left Enciso to cover the loading dock and sent Manning around to watch the front while he, James, and Hawkins joined Bolin and Lyons. Since they didn't know how many opponents they were facing, they made a stealthy entry and, checking the first floor, came up with nothing interesting, not even crates with Russian lettering. Apparently, that floor was legitimate, a front for the public. Since this was an older building, it had no elevators, but two staircases led to the upper floors. Bolin and Lyons took one stairwell, while the three Phoenix Force commandos took the other. When James caught McCarter's attention and tapped the flashbang grenade on his harness, McCarter shook his head. The second floor was also clean. As they started up the stairs again, McCarter clicked his comm link and pulled a flashbang from his harness. The others followed suit, preparing to announce their arrival with a bang. Lyons followed close behind Bolin as they slowly climbed the stairs. They were halfway up when a big blonde Russian guard started down. Topa! Lyons was quickest to draw. <laughs> Lyons sidestepped his body as he raced up the rest of the steps. In the other stairwell, McCarter and James tossed their grenades, then charged to the top. The four hard men had been taken by surprise and stunned by the flashback, but they had no intention of giving up without a fight. I've got him! The attacker's concentrated fire lasted only a few brief seconds, but it had been enough. Five bodies lay collapsed on the floor. Lyons checked the bodies while Bolin and McCarter scoped out the room. Much of the space was taken up with crated Russian weapons, AK-47 assault rifles and Makarov pistols. No attempt had been made to disguise the crates. They still bore their Russian military markings. Shit! Someone was planning on starting a war around here. As well as a hell of a party. Look at all this hash. It's time to clear out, Striker. I just picked up radio traffic from the fire brigade and the cops. They're both en route to your location. Shit, that was quick. Cat says the cops are on their way, guys. We're out of here. Bolin reached for the thermite grenades on his harness. He popped the incendiary grenades and dropped them on top of the weapons crates. They would burn through and fuse the steel into lumps of slag. No one would be killing anyone with these weapons. Following the others to the stairs, Hawkins pulled the pins of two more thermite grenades and tossed the bombs behind him. With the fire units coming, he wanted to ensure that nothing was going to save this place. As they ran to the van, Lyons wasn't unhappy that he hadn't gotten the prisoners he'd wanted. He was content just to have the body count. The drugs and weapons that were going up in flames were an added bonus, but for him it was the blood that counted the most. Gregor Rostov was becoming concerned about his Western European operations. The raid on the restaurant hangout in Dresden had put a serious dent in his growing German business. Allowing someone, anyone, to attack his organization wasn't good business for a man in his position. The only way he could successfully run the organization he had created was for him to be feared. But for him to be feared, he had to know who to intimidate. The raid could have been the work of one of the Western narco gangs who were trying to send him a message. The savage execution of his associates and the destruction of the restaurant bore their stamp. But it appeared that the inventory had been left behind, as it had been in the raid on Blatz's operation in Berlin. That could have been to show him that the product was unimportant compared to his taking over someone's established turf. Or, this could mean that Velinsikov's Americans were still working against him. His agent in the minister's office had reported that he hadn't been informed about any more American actions since Prague. The minister also hadn't been told that they had gone back to America. Regardless of who had raided him with such ferocity, force would be matched with force. It wasn't a problem for him to bring force to bear. No matter how much force was directed at him, he could return it in spades. Whoever was moving against Rostov had to be taught a lesson they would never forget, and leaving broken bodies behind was a good teaching aid. He would find out who was behind this, and when he did, they would fervently wish they hadn't gotten involved with him. Every man had a weakness. Even the most hardened criminal had family or friends that he cared about. Before he could send his hit teams into action, however, he needed to know who to send them against. He had just ordered Boris Detloff to extend an invitation to the leaders of the largest European gangs to meet him in Budapest for a summit meeting. The invitation was couched in such a manner that he was confident that most of them would respond. When he had them at the table, he intended to work out a truce with them and explain why it was to their advantage not to get in his way. They could either decide to cut him in for a large piece of the Western European pie, or they could face a turf war the likes of which they had never seen before. Anyone who didn't get on board his program would be targeted immediately. 
He also intended to have another talk with his two captives to try to develop more information about the covert teams. As he had bragged to them, the chemical interrogation worked wonders, but he didn't have the time to wait several sessions before they let slip a vital bit of information. He needed to know about their operation now. Fortunately, chemicals weren't the only interrogation tools he had inherited from the old KGB. There was also the matter of the nerve induction device. While cruder, it had a good track record and wouldn't leave evidence that might prove embarrassing at the public trials he had planned for Schwartz and Blancanales. Schwartz was tired of sitting in a cell. Even with Blancanales for company, it was getting boring. In other circumstances, the two of them would have kept themselves busy trying to figure out a way to break out, but they had been forced into inactivity this time. The problem was that they were both very much aware of the video eyes that covered every inch of the 12 by 16 foot cell. Those electronic eyes never blinked, and they never grew tired. There was nothing they could say or do that wasn't recorded for Rostov to go over whenever he wanted. Schwartz hadn't earned the nickname Gadgets for nothing, but there was absolutely nothing in the cell for him to work with. Whatever he thought about Rostov personally, the Russian was a real pro when it came to running a prison. The windowless cell contained concrete ledges extending from the walls for bunks, a one-piece stainless steel sink, and a Euro-style hole-in-the-bare-floor toilet. Period. Even the light fixture was sunk into the ceiling and covered with a thick plate of glass. He had seen solitary confinement rooms with more lavish furnishings. This place was more like the freak-out room in a psycho ward than a prison. Blancanales watched Schwartz's eyes sweep the room again and again, and knew full well what was going through his teammate's mind. You might as well hang it up, buddy. The Russians know how to build holding cells. God knows they've had enough practice at it. Hell, even before Lenin, the Tsar's secret police had hundreds of Russians in escape-proof cells. I'm just trying to see if... Hey, somebody's coming. Mr. Schwartz, my colonel wants to see you. Schwartz watched the technician insert the steel needles into the nerves of his right arm. Strapped in a heavy chair, there was little he could do but try to endure whatever was coming next. I thought you said you Russians didn't need to resort to using pain to get your information. The chemicals work well enough with most people, but there are those cases where a little physical stimulation in conjunction with the chemicals is required. Unfortunately, Mr. Schwartz, you are one of those cases. Rostov motioned to the technician. You may begin. Oh. Schwartz had to bite back a scream. His hand felt as if it were on fire. The pain seemed to last forever. Out of the corners of Schwartz's watering eyes, he saw the technician make an adjustment to his machine before hitting the switch again. This time, his entire arm felt like it had been dipped in molten lead. Screaming didn't stop the pain, however, and at some point in the procedure, he slipped into the welcoming darkness of oblivion. An ammonia capsule snapped Schwartz awake to find that from his fingertips to his elbow, his right arm was still in unbelievable agony. When he could focus his eyes, he looked to see how badly he had been hurt. He couldn't believe that his arm looked completely normal. There was no blood, none of the bones had been broken, and except for the small dots where the electrodes had been attached, he was unmarked. In fact, the only mark his body bore was where he had bitten through his lip in agony. When he was helped up to his feet, he could hardly walk. His whole body felt like he had been beaten by a team of experts. When he was led back to the cell he shared with Blancanales, he knew that it wasn't some sign of Rostov's compassion. It was just a further interrogation tactic. With the cell wired, anything they did or said would be recorded. As the two able team commandos expected, Rostov and Detloff were in the control room watching when Schwartz was returned to the lockup. Those two men are tough. I have to give them that. They are. But this is one time when toughness, while admirable, is not going to do them much good. The next time I put them under the chemicals, their subconscious minds will remember the nerve induction technique. And while their conscious minds are tough enough to withhold information, regardless of the consequences, their subconscious wants to avoid pain at all costs. It is a survival mechanism in all humans. <laughs> next time they will tell me what I need to know. What if they do not know? They will still be able to tell me how to find out what I want to know. When do you want the other one? Give him a few more minutes. The wait will make the treatment more effective. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. 
Aaron Kurtzman filled his coffee cup and settled in behind his keyboard. Tapping in a code that only he and Barbara Price knew, he activated the satellite link to Katzenellenbogen's CP van. It was daytime in Europe, and he knew Katz would be awake. Hey, Katz, what's next on the Iron Man's program? I've been going through the material you sent trying to figure out where we can get the biggest bang for our buck here and elicit a response from our Russian friends. We can't keep doing this forever, so I want to do as much damage to them as we can before we're asked to leave town. Kurtzman smiled. If it ever came time for someone to ask Phoenix Force to leave town, it would be an international incident. I have an idea that might help you smoke out the Russians. Let's hear it. I'm getting a lot of buzz about your activities from Interpol. They're acting like someone chucked a live grenade into a church social. Do tell. What have they been doing? For one thing, they've been pulling in all their mob informants and putting them through the fifth degree, trying to find out what's behind this. They're reading it as a major turf war, and they're trying to put the fire out before the civilians start getting hurt, too. Have they picked up on the Russian connection to any of this yet? They're starting to get a glimmer of that. A couple of the bodies you left behind and the weapons in Munich couldn't be ignored. But so far, they're sitting on that part of it because of the politics involved. No one wants to be the first one to start up the Cold War again. That figures. Needless to say, your activities also have the old established Euro gangs in a bit of a panic, thinking that they're going to be next on the hit list. They're so nervous, in fact, that I think you might be able to squeeze them a little and get them to turn over their Russian connections. If anyone knows who's behind this, they do. What did you have in mind? Well, I just happen to have a little plan I've been working on. I think you'll like it. Well, I sure would like to see it. Send it on over. France. Even in his European-styled clothes, Carl Lyons looked a little out of place in the Toulouse waterfront nightclub. It wasn't the usual seaman and working man's bar one would have expected to find along the dock. The bar at the head of the pier had been discovered by the trendy set and was now a watering hole for the pampered adult children of Europe's wealthy classes. Glittering heiresses, playboys, rock stars and actors crowded the tables and small dance floor of the newly renamed Neptune Club. In that crowd, Lyons looked like an overgrown rabid wolf sitting in on a peacock convention. T.J. Hawkins fit into the crowd at the Neptune a little better than Lyons. Even though he, too, was a force to be reckoned with, he wore it a little easier than Lyons. His easy southern manner and open grin hid his intentions as well as a carnival mask. He had taken a spot at the bar and was keeping a young Italian beauty company while he nursed a tall drink of his own devising that was mostly soda and grenadine syrup. The third inside man of the snatch team was Rafael Enciso. The Cuban was a little older than most of the partiers, but his Latin looks helped him hide in the crowd. His position at a stand-up table on the edge of the dance floor was the third point of the triangle formed by Lyons and Hawkins. Their target in the center of the triangle was a prime example of excess. He was in his late 20s, wore overly flashy clothing and jewelry, talked too loudly, drank expensive whiskey, and was trying very hard to give the appearance of being the man of the hour. The two thugs hovering near Napoleon Leontines, son of the leader of the Union Corps, were there to make sure that none of the club's other patrons objected to their boss's ego-enhancing, drug-fueled fantasies. In the parking lot in front of the club, Jack Grimaldi waited in the getaway car. This time, Katz had scored a Citroën Maserati SM sedan for their use. The combination of a French chassis with a pavement-pounding Maserati engine had created the fastest road car France had ever produced. He had always wanted to ring out an SM, and here was his chance. Two parking slots down from the SM, a big Chevy Blazer 4x4 was parked nose out. Heavy Detroit iron was the latest imported status symbol in Europe, and it didn't look at all out of place in front of the club. It was to be Hawkins's ride when the snatch went down. As soon as Grimaldi hit the road, his job would be to make sure that no one got on his tail. Hawkins wouldn't be able to keep up with the Citroën Maserati, but he could sure as hell block the narrow road until the lead car hit the Autostrada. Let's get this show on the road, guys. We're on the way. Bolin and McCarter entered the club by the back door. Dressed in their black suits, they had both put colored windbreakers over them to hide their hardware until it came time to use it. We're in. Show done. Hearing his cue, Hawkins pushed himself away from the bar, softly running his hand over the Italian woman's hip. She blushed and beamed a huge smile. 
Lyons and Enciso had also left their places, and the three men converged on the table where Leontinus was holding court. Leontinus' bodyguards were so intent on watching their boss fondle the breasts of a leggy redhead that they never had a chance. Lyons had the muzzle of his Colt Python screwed into the ear of his man in a flash. Freeze, scumbag! The guard didn't move after that. Hawkins had the razor-sharp blade of his K-Bar fighting knife against the throat of the second bodyguard, who was smart enough not to move and risk having his throat slashed. Napoleon Leontinus came out of his fog when the guard Lyons had pistol whipped fell at his feet. When he saw Hawkins' grinning face behind the K-Bar, his shout couldn't be heard over the noise from the bandstand. While he was trying to decide what he was going to do next, Boland, McCarter, and Enciso were on him. McCarter jerked his right arm into a come-along hold, while Bolin let him feel the muzzle of his Beretta against his side. Not a sound or you die here. When Hawkins felt his bodyguard tense as if he were going to try something, he reversed the K-Bar. The thug joined his pal on the floor. The redhead blinked in a drug-induced fog, then collapsed to the floor in a faint. With McCarter on one side and Bolin on the other, Leontinus was half-carried through the room with Enciso trailing and Hawkins and Lyons covering him. As they crossed the crowded floor, a few people noticed what was going on, but they didn't choose to get involved. The oversized bouncer at the door took one look at the entourage and wisely decided that he didn't want any of it either. He knew who Leontinus was, and if someone had dared to take him out, it was a little more than he wanted to get involved with. He would, however, wait a while and make a discreet phone call or two. In the parking lot, Hawkins and McCarter peeled away from the group and headed for the blazer. You got him? I sure hope so. I'd feel bad if this wasn't him. You're not sure it's him? He's kidding, Jack. It's him. Iron Man, open the door. Après vous, s'il vous plaît. Merci. <sighs> oh, that roof will get you every time. It's gonna leave a bump. He'll be fine. Time to leave. Grimaldi was on the gas as soon as they had the door shut. With McCarter riding shotgun, Hawkins did his best to keep up with Grimaldi's speeding sedan. Katz was the one who made the call and made the demands. Hello? Mr. Leontinus, you need to listen carefully. If you call the Neptune Club, you will learn that your son left there tonight in the company of five men. His two bodyguards were left behind, but they can be retrieved from the local hospital. Is my son hurt? No, he is fine. For now. What do you want from me? Katz quickly made his demands and gave the elder Leontinus the address of the villa they had rented outside Toulouse and a time that he would be expected. I do not need to tell you what will happen to you, whoever you are, if my son is harmed. And I do not need to tell you that your son will die instantly if you do not do exactly what I tell you to. I will make no mistakes. Neither will I. That went well. The old man is a seasoned pro. He knows how the game is played. Now, as soon as Calvin and Gary check in, I can make the second call and we'll be ready to go. While Bolin and Lyons had been putting the arm on Leontinus Jr., Calvin James and Gary Manning had been making their own move in the dockside area of Marseille. Their target was a warehouse on the quay with a brightly lit sign out front proudly proclaiming that it was operated by Bianca Limited, an Italian corporation with business interests all over Europe. The company that owned the warehouse was Italian, very true, but Italian mafia and not all of their European interests were as innocent as the Bianca brochures would like one to believe. They were, however, profitable. A firm as large as Bianca Limited could afford to keep its operation going 24 hours a day, and there was a six-man crew working the night shift. Even so, none of the six wanted to argue with two heavily armed men dressed in night combat suits. After herding them against the wall, James guarded them while Manning did the honors. Reaching into the side pocket of his black suit, he pulled out plastic riot restraints and started binding everyone's wrists and ankles. He then pulled out a roll of two-inch wide surgical tape and slapped a piece over each of their mouths. When Manning turned, he saw that James was trying to drag a heavy crate and stopped him. You're gonna give yourself a hernia. They've got a forklift over there. Can you drive it? Well, if I can't, I know one of these guys can. Give it a shot. Climbing into the seat of the yellow machine, Manning turned the key and saw a gauge on the instrument panel come to life. Hey, this thing's electric. Piece of cake. Where do you want these things? Right in the middle of the floor, away from everything else. All right, 
Let's see what's in these. Hey, that's just what I wanted. Was the bear right? Yeah, it's full of RPG-7 rocket launchers. Keep an eye on the workers, and I'll get this lot ready to go. James went to work rigging the crates with thermite grenades. As James was setting the charges, Manning saw that his prisoners knew what explosives looked like and were visibly panicked. Why don't I take those lads outside and park them somewhere safe? Sure thing. I'll meet you in five. Within five minutes, the night workers had been herded to a safe location off the premises. After the last detonator had been set, James caught up with Manning and shot a glance at the foreman. Tell your boss that we'll be in touch with him later. The foreman glared, but the tape over his mouth kept his thoughts safely to himself. Of all the warehouse's night crew, he was the only one who knew the company that signed his paycheck was connected, as the phrase went. But since the warehouse was posing as a legitimate operation, he hadn't been allowed to have any weapons on the premises. Except, of course, for those that were passing through, buried in the crates of machinery. The two commandos were fading into the dark when the first of the thermite grenades went off. Toulouse, France. David McCarter and Carl Lyons were standing at the top of the villa steps with Gary Manning and Calvin James when the Citroen D-19 sedan pulled into the driveway. The old man who got out of the back seat looked as if he were going to an execution, his own. Carlos Leontinis was in his 60s and wore an expensive but slightly old-fashioned suit and didn't look anything like a powerful leader of the Union Corse, the Corsican Mafia. If anything, he looked like a middle-class, lower-level public official, a records clerk, or maybe a small-town postmaster. The two men who got out after him had to be his bodyguards. They were young, hard, and their faces showed barely controlled rage. They stood stock still as James and Manning stepped up to them and patted them down for hardware. As they had been instructed, they weren't packing as much as a fingernail file. They're clean. Bring them on up. Bolin and Katzenellenbogen met Leontinus at the door to the villa and escorted him into the main sitting room. When the older man seated himself, his bodyguards automatically moved in to stand behind him. Unarmed as they were, they couldn't do a thing to protect their boss except maybe throw their bodies into the line of fire, but they looked ready to do even that. Bolin purposely didn't offer the Corsican refreshments. He knew that the old man would have to refuse to eat or drink with his son's kidnappers, and that would set a bad tone for the meeting. Let me see my son. At Bolin's nod, James and Hawkins escorted the young man into the room. For having been an unwilling guest for the night, he didn't look any worse for the experience. Bolin turned back to Leontinus. I am sorry for the inconvenience this has caused you, but it was necessary. You will pay for that inconvenience, asshole. Shut up, Napoleon. I apologize for my son's outburst. What must I do to free him? I need a favor from you. What are you talking about, a favor? All you're going to get from me is a bullet in your head, you Yankee bastard. Bolin signaled to James, and the Phoenix Force commando stepped up to the young man, his Beretta in his hand. Without a word, the ex-seal thumbed back the hammer and placed the muzzle against the side of the young man's head. Napoleon shut his mouth and froze. Bolin looked back at the old man. You might want to tell your son that if he says another word, I will have my man kill him. I came here to talk to you, not to a punk kid who's too stupid to know when to shut his mouth. And that is to say nothing about how easily he allowed himself to come into my hands. Akiva forte, va alla morte. He turned to Bolin. A Corsican proverb. He who lives fast goes straight to his death. He will not speak again. Now, what is this favor you need done? You've heard about the Dresden hit on the Russian Mafia and the other operations of theirs that have been taken down lately? I have. I'm responsible for that. Who are you? It isn't necessary that you know that. It's only necessary for you to know that I have a printout of your major holdings in several countries, as well as a list of your major operatives. I think you'll find that it makes interesting reading. What are you talking? My God. I know that isn't the full extent of your operations, but I also know that what is listed is accurate and represents the majority of your holdings. If that list was given to Interpol, you and your family would be out of business as well as in prison. Do we understand each other? What is the price you are asking to keep this information to yourself? Normally there would be no price on earth that would keep me from putting a man like you out of business. But this time, I need information about one of your competitors. 
Could I have a drink? Certainly. And please, uh, have my son escorted outside. When Bolin nodded, James and Hawkins took Napoleon's arms and led him out of the room. Bolin left the Corsican to drink his wine for a moment. Regardless of the business he was in, the old man lived by a strict code of conduct, and informing on anyone was forbidden no matter what the price. Even to save the life of his worthless but only son, it was hard for him to break Omerta. Who is it that do you need this information on? The Russian Mafia leader who has been trying to move into Eastern Europe. The Corsican almost smiled. Hmm. You could have had that information without going to these lengths, and I would have given it to you for free. The name of the man you want is Rostov. Gregor Rostov. And he is a man completely without honor. He has grand ideas, though, for such a man. He sent me, Carlos Leontinis, a letter ordering me to attend a meeting he is holding in Budapest. When is the meeting being held? Two nights from now, at the Gellert Hotel in Budapest. Beyond that, I know nothing about him except that he is dangerous. I hope you catch up with him. He makes trouble for all of us. Thank you. That is all? That's all. You may go. Oh, and one last word of friendly advice, if I may. My agreement is with you and you alone. Apparently your son isn't the man his father is, so I caution you to keep him under strict control. Should he become a problem for me, any kind of problem, I will have to kill him. I'm sure you understand. Uh, it is his mother's fault. She has indulged him too much. He thinks that the old ways are no longer valid. He is not, as you and I understand it, a man of honor. You'd better find some way to convince him that I'm serious, then. One word out of him about this, or one action against me, no matter how trivial, and your wife will be without a son. I understand. I knew you would. Well, that went off better than I thought it would. I thought the Corsicans were tougher than that. The Corsicans understand business. And the old man does it like the Russians, because they don't follow the old code. It's no skin off his nose if they're forced out of the Western European markets. In fact, it will boost his share of the pie. Plus, he was worried about what we were going to do to his son. I thought we were going to have to kill that asshole kid to make your point. Yeah, I have a hunch we'll be hearing from him later. He's not the kind who learns quickly. If we have to zero him, it'll cause us trouble with the old man's Corsicans. I'll worry about them when it happens. Gregor Rostov's name wasn't entirely new to Aaron Kurtzman. He had come across it before, in a report about the Red Army smuggling drugs during the war in Afghanistan. Back then, Rostov had been a highly decorated colonel of a guards regiment specializing in counter-guerrilla tactics. He fell from grace when he masterminded a gruesome scheme to ship heroin to Russia packed in coffins with the bodies of Red Army casualties. When one of the coffins went astray and was opened, Rostov was court-martialed and sent to prison for his crimes. Obviously, he had been freed and was now back in business. Kurtzman wasn't surprised to find a man like him as the guiding hand behind the Russian Mafia. It took a special kind of man to control an organization of trained soldiers, and Rostov's rank and personal combat record would give him that cachet. And a man who would ship drugs back with his own combat dead was certainly cold enough to do almost anything to make money. That also keyed into bits and pieces he had been picking up about the renewed activity among certain European terrorist groups like the Italian Red Brigades and the IRA. Now that the Soviet Union was no more, the European terrorist groups had lost their traditional paymaster and had been forced to turn to non-political crime to support themselves. They too would feel right at home joining what was in effect a paramilitary criminal organization. This was something that needed to be tracked. The best piece of information Katz had picked up, however, was the tip about the criminal summit meeting in Budapest. That had great possibilities. If Rostov was calling all of those dogs together in the same kennel, it could only mean that he was confident that he would come out of it the top dog. Considering who he was trying to put the arm on, it was a gutsy move. This meeting could be a great chance for Stony Man to make a sweep of the heads of the European underground. They could go for a mass killing or a selective culling of the group. On the surface, it was a very attractive idea, but at a closer glance, it was looking like they would have to take a pass. For one thing, 
they would be going up against a small army. And unlike the Dresden and Munich hits, there would be almost no chance of achieving surprise. The heads of the various organizations would be paranoid beyond reason and would cry wolf at the slightest shadow. Short of blowing up the hotel with everyone in it, it would be almost impossible to take them out. That wasn't to say, however, that the summit couldn't be exploited to their advantage. Killing the heads of the Western gangs in Budapest wouldn't defuse the threat posed by the Russian Mafia. At best, it would simply put things off for a few months until the gangs could pick new leaders. It might also create a power vacuum in Western Europe that Rostov would rush to fill. But even killing Rostov himself might not solve the Russian situation. Since he had so little information on the details of Rostov's organization, he couldn't make that assessment. For instance, he didn't know if Rostov's second-in-command was more of a threat than he was, and if killing Rostov would only make matters worse. To make an impact on the activities of the Russian Mafia, as well as get payback for Schwartz and Blancanales, they needed to take the long-term view this time. They needed to burrow deeper and gather more information until they could strike at the heart, not only the head, of the organization. And the Budapest summit was a perfect place to do exactly that. There were few places that were as easy to gather information than in a hotel. Knowing Mafia chieftains the way he did, Kurtzman figured that to ensure their security, they would want to take over one complete floor of the hotel for their own use and damn the cost. That's what American capos would do, and he didn't think that the mental processes of their European counterparts were that much different. That would limit the area that would have to be covered. And the gangsters would be using the latest electronic gadgets to talk to one another and their home bases. He would call up an NSA electronic intercept bird and park it over Budapest for those few days and see what he could filter out of the electronic background babble of an entire city. The best eavesdropping, however, would be from inside the hotel itself. Not having the services of Hermann Gadget Schwartz would make that task a little more difficult. But he could see to it that the team received enough devices to adequately cover the event. Quickly drawing up an equipment list, he emailed it to John Kissinger with instructions to start packing and shipping ASAP. He didn't need to caution him about security this time. Allowing Brugnola to stumble onto that one shipment had been less than enough. He hated seeing the farm operating with this level of internal security, but until Hal decided to join the revolt, they had no choice but to continue locking him out. After plotting out a tentative plan for the Budapest operation, he uplinked it to Katzenellenbogen for comment and refinement. Hopefully, the rest of the operatives would see the reasoning behind his plan. France. This plan is bullshit, Katz. I don't believe the bear came up with something like this. If I get that Russian bastard in my sights, I'm gonna waste his sorry ass. Carl, Aaron's right this time. We'll get Rostov. You can take that one to the bank. But I want to take down his entire organization when we do it. We may have cut Hal out of the loop on this, but if we can carry out the original mission, I still want to do it. Okay, okay. I'll buy a sneak and peek this time. But if I happen to come across Rostov, he's going down. I won't try to stop you. It's been a while since any of us have been to Budapest, so you might want to have Kurtzman fax us a briefing packet and current maps. I've got that coming, plus our hotel reservations. Hal Brignola knew that something big was going down. Even with everyone giving him the silent treatment on everything except the most trivial happenings, he could feel it. He had headed this group since its inception, and he could read faces as well as the next guy. Something major was being planned, and he wanted to be in it. He had been keeping track of Stony Man's European exploits as best he could by reading the press reports and watching CNN with a critical eye. The bloody restaurant raid in Dresden had been followed by another executioner-style shootout at a warehouse full of Russian military small arms in Munich. Again, the body count had been impressive. There had also been a minor exercise at a dockside warehouse in Marseille, an unexplained fire that had destroyed a shipment of machinery destined for Africa, or so the firm controlling the warehouse reported. The problem with that explanation was that he knew the company was a front for one of the major Italian mafia operations. Curiously enough, even with all this going down, the president hadn't asked him for an update. The man had accepted his lame explanation that the loss of the van had put the team temporarily out of communication and that their equipment would have to be replaced before they could continue the operation. Since then, fortunately for Price and the rest of the insurrectionists, 
The president had been occupied putting out political fires with Mexico and visiting natural disasters in California. Hopefully his schedule would stay that full for at least another week. By that time, Brignola hoped that he would be able to break through the code of silence that had shut him out. He knew, though, that his only chance to do that was to get through to Kurtzman. Price had made up her mind about him, and he knew that she wasn't going to change it any time in the near future. Not until the Russians were completely out of the picture. Betrayal was one of her least favorite things, and though she hadn't come right out and said it, he knew that she held the president accountable for the tragedy in Prague. He hoped, though, that he would be able to get through to Kurtzman and make him understand that he could be trusted to help with whatever they had going down. Brignola found Kurtzman working late again, but then Kurtzman always worked late. In fact, except for meals, which he often ate while working or when he was sleeping, the bear was almost always in his den. Glancing at Kurtzman's monitor as he approached, he saw that the screen was covered with what looked like a sea chart of the Atlantic Ocean. He had no idea of what that had to do with anything, and he suspected that Kurtzman was probably just using it as a screensaver to keep him from seeing what he was really working on. Aaron, we need to talk. Pull up a chair. What's on your mind, Hal? The same thing that's on everyone else's mind around here. Well, as you can see, I'm working on one of my pet projects, but I don't think that anyone else around here is really interested in Type 21 U-boat movements during the last three days of the Third Reich. I'm still trying to find the one that carried all that gold away. Cut the crap, Aaron. I'm tired of all this sandbagging. I want you to pass on a message to Barbara, because I can't seem to talk to her. Okay. So, what's the message, Hal? I've decided to hang it up when this thing is over, Aaron. Win, lose, or draw, I think I've about outlived my usefulness around here. Believe it or not, I still have a wife and family, and I'd like to spend some time with them. Hal, I... You made Stony Man. You're responsible for convincing the Feds to allow us for making contacts all around the world, for drawing in the men, and all that's done. I'm getting old, Aaron. The farm's getting old with me. It won't be the same around here without you, Hal. But I don't think that we'll be together all that much longer anyway. I don't know how much longer we can keep this up without the man going ballistic and shutting us down. But that's what I'm trying to prevent, Aaron. I don't want to see us shut down. The president needs us, and so does a nation. He said us, Hal. And there is no us right now, as far as you're concerned. We came up against a problem, we lost two of our people, and you couldn't see your way clear to do what had to be done to keep it from happening again. You can't serve two masters, Hal. No one can. I realize that you work for the president. We all do. But you should have resigned, rather than risk sending the teams into something like this. And don't try to tell me that the teams get paid to put their lives on the line. You give me that line, and I'm going to retire your ass right here and now. The difference this time is that you let the president loan our people out to deal with something that the Russians should have been taking care of themselves. Then the worst thing is that this mission ties us to an intelligence source that gives us bad information and we lose gadgets and Paul. I think that's a little harsh to say that I let any of this happen, Aaron. Did you do anything to keep it from happening? No. No, I didn't. But I want to keep it from happening again. And just how do you think you're going to do that? by joining the revolt. I'm ready to put on a red armband, wear my shirt backwards, or paint my ass blue, or whatever I have to do to mark me as being one of the good guys around here. <laughs> Try the ass paint. That should go over big time in the Oval Office. I won't be seeing the inside of the Oval Office until this is over, and I hand in my resignation. You're serious about that, aren't you? I am. Well then, welcome aboard. I'll get your red armband as soon as the quartermaster shows up. I think that we're temporarily out of blue ash paint. Men, while you're waiting to be sworn in, I might as well fill you in on what we've come up with so far. Time to reload. Stony Man is continued on the next CD. With other audiobooks... There in the hole. Kane glanced over his shoulder as flaming smoke doubted from his hollow bore at the missile launcher. Propelled by a wavering ribbon of vapor and sparks, the heat ground leaped from the tube. The warhead impacted in a thicket, the bricks vaporizing in a rolling ball of billowing orange yellow flame. But with graphic audio... 
a movie in your ears. Fire in the hole! Kane glanced over his shoulder as flame and smoke gouted from the hollow bore of the missile launcher. Propelled by a wavering ribbon of vapor and sparks, the heat round leaped from the tube. The warhead impacted in a thicket, the brush vanishing in a roiling ball of billowing orange-yellow flame. Graphic audio. The leading name in audiobooks. Da, 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 da. The Hungarian capital city of Budapest was split by the broad curving sweep of the Danube River. In past centuries, the city had, in fact, been two separate entities, Buda and Pest, and even now, the locals still regarded them as such. Buda was on the west bank of the river, nestled in low hills. Pest, to the east, marked the start of the plains that were home to the well-known horsemen of the Magyar peoples. Near the famous castle on the west side of the river stood the Gellert Hotel. This grand edifice was a survivor from Budapest's glory days of the 30s, when it had been a favorite haunt of Europe's aristocracy and royalty. It had suffered during the years of Soviet occupation, but now that it had been completely refurbished, it was once again the place to stay in the city. This time around, however, it catered to the nouveau aristocracy of the Eastern Republics, who had access to hard currencies instead of long but poverty-stricken noble pedigrees. This meant that up-and-coming politicians rubbed elbows with budding young capitalists, wealthy businessmen, TV personalities, and most of all, gangsters in the hotel's posh lounges and dining rooms. With this kind of moneyed clientele, the Gellert also drew the young beauties of a city long known for the beauty of its women, and the Grand Hotel was once more the place to be seen in the city. It was to this renewed center of Budapest that dozens of Europe's gang leaders came for Gregor Rostov's conference. Rostov also had several goals in mind for his summit. For one, he wanted to try to deal with the predation that had been eating away at his operations in both Western and Eastern Europe. If the Americans were responsible, as Detloff thought, that was one thing. But if it was the competition, he wanted to put an end to it by agreement. Lastly, he too wanted to make a personal evaluation of the men he would one day either control or destroy. One way or the other, by the end of the conference, he fully intended to be the top crime boss in Europe. How many people he would have to kill to get that job would depend on what happened over the next two or three days. Hopefully, though, his plans would meet with approval. It would be far easier on everyone if they decided to follow his lead on their own. The Stony Man team was on hand for the opening day of Rostov's venture, and they had no problem picking out the invited players from the rest of the guests at the Gellert Hotel. While the gangsters were less flashy than their American Mafia counterparts, there was still a look and an attitude that went with their line of work. In a town where success called for high fashion, the gangsters always took the look to extremes. So they certainly looked nice in the pictures the watchers were taking so Kurtzman could try to ID them from his mugshot file. It was also easy to tell that most of the lower-level gunmen who accompanied their bosses weren't very happy about being where they were. In a place like the Gellert Hotel, it was almost impossible for them to guard their principles when there were so many people coming and going all the time. But with the top floor reserved, it would be somewhat easier. Cats, why don't you let Calvin and me take a crack at being the main inside team? There is no way that you two are ever going to blend in with the locals. Not with your accent. And Calvin, you may have noticed that there aren't all that many blacks in Hungary. But we won't need to blend in. We can go as who we are. Two Americans touring Europe. Some tour. Visit the old world, kill a few people, and blow things up. It sounds like the motto from a Marine Corps recruitment poster. That's true. But that way we'll get tagged as Americans early on and we can draw the opposition's attention while the rest of you guys do your thing. What do you think, Mac? The executioner shrugged. That approach has worked before, but we need to send in some of the others as well. David can go in as a British freelancer. He always looks like he's in Mufti, and he can be looking for work in the open markets of the East. You do your Israeli businessman routine, and Gary can be the academic from Montreal, maybe a historian. That'll leave Rafe, Jack, Carl, and me to man the van and provide backup. Let's do it. I'm ready for a little better class of accommodation for a change. Cheap rooms only for you and Calvin. Remember, you're supposed to be Americans. 
Two hours later, Hawkins was ready to make his initial recon. With James and Katz in the lobby as backup, Hawkins rode the elevator to the top floor Rostov had reserved for his summit meeting. Though the elevator's button for that floor had been taped over and listed as out of order, he punched it anyway and leaned back to enjoy the ride. With a fresh shave, overgrown mop of hair, Texas A&M football jersey, and worn blue jeans, Hawkins almost looked, if not like a college student, at least like a young college athletic coach. A day pack with bottled water, a couple of guidebooks, a pack of smokes, and the other day trip essentials helped complete the disguise. What he didn't have was any kind of weapon or communications device. Until he tested Rostov's security, they were playing it very close to the vest. When the elevator doors opened at his destination, he stepped out and was immediately blocked by two large guards. This floor is better reserved. No one is allowed up here. What? But this girl told me there was a party going on up here and she invited me to come up. There is no party here. Just then one of the doors opened. A girl walked out and turned to go down the hall. Can I ask her about the party? <laughs> she is none of your affair. You will leave now. When Hawkins hesitated, the second guard grabbed him and spun him. He allowed himself to be spread-eagled against the wall. Hey, guys, what's going on? The guard who patted him down was a pro. The guy pulled all his pockets inside out and even made him take off his shoes. When the search was over, he motioned for the other guard to lead him back to the elevator. Don't come back. When he reached the bottom floor, he walked out to one of the tables on the patio and slid into the chair next to Calvin James. Oh, I see you got out alive. This time, I need a beer. That evening, Gary Manning and David McCarter were both in the hotel's main lounge, but they weren't sitting together. Manning had taken a table by the entrance, and McCarter was on a stool at the bar. This gave the two of them complete coverage of the area, and they were unobtrusively watching the other customers as they sipped their drinks. They were also paying close attention to the whispered conversations at the tables against the back wall, where tough-looking men with bulges in their jackets drank beer and watched the women in the lounge. The miniature directional microphones McCarter and Manning were both wearing picked up their words and transmitted them to the van, where Katz was translating from several languages. He was also sending the raw transmissions to Stonyman Farm for in-depth translation and review. So far, all he had was bar talk. The security men for Europe's major gang leaders knew better than to run their mouths in a bar. Nonetheless, even the most closely guarded individual might slip up once in a while. T.J. Hawkins and Gary Manning were having problems. They were trying to position a bulky parabolic microphone in front of an open window of a cramped top floor room in a small hotel across the river from the Gellert. They were not being successful. I sure as hell wish the Gadgets was here to help us with this. He'd have this damn thing set up and running in no time. Uh-huh. Manning fought a bulky lock on one of the tripod legs. It had been dented in shipment from the farm and refused to lock down properly. The electronic surveillance phase of the operation wasn't going as smoothly as Katz would have liked. The cellular phone intercepts were working just fine, but they weren't picking up much from them. Everyone might know about the dangers of saying anything indiscreet over a cell phone, but few knew that a normal conversation in a room could be picked up from outside the window glass. It took a special type of microphone to detect and amplify the faint vibrations, but they had secured one through the farm's clandestine contacts in the Langley Labs. All right, I got it. It's up? Yeah. Should be. Should? Well, if it doesn't work, we'll have fun throwing the damn thing out the window. I'm happy with that. Let's fire this thing up and get the feed to cats online. Can do. Carl Lyon sipped his beer and watched as the limousines pulled up to the front of the Gellert. Some of the crime bosses and their bodyguards who climbed in for the ride back to the airport didn't look happy. Some of them, though, had obviously made very good deals with their newly acknowledged overlord. Russian weapons and Afghan hashish were going to become as common in Europe as hamburgers and french fries if Interpol didn't shut it down quickly. Lions didn't have to count the passengers to know that three of their number would be going home as cargo, if they went back at all. For the past few nights, he'd taken out three known gangsters in an attempt to even the score for Paul and Gadgets. That was three more he had chalked up on his personal scoreboard but it didn't make him feel any better. He wouldn't feel that he had done his job until he had his hands around the neck of that Russian bastard Rostov and squeezed until the man's eyeballs popped out. 
Manning walked up to the table and stood in front of Lyons, pulling him out of his reverie. We're ready to roll. Katz wants to get on the road as soon as we can. Where are we going next? He wants to go back to the west. France again. Whatever. Let's do it. While Jack Grimaldi drove the van, Katz, Bolin, Lyons, and McCarter went over the material they had compiled during their three-day surveillance of Rostov's Budapest summit. Most of the leads they had picked up weren't very helpful in their search for inside information about Rostov's organization. The Russian had been very careful about what he had mentioned about his operation. So careful, in fact, that most of their intercepts only pertained to the operations of the European gangs. New drug markets had been blocked out and assigned, new properties had been designated as storage areas, and new transportation routes had been mapped. Each gang had signed up for certain numbers of the small arms that were being made available, as well as the increased hashish production. Put together, it was an extensive, comprehensive operation, more than doubling the operations that were already up and running. If these plans were allowed to be carried out, Western Europe would start looking a lot like South Central LA. But, as valuable as those tips were, they would simply be passed on to Interpol or to the national police agencies of the nations involved for them to deal with. There was one operation, however, that Katz thought Stony Man needed to get involved with immediately. I picked up word of this with the parabolic mic. Good job setting the thing up. It worked perfectly. Uh, well, yeah. Of course it did. I set it up. It appears that our friend Rostov had to grant a concession to the Marseille mob to get him to come on board. It was the price they demanded before they were willing to give him a piece of their action. What kind of deal is it? There's a French cop, a prison director in northern France, who's got seven of their top boys in his slammer. And they want to get them out. Rostov offered to kidnap this guy's family and force him to transfer these prisoners so they can be freed while they're in transit. Who are the prisoners? Some are, say, bigwigs and a couple of their best gunmen. That's just the kind of people we like to see back on the streets. That's what I was thinking. And to make it even more interesting, Rostov's going to use some of his terrorist troops on this one. The IRA. When's this supposed to go down? Day after tomorrow. Is there anything we can do to turn this around for that cop? We could deal ourselves a hand in this one, and it wouldn't be too far off the mark from what we've been trying to do here. Since this is one of Rostov's plays, anyone we take down will be one of his boys. And the more of them we zero, the better it's gonna be for us later when we take him out. I vote that we decide to make a play on this one. Anyone opposed? No one opposed having a chance to take out some IRA killers while freeing a man's kidnapped wife and children. If they could pull this off, it was the kind of operation that made everyone feel good. Okay then. What do we know about the details? Katz flipped through the printout of the conversation. Well, we have both the time and the place as well as the safe house where the wife and kids will be held. Do we have numbers? It won't be that bad. Rostov's assigned eight gunmen to the operation. Three to handle the kidnapping, and the rest to take care of the hijacking of the prison van. Well, that's only a one-to-one -one ratio. Piece of cake. And their IRA. I always relish taking them out. Katz had transmitted hundreds of pages of material from the Budapest stakeout intercepts back to the farm. Most of the information, however, wasn't very useful. But that was the way that kind of surveillance usually went. It always took hours and hours of watching and waiting before you got those few minutes that made the effort worthwhile. Nonetheless, Aaron Kurtzman went over every last line Katz had sent. There was no way to tell when that one bit would pop out that would make all the difference. After he had carefully gone through the information, he forwarded it directly to Hal Brignola. Kurtzman had linked a back channel to the computer terminal in the Big Fed's office, and he too was going over the Budapest material as quickly as it came in. Most of it was what he had expected, useful in the long run, but not very enlightening for their immediate purposes. That was why he went down to the computer room, and was there when Katz called to let Kurtzman know that they were going after the IRA gunman who had kidnapped the French cop's family. When he had ended the transmission, Brugnola spoke up. Isn't that a little far from their original mission? Not really. As a tactic to bring Rostov's men out into the open, I think it fits well with the rest of what they've been doing. I have a contact in the French Justice Department. I could call and uh, let them take care of it themselves. That's true, but we don't know if Rostov has a man in the French government as well. The way Katz has planned it, the guys will come down on them out of thin air, and he'll have to know that it's us hitting him again. 
If he doesn't want his empire to start coming apart before it's up and running, he's going to have to break cover and come after us himself. Hmm. You got a point. I guess we'll just have to see how it comes out, won't we? From where I sit, that's always the hardest part of this game. And if you don't mind, how about disappearing again while I let Barbara know what's going to go down? Brignola grinned. I'm out of here. France. Nicole Cheval had been the wife of a police officer for almost 20 years, and she knew what to expect from her IRA terrorist captors. She was fully aware that her chances of getting out of this situation alive were very slim. She would miss her husband, Chief Inspector Maurice Cheval, and she knew that he would be lost without her. But she knew he could endure it. Before her husband had been promoted to the position of director of the regional prison, he had headed one of France's elite counter-terrorist units. Because of that, the specter of death had hung over both of them for many years, and each had prepared to meet it with dignity whenever it came. She had seen the looks that her kidnappers had given her, and she knew what she was going to have to endure before she died. Though she was no longer young, she knew that she was still a striking woman. While she could be calm enough about her own fate, she was concerned about her children. She and Maurice had had their children late in life, and the girls were still quite young, the oldest not yet twelve. There was no way that they could be anything other than completely terrified, and death would come hard for them. The thought of her two precious girls dying under any circumstances was unbearable. The thought of what they would go through here, in this remote old farmhouse, put her on the edge of madness. She knew, though, that the girl's best hope was for their mother to keep her wits about her and remain calm. Falling into panic, weeping and begging wasn't going to help her or the girls. If she appeared calm, however, and strong, it might help them. She would be stronger and more calm if she thought that there was any hope of their being rescued. The IRA gunman, however, had delighted in explaining to her in great detail how unlikely that was. Calvin James and T.J. Hawkins moved in on the remote farmhouse like shadows. The night was clear, but the moon hadn't risen, giving them the maximum protection of the cover of darkness. The thin light from the windows of the target building gave them more than enough light to see without their night vision goggles. A hundred yards away, on a supporting position on the hill overlooking the farmhouse, Gary Manning scanned the approaches and the grounds with the night scope of his silenced M21 sniper rifle. He usually preferred to use his Remington Model 700 for this kind of work, but in a situation like this, where he might have to engage multiple targets in a hurry, he needed the semi-auto capability of the military long gun. Supposedly, there were only three gunmen inside with the hostages, but he had to be prepared for more. The rifle's magazine was loaded with match-grade 7.62mm rounds, fitted with some of Cowboy Kissinger's special projectiles, so that one hit was all it would take for him to bring down his targets. In a hostage rescue situation, you had to put the bad guys down fast. When James and Hawkins reached their assault positions, they checked over their weapons. They both had silenced H&K MP5 SDs and flashbang grenades, standard kit for a hostage rescue. Hawkins' subgun was loaded with the 9mm Glazer rounds, which had been designed for first round stops without punching holes through the walls. These rounds were loaded with miniature shotgun-like projectiles encased in a plastic bullet. When they struck flesh, the plastic bullet opened up, releasing the multiple pellets like a shotgun's blast. But when they hit a hard surface, they didn't penetrate. On soft targets, such as humans, the glazers were deadly, but all a target had to do to be safe was to take cover behind something thin. That was why James's MP5 was loaded with standard 9mm hardpoints that would punch through doors and interior walls. The two of them would go in together, with Hawkins taking the primary shots and James backing him up in case someone ducked for cover. When they were ready, they click-coded back to Manning that they were in place, and he passed it on to Katz. The Phoenix Force warriors had to stay in position until they received a call from Katz that the van had been taken. If the van phase went bad, however, they would still go on their end and try to make their part of the plan work. Or, if the IRA gunmen made a move on the hostages, they would also go in and hope that they weren't too late. Chief Inspector Maurice Cheval's stomach was waging war with his body. Were it not for his wife and daughters, he would go out in a blaze of glory and try to take a few of the bastards with him. But as long as there was any chance at all that his family would be released unharmed, he couldn't risk it. Until he knew that Nicole and the children were dead, he had to do exactly as he had been told, in the vain hope that it would somehow keep them safe. The phone call that had started his nightmare had caught him completely off guard. 
He had worked counterterrorism assignments for a long time, but he had never thought that his family would ever become targets. When he got over his shock, he had followed his orders exactly. He had arranged for the nighttime transfer of the seven Marseille mobsters and was riding in the van himself. In the guise of secrecy, the van wasn't marked and he had only a driver with him. His second in command had thought that a bit strange, but had obeyed his orders and had sent one of his best men to drive. The route he had been told to take was off the main highway and ran through the countryside, a perfect route for an ambush. Several kilometers short of the arranged meeting point, Cheval was shocked to see a civilian car blocking the road and a man standing in the beams of the headlights. Trevor, please stop. I will be right back. I am Inspector Chaval of the National Police. You must move your car. Chief Inspector, I am Agent Johnson of the CIA. We need to talk. CIA? What do you know about this? We know that your wife and children are being held captive by IRA terrorists. And I know that you are transporting notorious criminals that they intend to set free. How do you know this? I did not contact the police. They said that they would kill my family. Don't worry, Inspector. Let's just say that I have contacts within the organization that set this up. Right now, I have men in place around the farmhouse where your family is being held. When I give them a call, they are ready to move in and free them. <clears throat> Can this be done without causing them harm? As you well know, Chief Inspector, nothing is certain in a situation like this. But my men are experts at hostage rescue. If your wife and children can be rescued, we can do it. How have you planned to deal with the van hijacking? You will go ahead as you were instructed. But we will be on hand at the meeting place to make sure that the situation does not get out of control. What do I tell my driver? Anything you like, but keep him out of the line of fire. And I want you to keep down too. It will be no good to your family if you get killed. Just let us take care of this. All right. And tell your driver not to go too fast. I'm going to be holding on to the rungs on the back of the van, and I have only one good hand. At the appointed transfer site, the rest of the Stony Man team lay waiting in ambush. They had been in place for several hours, figuring that the IRA couldn't arrive until the last moment. Not knowing exactly where the IRA would put their roadblock, they had spread out on both sides of the road around the milestone marker Cheval was supposed to stop at. Thanks to Rostov's careful, down-to-the-last-detail planning, Katz and Kurtzman had been able to ferret out enough information that nothing was left to chance this night. Half an hour before the appointed time for the prisoner transfer, they saw the first of the IRA gunmen move into position to set up the roadblock. They too had a van to transport the men they planned to free, as well as a sedan to take the gunmen away. Their plan was very simple. Stop the van, kill the driver, and more than likely the inspector, release the mobsters in the back, and simply drive away. On their way out, they would radio their comrades to execute the hostages, and all the witnesses to their crime would be gone. Stony Man, however, was there to make sure that didn't happen. The police van is approaching. Repeat, we are here. Lyons had retrieved his Colt Python and had it loaded with silver tip rounds. His Spass 12's magazine was full of Cowboy Kissinger's home brew, frangible magnum buckshot rounds for maximum killing power. Whatever he fired on was going down and staying down. He and Bolin were to take the IRA from a frontal position, while Enciso and McCarter were on each side of the road to take care of anyone who tried to break and run. With Katz arriving on the back of the police van, they had the gunmen surrounded. The van finally pulled into sight, and when it came to a stop, the IRA gunmen closed in on it. As per Katz's instructions, neither the driver nor Cheval offered resistance. When one of the gunmen approached the driver's door, his AK ready to fire, Lyons drew down on him to take the shot that would signal the ambush. The surviving IRA reacted quickly, racing for the back of the van. No, <laughs> Surprise! Bolin's Beretta 93R stuck with carefully aimed three-round bursts in between the roar of Lions' big colt. Caught as they were in the open, the IRA gunman went down fast. Kiss my arse, American shite! One's getting away! I'm on it! Fucking hell! With Enciso's last shots, silence returned to the French countryside. Cheval picked himself up from the pavement and looked around. In the light from the headlights, the only men he saw still on their feet were the American commandos. The six bodies on the ground were also wearing dark clothing, but didn't have assault harnesses or night vision goggles. Your prisoners are intact. One of them was wounded, but it's not serious. What about my family? Can you freeze them now? Yes. 
Now that this has been settled satisfactorily, I don't have to worry about the two groups alerting each other. And we can go now. Katz took out his radio and keyed the mic. Manning, we're clear here. You can go ahead. Roger. We're moving in now. We're on it. It shouldn't be long. Cheval wasn't a religious man. He had been a cop far too long to have much faith left. But he offered up a heartfelt prayer for his wife and children, as well as for the Americans who were going to try to rescue them. He fervently hoped that God was listening. When Gary Manning got the call from Katz and Ellenbogen that the van had been secured, he passed the message to Calvin James and T.J. Hawkins. We're a go, and I've got one of them in my sights right now. Take him out. That will be our cue to enter. Can do. On his hilltop, Manning refocused his scope and put the IRA gunman standing in the open in the crosshairs. He had to shoot through a window, but he was confident that the round would hit within an inch of his target. Taking up the slack on the trigger, he took a deep breath and let it out slowly. When the last of the air left his lungs and he reached that rock-solid hold, he fired. Nicole Cheval grabbed her daughters and threw them to the floor, covering them with her body. She didn't know how it had happened, but she knew that someone was attempting to rescue them. Taking the shattering glass as their signal, James and Hawkins booted the door and were inside. The two remaining gunmen were going for their weapons, and one of them turned to race for the door to what had to be the back room where the hostages were held. Got him! Shit! I'm okay. I'll check the kills. You look for the hostages. On it! Hawkins moved to the back room. Carefully opening the door, he shone a light and saw the woman covering her children. He didn't see any blood and figured that they were just doing the smart thing, taking cover. Uh, Madame Cheval, I don't speak French, but you're safe now. If you'll come with us, Madame, we'll take you to your husband. Nicole didn't speak much English, but the calm words and manner of the commando told her that everything was fine now. Getting up, she pointed to her wedding ring. Mon mari, est-ce il vivant? Hawkins caught her gesture and smiled. Uh, très bien. He's okay. Mon mari, est-il vivant? While Hawkins awkwardly comforted the woman, James led the two girls outside. He kept their heads turned away so they wouldn't have to see the carnage in the house. Inspector Cheval, your wife and daughters have been freed. Were they hurt? My men say that they appear to be all okay. Now that Nicole and the children were safe, Cheval could afford to ask the questions that had been forming ever since Katz and Ellenbogen had stopped the van. You people are not really CIA, are you? No. And it's a damned good thing for you that we're not, too. If we did work for the company, this operation would not have worked the way it did. We only had a small window. We had to move very quickly. Even on a good day, the CIA can't move like we can. Hmm. This means that tomorrow morning you will have vanished and there will be no official report about this incident. Is that not correct? As far as that goes, we'll be out of here tonight and you'll never hear from us again. Good. Cheval reached down and picked up one of the fallen IRA AK assault rifles. Walking around to the back of the van, he opened the doors and faced the seven Marseille mobsters inside. They saw what was coming but were powerless to stop it. <laughs> Inspector Cheval grimly turned back to Katz and handed him the AK. What you have witnessed is what all too often happens in these gang wars. My van was stopped by men from a rival gang who had a grudge against these pigs from the Marseille mob. My driver and I were surprised and rendered unconscious, and when we woke, we found that they had somehow killed one another. It is unfortunate, but this kind of violence is all too often a sad fact of life in the criminal underground. I trust you can make this weapon, and my fingerprints on it, disappear? Oh, I think we can handle that. Cheval straightened. Now, monsieur, if you please, hit me on the back of the head with your gun butt. Are you sure you want me to do that? I am. For my story to be believed, there must be blood and an injury. And your driver? <clears throat> Him too, but not so hard. As you wish. Oh, and one more thing first. If there is anything I can ever do for you and your men, anything at all, do not hesitate to ask. 
Even if you want my life, you will have it. You have saved my family, and nothing is too great to ask for that. We were glad to do it. Thank you again with all my heart. Now, hit me. My pleasure. Sweet dreams. <coughs> Katz carefully caught the unconscious investigator and eased him to the ground. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Akira Takaido looked up from his computer screen. Well, they scored again. It went down like clockwork, and so did the bad guys. Eleven of the bastards. Aaron Kurtzman didn't smile as he mentally added that body count to the results of the European operation so far. The Stony Man team was extracting vengeance for Schwartz and Blancanales big time, but the operation still wasn't producing the kind of response he had hoped for. The Russians, who had set up Able Team, were still fighting by proxy rather than getting involved themselves. For this to turn out right, the Russians had to be sucked in so they could be cut up, and he had no idea how they could do that. Hal Brignola was sitting beside him, scrolling through Katzenallenbogen's after-action report. Kurtzman's in-house surveillance system was getting a real workout now that Brignola had covertly joined the rebellion. He still had to be kept out of Price's sight. The screen showed that she was tied up with chores right now, so the big fed could sit in on this one for a while at least and lend his thoughts. I think we need to try to do something a little different next time, Hal. I agree. They're extracting vengeance big time over there, but they're just hacking off limbs, not the head. Do you have a plan for bringing Rostov out into the open? I want to bait him even more. Plus, I want to try to nail down that leak in Valensikov's office. How do you think you can work that? Well... Even though you're now one of the revolutionaries, I want you to use your office as the SOG leader and send a report directly to Valensikov over your signature block. An operational update, as it were. First, I want you to apologize for having been out of touch for so long. You know all the political crap to smooth ruffled feathers. Then you'll give them a rundown of everything that's happened and make sure that you give Phoenix Force and the others full credit for the Dresden, Munich, and Budapest hits, as well as this latest escapade. If we're right about the leak, that'll piss off Rostov, but how's that gonna flush him out? Well, finally you'll tell the minister that Phoenix is gonna take a short break from their efforts, a little R&R &R, as it were, after this latest operation. You'll give him the location where they'll be staying, and you'll say that they're going to be there for at least a week. You want to set them up for a hit? Sure. They're big boys, and they can take care of themselves. But I still don't see how it's going to flush out Rostov. Well, that's because you aren't devious enough. You have to remember, the guy's slick, but he's also pathological. He's going to jump at the chance to get back at the men who've been causing him so much trouble. And when it turns into a trap, he's going to be really pissed, and that's the way we want him. Look at it this way. A man like Rostov thinks that he's a hell of a lot smarter than everyone else in the world. That's why he thinks he can become the overlord of Europe's criminal underground. He's the man who would be king. And with an ego like that, he hates to be thwarted. If he bites on this one and it turns out to be a trap, he's going to want revenge. And to get it, there's a good chance that he'll expose himself. You may be right, but I still don't know. It was an ambush that got me in trouble in the first place. At least let me run this past Katz, and let's see what he and Stryker think about it. If they turn me down, we'll just keep on doing what we've been doing. I'll go along with that. But I'd rather get back to counting paper clips before Barbara catches me down here with you. <laughs> She'll be over soon, and then maybe we can get back to what passes for normal around here. I sure as hell hope so. I'm starting to talk to myself. Just as long as you don't start answering. Boris Dedloff was tired of bringing his boss bad news, and he was very much aware that Rostov was equally tired of receiving it. Since the ambush in Prague, there had been too many setbacks, both large and small, to suit either one of them. Regardless of what Rostov thought about the Americans, Dedloff saw their hand in all of this. Someone was running an operation against them, and it had to be the mysterious Phoenix Force. You do not think that this was a leak from within the Marseille mob? I doubt it. Our associate at Interpol informed me that they do not have an informer in the Marseille gang at this point in time. Their last one slipped up and ended up in an alley shot in the back of the head. That has always been a difficult group for them to infiltrate. Speaking of our Marseille associates, 
I will have to get in contact with them quickly and try to see if I can salvage our agreement. I was counting on their input to our enterprises, and if I cannot draw them back in, we will have a war on our hands. When we find the Yankees, we can offer to let them in on the killing. That might make them feel better. That is something I will suggest. Aaron Kurtzman's plan to use Phoenix Force as bait for a trap went down well with the team. After freeing Cheval's family, they had gone up into Germany to await the next move in this international chess game. I like it. We get to sit tight and let the bastards come to us for a change. What do you think, Katz? The Israeli swept his eyes over the Stony Man farm facts again. Tactically, I think it's very workable. How it's going to shake out will be very much up to us, of course. David? I'm in. Manning? If we pick the right location, limit the avenues of approach and all that, I'm for it. Plus, I'll need a good place for a sniper's nest as a backup. Trusting Katz's instincts, Raphael and Cizo simply nodded, and T.J. Hawkins smiled. Hell, it sounds like a fun way to spend a few days. All right, then it's agreed. I'll call the farm. Later that night, after everyone had turned in, Hal Brignola went back to the computer room for another planning session with Aaron Kurtzman. When he learned that Katz had signed off on the ambush proposal, he started having second thoughts. Now that he was back with the program, at least from Kurtzman's perspective, he was being cautious. The last thing he wanted was to make any more mistakes that got someone killed. This had better work. If Rostov has a mole in Valensikov's office, like we know he has, I know it will. He won't be able to let a chance like this pass him by. Now that he knows Phoenix is the source of his problems, he'll want to take care of them ASAP. The loss of the Marseille people has to have caused him a problem. He was counting on them, and he won't want anything like that to happen again. I just don't like putting our guys in the crosshairs without knowing how he'll try to attack them. I know. But remember, Rostov is military, and more than likely he'll opt for a military solution like he's done in the past. His Berlin operation was typically military, specifically a commando operation. Show up with overwhelming firepower, hit the objective, do your job, and get the hell out. I would expect him to do the same thing this time. Sitting in a static position playing target isn't Phoenix's style. But they won't exactly be sitting targets. Think of it more like they're in a carefully prepared defensive position. Instead of being ambushed, they'll be the ones doing the ambushing. Remember, you can't be surprised if you know the other guy's coming to get you. Are you going to be able to give them advance notice of when it's going down? Well, that's the only sticky part. I'm getting some satellite communication interceptions from the Moscow region, but most of the stuff that I think's coming from Rostov is encrypted. I've got Hunt and Akira working on that, and I'm confident we'll break it soon. Well, let me know. I'd better make myself scarce again before I get caught. What does Barbara think I'm doing with my time, anyway? She thinks that I'm keeping you busy with an elaborate misinformation routine, and I'll let her keep on thinking that. What misinformation? She wants me to tell you that uh, Phoenix is doing things that they aren't, just in case you decide to bend the president's ear. <sighs> I'll be glad when this is over. When Boris Detloff walked into his boss's office, he wore a smile for a change. Once more, their agent in the minister's office had come through. However, some of the information she had passed on to him wasn't positive. For one thing, she had been able to confirm his fears that the Americans were still operating against them, and that they had been responsible for the latest setback with the Marseille mob. Rostov's plans for Western Europe hinged on keeping his alliance with the powerful French gang. They were one of the largest criminal enterprises in the region, and had a small army of their own. He had no doubts that the forces he had at his command would be able to completely destroy them should that become necessary, but the less combat there was, the smoother the process would go. Since the mission to free several of their leaders had resulted in their deaths instead, Rostov had reopened negotiations with the mob. But they weren't going well, and having someone to blame the murders on was very good news. It might be enough to prevent an open war, which had to be avoided at all costs. The other European gang leaders wouldn't like it if the Russians slaughtered the French players and took over their operations by force, it would be difficult to explain it away, and they would all think that they, too, would be strong-armed at some point in time. For this operation to work the way it had been planned, there had to be honor among thieves, for a while at least. We've heard from our associate in the minister's office again. What did she have to say? 
The minister received a lengthy communication from the United States that confirms my suspicions that the Americans are still in the game. In fact, they never left. They just went even more covert. I should have listened to you more closely, old friend. It looks like you were right all along. What exactly did the message say? There was an apology for having been out of communication for so long, blaming it on unspecified political problems in the White House. But after confirming that Phoenix Force was responsible for all our recent losses, including the Marseille men, the message went on to say that the commandos would be taking a few days off to rest and refit. Apparently, a couple of them got nicked in the French shootout. Rostov's ears perked at hearing that. Hitting a unit when they were refitting was one of his favorite moves. Did it say where they were going to stay? As a matter of fact, it did. The team will be staying in Frankfurt, Germany, at a small hotel. They will be registered under their cover of being a TV news crew for the BBC. We need to recon that site. I am already doing that. I ran a computer check and came up with a map of that area of Frankfurt and located a floor plan for the hotel. A team from the Hamburg office is on its way there now to do a full on-site recon. They are going to register there and phone in what they find. Good. As soon as they call in, put together a strike force. I do not want the Yankees to get away this time. And no blank rounds either. When it is done, I want photographs of their heads so I can make sure that we have gotten all of them. Who do you want me to use for the job? Since this job is in Germany, why not see if the Irish want revenge for what happened in France? I am certain that if you tell them that they will be going after the man who killed their comrades, they will insist that you give the job to them. Knowing how the IRA felt about revenge, Detloff could only agree. Plus, even though they had failed in France, they were still the best field operatives they had. Now that Katz and Brignola had set the gears in motion for the ambush operation, Aaron Kurtzman still had one important thing left to do. He had to inform Barbara Price what was going down. After all, Palace Revolt or not, she was still the Stony Man mission controller, and she had to know what was happening at all times. Asking the others to take a long coffee break somewhere else, he called her office and told her their plan. You and Katz are going to do what? What's wrong with you two? We staged a revolt around here, a mutiny against the United States government because of a setup just like that. If I didn't know any better, Aaron, I'd say that Hal Brognola had his hands in this. This is something he'd push for. This was my idea, Barb, and I ran it past Katz and the team for their approval. As you say, we're freelance now, and nothing's going down that the guys don't get to vote on, or whatever they're doing to make their decisions now. You and Katz have lost your minds. Or is this one of the Iron Man's vengeance deals? Does he just want to kill everybody involved in this whole affair? Barbara, it's not quite as bad as you're making it out to be. How bad is it, then? Kurtzman knew that this was the time for him to exhibit patience by the bucketful. Lyons wasn't the only one who was still working through the deaths of Schwartz and Blancanales. But Price was dealing with it entirely differently. It had made her even more protective of her men. We haven't really got any closer to Rostov than we were before we first went over there. In fact, all we've learned from our operations is his name. We still don't know where he's operating out of, nor do we know anything about his command structure. In all of our operations against him, all we've really done has been to fight his foot soldiers. We haven't really inflicted any damage on him or the core of his operation. To put Rostov out of action permanently, and to extract the price for his having killed Schwartz and Blanc and Alice, we have to get to him directly, and this is a way to try to do that. Price knew that, like it or not, there was truth in his words. Dangling the bait was an important part of catching the fish. She could see that she had no choice but to sign on. <sighs> you say that they're going to hole up in Frankfurt? Yep. Katz found a small hotel with limited access routes, but an inviting alley to suck them into. They're going to put the kill zone there. Okay. Just keep me informed and make sure that we're able to respond to anything they need to back their play. At least if this goes down as you two think it will, we'll have even more proof that the Russians can't keep their mouths shut. There is that. And maybe we could use this second event to convince the president to call this thing off completely and bring them home. Now you're jerking my chain, Aaron. You know that the guys aren't going to come back until they've taken care of this. 
I wish the damned Russian Mafia had taken over the government completely, and we'd never been involved in the first place. I do think that's what the President was trying to prevent, Barbara. When she left the room, he quickly sent a message to Brignola, who had been listening in through his back door, and told him that the operation was on, and for him to make sure to keep out of her way until it was over. Carl Lyons was tired of sitting on his hands and waiting for Rostov's next move. He agreed that playing sitting ducks was probably a good move, but he had never liked waiting, and he particularly didn't like it now. At least when he'd been waiting in Budapest, he had been able to take out known gangsters. We're being eyeballed, cats. Every time I've gone out, I've spotted the same two punks hanging around. They have a room on the floor below, and they've been keeping close tabs on us. I'm not surprised. I would expect Rostov to have moved in a couple of his people to keep tabs on us while he sets up the hit. I wouldn't worry about them too much. We'll take them out before we leave. Why wait? We can't afford to act against them now. It would alert Rostov to the fact that we're not quite as stupid as we appear to be. You're just going to have to be patient with those two as well. All right. But I want them when this goes down. They're as much a part of this as the rest of the bastards. No problem. They're yours. On the fourth night after Phoenix Force arrived in Frankfurt, a medium-sized Mercedes delivery van marked with a bakery logo pulled up to the curb by the opening of the alley behind the Regency Hotel. The driver got out of the cab and, after looking around, walked to the rear door of the truck and opened it. Six men quickly got out and moved into the dark alley like the experienced commando team that they were. All of the gunmen were ex-provisional IRA members, and they had undertaken dozens of missions like this before. Even the fact that they were going up against well-armed targets wasn't a new experience for them. The extensive training they had received at a PLO-run camp in the Libyan desert had been as good as any in the world. In the past, they had put that training to good use against both British Army troops and armed units of the Ulster Defense Force and the Royal Ulster Constabulary. As freedom fighters went, the IRA was among the best in the world, but the provisional IRA had fallen on hard times and had been forced to hire out to the Russian Mafia to raise funds for their continuing struggle against British imperialism. Even though peace had been brokered in Ireland, the fight, for some, would continue. This mission, however, they were doing for free. When they had learned that they were being asked to take out the Yankees who had killed their comrades in France, the question of taking payment from Rostov was quickly put aside. The IRA had a long tradition of avenging their comrades' deaths as a point of honor. These Yankees would die blood for blood. The Irishmen were also well armed and equipped for this assignment. One of the advantages of working for Rostov was that the Russian believed in providing adequate firepower for his operatives. Each of the gunmen carried a 5.45mm AK-74 assault rifle and a 9mm Makarov semi-auto pistol as his basic weapons, as well as thermite grenades. There was no need to make these kills clean. For personal equipment, they had been given individual radios and night vision goggles to go with their assault harnesses and black combat suits, balaclavas and rubber-soled boots. They were close to invisible and silent as they moved to their objective. The Stony Man warriors were more than ready to greet their nocturnal visitors. The Irish terrorists hadn't arrived unannounced. Even though Phoenix had lost the services of Schwartz and his masterful electronic wizardry, they were not without adequate early warning devices. The alley was wired, and the raiders had been spotted the moment they stepped out of their vehicle into the street. Preparations had also been made to ensure that the Irish assassins wouldn't get beyond the ambush kill zone in the middle of the alley. Boland didn't intend to give these men a chance to surrender and be taken into custody. This would be a killing, pure and simple, and its primary purpose was to rid Europe of six dedicated Provo terrorists who had walked the earth for far too long. And if taking out this team enraged Rostov, forced him to show his hand, so much the better. From his rooftop position on the other side of the street, Manning reported in. The last man has entered the alley. Copy. Take them down. Manning centered the crosshairs of his eight-power sniper scope on the drag, the last man in the formation. At that close range, the scope had been mounted on his silenced H&K MP5SD instead of the sniper's rifle he had been using lately. Squeezing the trigger would send a burst of subsonic hollow-point slugs downrange. He breathed out, counting to five. Almost as one, the other five gunmen whirled to face the threat, but it was too late for them to do anything except die. 
Even with their night vision gear, they had failed to see the M18 Claymore mines fixed to the walls at knee height and angled slightly upward. The four directional anti-personnel mines were connected with matte black detonation cord, so they would all detonate within a microsecond of one another. Boland squeezed the handle of the clacker firing device and the four claymores went off as one. When the smoke cleared, the six terrorists were lying sprawled in the alley. Each of them had soaked up enough claymore pellets to have killed them several times over. Nonetheless, from his rooftop position, Manning used his scope to put an insurance shot into the head of each of the IRA gunmen. Neither Boland nor Manning bothered to go into the alley to check their handiwork. No one could have survived the Claymores, and there was no reason to search the bodies. These men had been experienced terrorists, and they wouldn't be carrying anything of interest. They would have sterilized themselves for the mission, and they would go that way to the morgue. We're clearing out now, and heading for the pickup point. Copy. We're on the way. On the way out of the room, Carl Lyons broke off to take care of one last little bit of business they had left undone. He had not forgotten the two thugs who had tailed him on his walks through the neighborhood. They were Rostov's minions as well, and would be added to the body count tonight. On the next floor down, he listened for a moment to the excited voices behind the door of room 37. Did you hear that? Yeah, I think we got to take the Yanks out ourselves. Load up for revenge! And then a crike! Satisfied that he had the right place, he made his move. Leaving their bodies behind, Lyons hurried down the stairs to the waiting van. Barbara Price was waiting in the computer room when Katzen Ellenbogen came on the line to make his report. It took but a moment to run it through the decryption program to put it in plain text. <sighs> Bear, you and Katz were lucky this time. But I don't want to see any more harebrained plans like that being cooked up without checking with me first. Yes, ma'am. Where are they going next? Katz wants to try Berlin again. I would have thought that they had used up their welcome there with the flak tower job. He thinks it'll be okay, and plans to stay in the old eastern sector this time. Speaking of this time, you better keep me informed this time. Will do. Russia. Come in. Colonel, we have a problem. Rostov looked up from his paperwork. Detloff didn't call him by his rank unless it was something he couldn't handle on his own. The Americans set us up. What do you mean? The IRA team we sent to Frankfurt was wiped out without firing a shot. <sighs> what happened? Apparently, the Americans knew they were coming and were lying in wait for them. They were in the alley behind the hotel when they were killed, with claymores. Marina may have turned against us. Mm, you may be right about that. Send Sasha and Vanya to bring her in for questioning. Marina Valinsikov, now the young wife of the minister, had been an attractive, underpaid government secretary, moonlighting as a talented prostitute, when Rostov discovered her. Taken by her intelligence, poise, and beauty, he decided to make her an offer she couldn't refuse. He introduced her to the minister and ordered her to get close to him. He had never thought that the minister would take her seriously enough to marry her, but when he did, it was even better. Like many older men who had been able to nab a young trophy wife, Valinsikov lived with a secret fear that she would someday leave him for a younger, more vigorous bed partner. He knew that he couldn't compete with younger men in the sexual arena, but few men in the new Russia, young or old, could match his personal power. Almost without knowing that he was doing it, he started talking shop with his young wife to impress her, and she became an avid listener of his stories. She claimed to be fascinated with the petty details of Moscow power brokering and always asked questions about his most recent coups and plots. Sometimes, when he was in the middle of a long, detailed explanation of something, she would excuse herself to go to the bathroom, where she would jot down a few notes before returning to hear the rest of the story. His proud story of how he had been able to enlist the assistance of a covert American action team in his war against the Mafia was particularly interesting to her. Whether Marina had betrayed them or not, Detloff didn't want to see Marina fall to Sasha and Vanya. For one, she was a nice woman, but mostly she would be difficult to replace. And after the Sakharov twins were done with her, she would be of no use to anyone anymore. 
This doesn't mean that Marina has betrayed us. The Americans might have fed the minister erroneous information. If that is the case, it means that they know of her connection to me, and that is even more dangerous. I disagree. I think it has become obvious to them by now that there's been a leak somewhere in the minister's office. Even the Americans are smart enough to figure that one out. And Marina did report that her husband mentioned something about his needing to tighten security. I think we should leave her in place and just be more careful with what she reports in the future. If they're feeding us false information to lead us into ambushes, we may be able to turn this against them. We can send a small unit into the next ambush, but have a larger group standing by to ambush the ambushers. You remember, Boris, how we used to do that with the Mujis, sending government troops into the trap and then sending in a Hellebone strike team to encircle the Dushman while they were busy killing the Kabul troops. It worked every time back then, and it will work this time. That would work. But who do we use for the goats? Locals only, and use only our own operatives to spring the trap. Anyway, leave the report and let the rest of the IRA know of their loss. As you wish. When Detloff got back to his computer room, he rang up Marina Valensikov and informed her what had happened. He also warned her what would happen to her if she wasn't very careful in the future. Though Rostov had discovered her, and she was now married to the minister, he had a very personal interest in her well-being that not even Rostov was aware of. Gregor Rostov was a megalomaniac, but that didn't mean that he had lost the skills as a tactician that had made him one of the old Red Army's best. He knew that he had been suckered. He had to admit that the man in charge of those Yankees was good. Even worse was the fact that the timing for this couldn't have been more troublesome. General Belislav had finally gotten his hands on the medium-range S-22 missiles that were the keystone of his grand plan for a new Russia. When he launched his coup, the missiles would ensure that none of the other military commanders tried to deal themselves a hand in the game. The general had also managed to acquire the warheads for the missiles, and he would use them if he had to. He wouldn't allow anything or anyone to stop him from achieving his destiny as he saw it. The problem was that since the Yankees had figured out that there was a spy in Valensikov's office, they would continue to feed Marina erroneous information, which was dangerous both to him and the general. After thinking it over, he decided not to inform Belislav of this latest incident. The general had enough to think about. Time to reload. Stony Man is continued on the next CD. <laughs> What's going on? What's wrong with him? Mm. Oh, he's foaming at the mouth. Is he sick or something? Well, they yeah, went to the truck stop and his new Outlander still is in there. Yeah. How? That's on the website. Outlanders is available on the website. Doesn't he know that? He's on the website? He's not. Outlanders is. What are you eating? Well, you gotta get back to work, alright? So just tell him that Outlanders is now on the website. And, uh, in fact, I think it's even cheaper. It is? No, I lied. It's actually more expensive now. Really? No, it's cheaper. You can easily get it. They're easily accessible. They're also a spin-off of Deathlands. What is? Outlanders. What about it? I, I think pretty much it's discontinued. Whoa! Yeah, it's a shame. I might want to throw your buddy a bone. He's not moving. Why'd you say that? He's not moving! Holy shit! Hey, hey, hey. No need to lose control, boys. Outlanders is still published every month. And, like the surrogate spokesperson was trying to say, if you can't find that hot graphic audio title you're looking for, just head to www.cuttingaudio.com, where you can order it in CD, cassette, or MP3 disc format. Or, the fastest and cheapest way, download that puppy and play it on any of the many devices that'll play Windows Media. And if you're on the road or just a total computer feeb, snatch up the phone and call 1-800-670-5220 and we'll get that Smoking Outlanders episode in your meaty paws before you have to call 911.
As soon as the farm shut down for the night, Hal Brignola went down to the computer room to check in with Aaron Kurtzman. He had followed the Frankfurt reports from Katz and Ellenbogen through his back door, but it was time to start planning to exploit the team's success. He rummaged around in his jacket pockets, fished out two antacid tabs, and downed them before pouring himself a cup of coffee. Uh, that went rather well, I thought. Didn't it? Yep. Now at least we know for certain that there's a leak in Valensikov's office. Since the Frankfurt information didn't go through the Oval Office before it was sent to Moscow, we have proof positive of the leak. Now, all we have to do is convince the Minister of the facts. Even with what we have, that still may be difficult. He just doesn't seem to want to face the facts. That sure seems to be the case. Which is why I've decided to go to Moscow myself to talk to the Minister face to face about this. Hearing it from a representative of the President might make a difference. He saw the shock on Kurtzman's face, but his mind was made up. I think that this situation qualifies as an emergency. We need to bring closure to this. I'll clear it with the White House and be out of here before Barbara even knows that I'm gone. She's gonna be pissed. Oh, please, that's nothing new. Since you'll have to deal with her instead of me, I'll take that chance. Oh, thanks a lot, buddy. Hey, what are friends for? I'll need you to work up a briefing packet for me. Copies of messages going both ways. The team's after-action reports and all that, starting with Prague. And while you're doing that, I'm going to line up a plane at Andrews and talk to the Oval Office. If you can get me the briefing paper soon enough, I'll be out of here at first light tomorrow. Hal, I, I can do this, but aren't you worried that Rostov's spy will pick up on your visit? I know, but I think that I need to try it anyway. If I can convince Volinsikov of the leak, we can set a trap to deal with Rostov when he surfaces. It'll cut our risk factors down to something we should be able to manage. That was still the program, and Kurtzman couldn't argue with it. Good luck. I'm gonna need it. When Gregor Rostov got word from Marina Valensikov of Hal Brignola's pending visit to Moscow, he was glad that he had listened to Boris Detloff and hadn't turned the Sakharov brothers loose on her. Now that he knew the Yankees were feeding him false information, he would simply be more careful before responding to it. But a visit from the mysterious leader of Phoenix Force couldn't be a trap. It was, however, an opportunity that he would have to take advantage of, and he would also inform General Belislav of this development. As a general rule, Belislav was completely paranoid about anything that had to do with Americans. He had lived the life of a committed Cold War warrior for almost 50 years, and the experience had left him little choice but to think that way. So when he heard about Brugnola's secret visit, he ordered Rostov to bring his two captives to his dacha for further interrogation. The general's plans for his coup were almost complete. There were still, however, a few major military units that were holding out, units that he would like to have on his side. The Americans getting even more involved at this critical juncture could prove dangerous for him. He had to learn the reason for Brugnola's visit, and he figured that Blancanales and Schwartz would know what it was. Barbara Price wore a frown when she walked into the computer room early the next morning and confronted Aaron Kurtzman. Where's Hal? I heard the chopper take off. Kurtzman turned in his wheelchair to face her. He mentally cursed Hal for leaving him with the hard part of this gig, dealing with Price. He's on the bird and he's heading to Andrews to catch a flight to Moscow. Moscow? He didn't say anything to me about going to Russia. When was that arranged? He talked to me about it and I agreed that he should go. I didn't expect this from you, Aaron. I thought that we had agreed to cut him out of this operation until it's concluded. We did, and it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. But since then, he and I have had a chance to talk, and we came to a couple of conclusions. Such as? Such as, he says he's going to tender his resignation as the director of SOG as soon as this mission is over. Whatever over is going to look like this time around. And since this is going to be his last time out... That's crap, Aaron. Hal's been in this game too long. He doesn't know how to do anything else. That's very true. But he still remembers that he has a family, and he says that he wants to spend some time with them before they completely forget that he exists. He thinks that it's time for him to move on and leave this to someone else. Then why is he going to Russia? What does he think he can do in person there that we can't handle from here? 
He says that he wants to see if he can do something to bring this to a conclusion without any more of our guys getting bushwhacked. He figures that if he can plug the leak in Volinsikov's office, Rostov will have to come out of the bushes himself, and we'll be able to whack him instead. Does the president know that he's making this little visit? Yes, but that's about all he knows. Hal gave him some typical political double talk about needing closer liaison with the Russians on the mission and conferencing with their officials. The man apparently bought it, and he sanctioned the trip. But then why didn't he come Hal's to me? Hal's on our side in this now, Barbara. He really is. And since this is going to be his last mission, he wants to try to make up for the screw-up in Prague. He really does blame himself for what happened. I see your fine hand in this, Aaron Kurtzman. This is one of your famous backdoor operations, isn't it? No. He came to me with this idea all on his own. Is he going to have any cover or backup while he's over there? No. He's going in open. But he should be okay since he'll be picked up at the airport and he won't be leaving the ministry. Wonderful. He's over there, and I'm stuck here waiting for him to come back so I can get permission to go to the little girl's room. That's not exactly the case, Barbara. Hal signed all of this over to you as his successor while he's gone. He even filed a copy of it with the Oval Office, so you can operate in his name while he's gone. You're the interim leader of SOG and liaison to the Oval Office. That gave Price pause. For Brignola to have done that on his own authority meant that he really was going to hang it up. She also knew that it meant that he wasn't too certain that he was going to come home. Signing the farm over to her would make a transition easier in case anything happened and he didn't make it back. I think we may have misjudged him, Barbara. Damn it, Aaron. Don't you go soft-headed on me now. I don't want to have to put you out to pasture, too. You can put me out to pasture whenever you like. But until such time as you do, I still have a job to do here. If Hal can find the leak in Moscow, we can wrap this thing up and call our people home. To do what? We're finished here as soon as the president realizes what's happened. I'll worry about that when it happens. Right now, however, since we're still running a mission, I'd like to respectfully suggest that you get back to controlling the damn thing. Okay, Aaron. You win this one. But if this doesn't work out, I'm going to kick your butt all the way to the retirement home. And here I thought that we were going to go to a chicken farm in Arkansas. Oh, get back to work and get me a briefing paper on Hal's mission to Moscow ASAP. If I'm running this place now, I need to know what the hell is going on around here. Yes, ma'am. Going back to her office, Price got on the SATCOM link to talk to Katzenellenbogen in Berlin. Since Brignola had gone in without backup, if anything went down, Katz would need to be prepared to send in Phoenix to bail him out. She was still angry at him for doing this behind her back, but as long as she was running the show, she wasn't going to let the big feds swing in the wind. Not as long as Stony Man had muscle on the ground in Europe. Schwartz and Blancanales were passing the time in their cell. All right, I'll start easy. Tom Cruise. All right. Days of Thunder. Good movie, good movie. Randy Quaid was especially good, though. Randy Quaid? Uh, National Lampoon's Vacation. Which one? What do you mean, which one? Well, if you choose the first, I could do Aunt Edna and you'll lose. Well, then I'll do the other one. What other one? I don't know. Uh, Christmas. Chevy Chase. Chevy Ch I needed to know which movie. We wouldn't be playing the movie game if you didn't tell me which movie. Fine. Three Amigos. Three Amigos. So many choices. No, there are only three. No, I think Joe Mantegna was in it. He was in that? Yeah, he played Harvey Flugelman. Really? What did he do? We're not playing the what did he do game here. Joe Mantegna, your turn. Okay, um, God... Al Pacino... I didn't say it yet. No, I'm doing Xanadu. Psh, easy. Sean Connery. Nope. What? You lose. But... What are you talking about? He was the main character. He played Zed. Nope. You're thinking Zardoz. Oh, shit. Shit, shit, shit. Fucking Zs. Hey, you hear that? Since it wasn't mealtime, they both tensed for whatever was coming their way. The man they had come to know as Rostov's second-in-command opened the door. Even though the two Able Team Commandos hadn't offered any resistance since being captured, two hard-eyed guards holding assault rifles always flanked Detlov. I have brought you new clothes. Get dressed. 
You're going on a trip. Where are you taking us? That is not important for you to know. The clothing they were given wasn't the expensive European threads they had been wearing when they were ambushed in Prague. Apparently, the clothing had been ruined by the dye and the blank rounds that had hit them. This clothing was the cheaply made, shapeless stuff usually associated with Soviet government officials. As Schwartz stepped into the two short trousers he had been given, he had an idea. He held up the chunky shoes to the Russian who had handed them to him. These things don't fit well. Do you still have the shoes I was wearing when I came in here? The American cowboy boots? Detloff nodded to one of the guards who left the cell. When he came back, he was carrying a pair of tan cowboy boots. Blancanellis was careful not to look at his partner when Schwartz slipped into his old Dan Post boots. Finding that they hadn't been spirited away and sold on the black market was more than a stroke of luck in their favor for a change. It might be their salvation. Apparently, Rostov's men hadn't discovered the emergency signaling device in the boots, or they wouldn't have brought them. Now all they needed was one of Kurtzman's borrowed NRO satellites in the vicinity, and they could send a message that they were still alive. It should at least get the farm to think about them again. How do I look? You look like a Bulgarian skating team coach who's been touring in Texas. That good? Wow! As soon as the two men were dressed, the guards put blindfolds over their eyes and led them through what seemed like endless corridors until they reached the open air. Then they were hustled into the back of a van and their hands were cuffed behind them with plastic restraints. Schwartz listened but didn't hear it being locked. He hid a smile. This might turn out even better than he thought. With the blindfold securely in place over his eyes, Schwartz was relying on his other senses to tell him where they were being driven. He realized that his plan, if something thrown together with almost zero chances of succeeding could be called a plan, was pure desperation. He had to wait until the right time, though, before he tried. Jumping out of a speeding vehicle wasn't going to make it any easier for him. He couldn't get very far on a sprained ankle or a broken leg. After what he figured was an hour spent on fairly open roads, he felt the van slow as if they were entering more congested traffic. I think I'll take a powder soon. Since the guards spoke English, they had kept silent so far, but using a little slang might confuse the issue. Do you think this is it? It floats my boat. Uno, dos, tres! <laughs> Blancanales' surprise attack occupied the guard seated beside him. The two ended up fighting on the floor. Ah. Turning on the bench, Schwartz reared back to slam both of his feet against the van door. Ducking his head, Schwartz rubbed the bandana against the ground, pulling the cloth out of position enough to see out of one eye. He had landed by a curve next to a sidewalk. Pedestrians all around him were turning away their eyes. Even in the new Russia, it was best not to see certain things. Getting to his feet, he took off running. Even with his hands cuffed behind him, he was making good time. There was what looked like a street market about two blocks away, and if he could make it there, he might be able to lose himself in the crowd. He knew he was being followed and couldn't expect any help from passers-by. Being good Russians, they knew better than to get involved in any way. Schwartz glanced over his shoulder and saw the van coming after him in reverse. When the vehicle drew close to him, the second guard jumped out and tackled him. Since he couldn't use his arms to break his fall, he hit hard, his face scraping the concrete. The guard followed him down and had his bunker off in action before he stopped skidding. With the muzzle of the pistol drilled into his ear, Schwartz had no choice but to go quietly. Aaron Kurtzman was still chasing Rostov's old Red Army buddies when Hunt Weathers called to him from his workstation across the room. Aaron, do you remember the emergency beepers Abel team was wearing when they went to the Prague meeting place? Yes. Well, the recon bird over Moscow just picked up one of them squawking. It's the right frequency and the right coded pulse. Check it again. Kurtzman didn't see any way that emergency beacon could have gotten all the way from Prague to Moscow. Schwartz and Blancanales were dead. Lyons had confirmed it. It checks out. What do you want me to do about it? Nothing. It has to be a mistake. Under different circumstances, he might have notified Price and Brignola about this. But with everything that was going down now, he didn't want to distract anyone's attention from the tasks at hand. Giving the team false hope would only distract them and change their tactics, and it was far too late for that. But if Lyons was somehow mistaken, and either Schwartz or Blancanales was alive... Mark the location, and uh, add a note that we need to change the beacon signal in the future. 
Schwartz lay on the floor of the van, trying to catch his breath. He hadn't stayed on the street very long, but he had been able to activate the signal, and he might have been free long enough for the emergency signal to be heard. Their blindfolds were off now, and both of the guards had them covered with their Makarovs. Neither Schwartz nor Blancanales bothered to ask where they were being taken now. Gregor Rostov didn't look amused when Schwartz and Blancanales were dragged in front of him. Do not think that you have escaped being questioned. All you have done is ensure that the questioning will be done here. And actually, that is easier for me. I'm afraid, however, that it will be rougher on you. And Mr. Schwartz, since you instigated this, you will be questioned first. Schwartz smiled slowly. Great! I always liked being first. We'll see about that. As Schwartz was taken away, Blancanellas was led back to his cell to wait. Hal Brignola's initial meeting with Minister Valensikov hadn't gone as well as he would have liked. It hadn't been a complete failure, but he hadn't been able to make headway against the man's rock-hard belief that his ministry was free of moles. After flying the polar route from Washington, D.C. to Moscow, as he requested, his plane had been met at the airport by Valensikov's security men, and he had been driven straight to the ministry. The minister had turned out to be a congenial man in his late sixties, and his English was good enough that he had been able to conduct their meeting without having to go through an interpreter. That had been the first and only thing that had worked out well. Things had quickly gone downhill from there. Even with all the evidence Brignola had brought with him to back up his theory about the leak, Valensikov had steadfastly refused to be convinced. In fact, he had resented Brignola even bringing up the topic. Brignola knew that part of the Russians' vehement denial was simply national pride. It had cost the Moscow government much of their face when they had been forced to call upon the Americans to help them get control of this mafia mess. Admitting that they had an internal spy was out of the question. But Brignola also considered himself to be a good reader of character, and he realized that there was more to the minister's steadfast denial than merely bruised national pride. The man really believed that his people had done everything they possibly could to provide airtight security for the joint operation. He was equally convinced that Valensikov was dead wrong and knew that the spy, whomever he was, was under extremely deep cover. So deep, in fact, that not even the Russian intelligence service had been able to ferret him out. More and more he was understanding Barbara Price's viewpoint about the Russians, and he sincerely wished that he had listened to her earlier. It really had been ill-advised for Stony Man to have taken on this task, and he should have done more to insist on stronger safeguards before agreeing to it. This was the one time that he should have gone to the wall with the president and refused to take on the mission until the farm could work up its own intelligence sources and cut the Russians completely out of the loop. Where this all left him now, he didn't have a clue, but he wasn't about to give up. Since he had gone directly from the airport to the meeting in Valensikov's office, he was still fighting jet lag, and he needed to rest before he tried to think that far ahead. Another meeting had been scheduled in the morning, and maybe if he was fresher, he'd be more convincing. If he wasn't, he would have no choice but to return to Washington and lay the whole mess on the man in the Oval Office, along with his resignation from SOG, of course. While Valensikov had balked at accepting that there was a mole in his office, he had been very interested in the farm's identification of ex-Red Army Colonel Gregor Rostov as the mastermind behind the Russian Mafia. A quick check with Army records had given him information about the disgraced Colonel's Afghan drug operation and his disappearance from a military prison during the disruption of Gorbachev's resignation. He thanked Brignola for that tip and promised to start an investigation of Rostov's whereabouts and activities immediately. At least that part of the operation had worked out. If he was forced to ask the president to pull Stony Man off the job, at least the Russian would have that much to follow up. Why they hadn't been able to come up with the man's name on their own was beyond him. He knew that their intelligence apparatus was better than that. Brignola was being lodged in the ministry's own safe house, and it had all the amenities of a modern hotel, including a modem line. The first thing he did when he got settled into his room was to plug in his laptop, boot up the email, and type out a short report to Kurtzman. Since he expected the line to be tapped, he used one of the farm's open line codes to tell Kurtzman the results of the first meeting, as disappointing as they were. What Barbara Price's response would be, he didn't wait to know. As with so much else involved here, he'd deal with that later. After that chore had been taken care of, he took a long shower and called down to order his dinner. 
He wasn't very hungry, but he knew that he would need the energy in the morning. Fifteen minutes after finishing his meal, he was dead asleep. A little before midnight, a well-dressed woman wearing a long fur coat drove up to the guardhouse in front of the ministry safe house. She seemed to be known by the agent on duty and engaged him in conversation. While his attention was diverted, two men in black combat suits slipped in behind her. The guard caught a glimpse of movement, but before he could react, one of the men fired a silenced pistol twice. Both rounds took him in the face and he slumped back into his guard shack. After buzzing herself through the security gate, the woman proceeded to the front door of the house. There, she buzzed again and slipped her hand into her purse. When the door was opened, she greeted the man behind it by shooting him in the chest with a small pistol. As he fell back, the two men in black rushed past her, their silenced pistols at the ready. Minutes later, the safe house was secure. Halbrignola slept the sleep of exhaustion, but the alarms in his subconscious mind were going off, telling him that someone was in the room with him. He was struggling to come awake when he felt a pain in his arm and went into blackness again. One of the men in black pocketed a syringe. He'll be out for the next several hours. Good. Put a coat on him and get him down to the garage immediately. One of the men pulled Brignola's limp body out of bed and held him upright, while the other one worked his arms into his overcoat. Once dressed, they supported him on both sides and walked him out of the room and down the stairs. In the garage, Brignola was dumped into the back of a Mercedes sedan. She then walked back to her own car, parked at the curb, ready to drive it in the opposite direction. She didn't want to be late for her social engagement. It would be her alibi to her husband. Rosario Blancanales knelt beside Gadget Schwartz's cot. He had taken off his shirt, moistened it, and was washing the sweat from his friend's face. Rostov had really worked him over this time. His pulse was seriously elevated, and he was twitching uncontrollably from the after-effect of the nerve induction machine. Another session like that would probably kill him. Pa? It's me. I did it. I know. Blancanales cursed not being able to talk to him without being overheard. Had he been able to speak with him, maybe he could have talked him out of trying something like that with so little chance of survival. Like gadgets, he hated doing nothing, but if that's what it took to keep them alive, it was worth it. Schwartz reached out with his left hand to see if his right arm was still intact. I can't move my arm. It's there, but I can't make it move. Your nerves have been burned out. It should wear off in a little while. Go back to sleep, and I'll wake you when they feed us again. Do you think the farm heard me? I don't know. I really don't. Schwartz's eyes rolled back in his head as he passed out. Aaron Kurtzman was working late again. Brignola's report from Moscow was disquieting, to say the least. If the Big Fed couldn't convince the Russians that something was wrong in the ministry, this was really going to blow up in their faces and really bring an end to the SOG. No one, no matter what had gone down, actually wanted to see the end of Stony Man Farm. From the lowest-ranking black suit to Hal Brignola himself, every man and woman involved with the SOG had devoted their lives to their work. Their dedication was total to even the exclusion of old friends and family. That was why so many of them were single or divorced and didn't have families of their own. Working on the farm was a calling that took precedence over what other people would call normal life. Brignola had to succeed in Moscow, or they would all be lost. But for that to happen, everyone involved had to do everything that they possibly could to make it happen. And for him, that meant going into the electronic world that was an extension of his existence, and surfing the web until he found the key that would unlock the information they so desperately needed. One of the things that made Kurtzman so good at what he did was that he approached the science of gathering information from cyberspace as if it were an art. Rather than charging straight into it using A plus B equals C linear logic, he liked to approach his goal in what he liked to call a poetic manner, a cyber zen, as it were. Somewhere out there, specifically somewhere in Russia, was the man who was running one of the world's largest criminal enterprises, ex-Colonel Gregor Rostov. Something that big had to leave a trace of its activities somewhere. Just as a battleship left a bigger wake than a rowboat, something as big as Rostov's operation had to be making major cyber waves. He just had to keep on surfing until he bumped into one of the waves. Then he would turn and follow it back to its source. 
He instinctively knew that Rostov's military service was the connection that would finally pay off. The question was, in a nation where almost every able-bodied male had done some kind of military service during his lifetime, where were the links? Of those millions of ex-servicemen in Mother Russia, who was Rostov in contact with? Who was helping him put together his criminal empire? Deciding to start from the top down, he went into the web to track high-ranking officers. He was working the list of the generals Rostov had come into contact with during his service career when he was jerked back into linear logic. The icon at the top of his screen was announcing that he had a top-priority emergency message from the office of Minister Valensikov. Oh, shit. Barbara, are you there? Yeah, any news? Hal's been kidnapped out of Valensikov's safe house in Moscow. I'll be right down. A rumpled Barbara Price walked into the computer room almost immediately. Where is it? On the screen. <sighs> Maybe now he understands what I was trying to tell him. If he listened to me in the first place, this wouldn't have happened. And why wasn't he staying at the American Embassy? That's why we spend good dollars to build embassies in foreign countries. They're a safe place for government officials to stay when they visit so they won't get snatched. I guess he didn't want to turn down the minister's hospitality and make matters even worse. Now what am I supposed to do? Do I have to tell the man that he's been grabbed? Since he left you in charge, I guess that's your call. Tell him now or tell him later. I don't see that it really matters at this point, but having the president jumping up and down isn't going to get Hal back any faster, so I suggest that you wait. Good point. Okay, what do you want me to do first about getting him back? Re-establish complete communications with the team and get Mac and Katz in on this full bore. I want them to go to Moscow immediately and represent us with Volinsikov. I want to have all of our best brains working on this together. Then call the minister and let him know that they're coming. And since this was your bright idea to send him over there, you're not going anywhere until this is over. I'm even going to have your meals brought to you in here. But this was Hal's idea. Then you should have told me about it earlier so I could have stopped him from going. Bolin and Katz were taking their turn monitoring communications in the van while the rest of the team stood down in Berlin. The reunited city was a great place to spend dead time. They had taken rooms in a small hotel in the old communist sector where people still didn't ask too many questions and they could park their now unmarked van in private. Katz received a high priority briefing from the farm. When he finished, he turned to Bolin. His eyes were deadly serious. We need to get our gear packed ASAP, Stryker. We're going to Moscow this afternoon. What's going on? Hal was snatched during the night by Rostov. I thought he was supposed to be staying at the Ministry safe house. He was, but apparently someone broke in, wiped out all of the staff, and snatched him. Bolin took a moment to marshal his thoughts. He and Katz hadn't been happy to hear that Brignola had gone to Moscow in the first place. They understood his reasons for wanting to make the trip, but knew the risks and didn't think that they were worth taking. If Rostov was able to pull off a stunt like this, the situation was worse than any of them had thought. Nonetheless, now they had a real focus for their efforts. Moscow. We better get Lyons and McCarter in here, too. If we're going after Hal, we're going to need them with us. Well, at least Lyons will love it. He's been waiting to get at the Russians ever since this started. Minister Valensikov was seriously considering suicide as his only way to get himself out of the mess he had created. Having a high-ranking American kidnapped out of his ministry's own safe house was the kind of mistake a politician could never recover from. However, rather than killing himself right away, he would first take vengeance on the woman who had got him into this situation, his own wife, before he ended his life. Damn that woman. But damn himself double for being an old fool and marrying her. When he had been younger, he had made fun of older men who fell for the charms of women who were so much younger than themselves, then married them. There was something ludicrous about a fat, balding old man with a woman on his arm young enough to be his daughter. The young ones were good to have for mistresses, but to marry them, that wasn't dignified. And if nothing else, an old man needed to keep his dignity. But when he ceased being a young man, and he had no idea when that pivotal event had happened, he stopped thinking that way. In his case, though, he hadn't dumped a fat old wife his own age to seek a younger replacement. His first wife had died, and since he was a man who always enjoyed living with a woman, he started to look for a new wife. Actually, 
If he was honest, he knew that he hadn't found Marina, she had found him. And, had he not been such a blind old fool, he would have asked himself why she had been so eager to give her sleek young body to a man twice her age. He liked to think that he was too smart to fall for a trap like that. But the facts were in now, and he was a fool. It was apparent that she had been planted on him to be the spy in his office that Brignola had tried to convince him existed. According to the one guard who had survived the massacre at the safe house, the raiders had been led by his wife. The man had met her many times, and there was no doubt that the identification was correct. He also said that she had fired the shot that had almost killed him. That she could have been duplicitous really didn't surprise him. He believed that was a legacy every woman was born to. That she could kill, though, shocked him. He hadn't expected that. He hadn't even known that she could shoot a gun. He would soon know how all of these things had come to pass, though. In less than an hour, his wife would show up at the front door of the ministry. He had invited her to lunch with him, a social occasion with some of his fellow ministers and their wives. But instead of showing off her wardrobe and jewels to envious wives, Marina would find herself in one of his basement cells, minus her expensive clothing and jewelry. And the only eyes on her would be the cold, hard eyes of his most trusted men. He would have the answers to his questions, and he didn't think that it would take long for him to get them. The Russian people were good at many things, and one of the things they did best was ask questions. What would be left of her after all his questions had been answered wasn't something that he wanted to think about right now, but he would certainly have the answers. When Hal Brignola awakened, he found that he was in a windowless cell. The ache in his head and the scummy taste in his mouth told him that he had been drugged. He remembered half waking in the night, but that was all. He forced himself to try to figure out what had happened. He had no doubt about the why, though. The Mafia spy in the ministry had passed on word of his visit, and Rostov had acted quickly to take him out of the game. He had to admit that the ex-colonel was fast on his feet and willing to take chances. That fit with everything else he had done so far, so the big fed shouldn't be surprised. He was looking forward to meeting this mystery man, and he didn't think that it would be long in coming. He had spotted the video camera in his cell and knew that his captors would know that he was awake. Rostov watched the monitor screen as Hal Brignola tried to make himself presentable. He didn't have much to work with, just a rumpled set of pajamas, but he was combing his hair with his fingers and tucking his pajama tops into the bottoms. Take his clothing and bring him into the conference room. Yes, sir. Rostov stepped forward, extending his hand in greeting. Mr. Brognola, I am Gregor Rostov, the man you have been looking for. Welcome to my headquarters. Brignola was enough of a politician to know that he should take the Russian's hand. Considering that he was a prisoner, angering the man wouldn't be a good move at this point, particularly not with four armed hard men standing in the corners of the conference room he had been led into. Getting strong-armed wasn't going to help him right now. Please, have a seat. Can I get you a cup of coffee? Coffee would be nice. Cream and sugar, please. Oh, certainly. I am sorry that my men did not bring your luggage from the minister's safe house, but I will see what I can do to get more suitable clothing for you. Since I'm your prisoner, these will do well enough for now. When the coffee came and the cup was put in front of him, Brugnola let it sit. Rostov filled his own cup and took a sip from it before continuing. <clears throat> Now that you have been taken out of the game, as it were, who will take over the farm for you? Barbara Price? You don't really expect me to answer that, do you? <laughs> you will answer my question, Mr. Brognola. Never fear. I just wanted to give you a chance to answer on your own. A courtesy, if you will, from one professional to another. Brognola had had about all of this phony bastard's courtesy he could stomach. It was simply part of the interrogation process, designed to gain his trust, and to make him think that Rostov knew more than he did. He had to admit, however, that the man obviously knew more than he really should. He knew better than to think that Rostov had access to anyone who worked at the farm. Not in this lifetime, or any other. But the question remained, where in the hell was he getting his information? That was a question he would work on later. Now it was time to end this charade. You might be a professional, but you and I aren't quite in the same profession. 
As far as I'm concerned, you're just another low-life, cheap hood who's working to destroy his mother country. You obviously got your hands on a nice place to work from, but that doesn't make you anything other than a scumbag like the rest of the world's criminals. I am very sorry that you feel that way, Mr. Brognola. I had hoped that we could conduct our business without animosity, but obviously not. We don't have any business to conduct. I'm your prisoner, and that's the end of it. Oh, but we do have business. You just don't know it yet. Take Mr. Brognola back to his quarters. Brignola pushed back his chair, stood, and waited for the guards to close in. As soon as Hal Brignola was led back to his cell, Boris Detloff joined Rostov in the conference room. So much for trying to do it the easy way. Do you want me to alert the medical staff? We have lots of time yet, so I don't want to hurry this. I want to give our Mr. Hal Brognola a while to think about his situation first. A soft man like him, a politician, will not have the strength that a soldier has. His own fears will do most of the work for us. And to help the process along, I want him to witness our next session with Mr. Schwartz. That should go a long way toward convincing him to answer my questions. As you wish. Has Marina checked in yet? Not yet. But with the Ministry in an uproar, she will have to be very careful. Let me know as soon as she calls. Yes, sir. When Yakov Katzenellenbogen and Mac Bolin arrived at the Moscow airport, they were met by openly armed, uniformed guards from Minister Valensikov's office. After being escorted through the terminal, they were driven away in an armored van. Having lost one American, Valensikov wasn't taking any chances this time. Additional troops and armored personnel carriers surrounded the ministry when they drove up. Only after showing their ID were they allowed through the security screen. Valensikov was waiting in a small office, and he stepped forward when the two men were shown in. I am ashamed to admit that El Brugnola was correct about Gregor Rostov having a spy in my office. I am even more ashamed to have to say that this spy was my own wife, Marina. I didn't know it, but he arranged it so that I met her right after my wife died, and I was particularly vulnerable. I am very sorry, Minister. But it sounds like it wasn't your fault. How could you have known that your wife was working for him? No, I am afraid that it really is my fault. I had a habit of uh, confiding in her about everything we do here in the Ministry. She is quite a bit younger than I am, and I thought that she would love me more if she knew how important the work I do here is. She always listened intently and asked me many questions. <sighs> like a fool, I thought that she was truly interested in my work. I acted like a schoolboy, and there is no excuse for it. Katz and Bolin could only agree with the minister's accurate assessment of his own behavior. It was the oldest story in the book of spy tricks, and it had doomed more than one good man. But it was irrelevant now. The only thing left for them to do was to go into damage control mode and hope that they weren't too late to limit the damage. Is your wife available for questioning? Brignola might still be alive, and she may be able to lead us to him. She is available. Belinsikov's eyes were cold. Husband or not, he was enough of a professional to know what had to be done and she is being questioned as we speak. I will take you to her. The minister led them to the elevator that descended below ground level to the building's holding cells. Every government building in the old Soviet Empire had had such cells in the basement, and there was no doubt that many of them were still in use, as they were here. In one of the interrogation rooms, a young blonde woman stood in front of a table where three men sat. The men stood to attention when Valensikov walked in. Even somewhat battered and wearing a shapeless prison uniform, Katz saw that Marina Valensikov was a stunningly beautiful woman. Now that he had seen her, he better understood how the minister had fallen into this honey trap and been seduced to betray his operation. It was a stupid thing for a man in his position to have done, but as long as men were men and women were beautiful, the story would be repeated many more times. What have you learned so far? We now know where Rostov has his headquarters. Where's that? At Mother Site 8. Bolin and Katz exchanged questioning glances. Uh, Mother Site, what's that? 
It is a heavily defended ballistic missile launching complex outside Moscow. It was designed to withstand both air and ground attack, while it served as a control center for other launch sites. It appears that even though Rostov had been disgraced in the Red Army, he still had many friends in the military. Maybe some of these men had been in with him on the Afghan drug smuggling scheme. We do not know all of the details yet. When we remove the missiles from our launch complexes in accordance with our treaties with your country, we sold off the empty structures to anyone who wanted to buy one. Someone bought Mother Side 8. We are working to find out who that was right now. Somehow, it ended up in Rostov's hands. Balintikov met Katz's eyes squarely. The worst part is that we believe this particular Mother Side was not properly demilitarized before it was sold. It appears that the inspectors were bought off. What do you mean? Unfortunately, it means that this site still has its full defensive capacity intact. Ground defenses, air defenses, and we think it's still capable of launching nuclear missiles. Does it have any missiles? To be honest with you, we do not know at this time. He glanced back at his wife. But we intend to find out very soon. Now that the Americans had been shown that Valensikov had the situation well in hand, he took them back up to his office. Minister, what is your next move? We are assembling a force to try to take the mother site right now. Since we have the details of the defenses, it will be a little easier for us to defeat them. Can you hold off the assault until I get the rest of my team in here? Ah, I thought that you would want to move immediately to free Mr. Bogmola. Hal's tough. I'm confident he can hold out a little while longer, if possible. I'd like to use my own people so there are no mistakes. But of course. But if this place is as bad as you say it is, we'll be glad to have any help you can provide to go in with us. Oh, as I said, I am putting together a team of specialists in this kind of operation, and they will be happy to have you and your men join them. Hal Brignola had laid on his narrow bunk to regroup and recover. There were no doubts in his mind that his stay here, however long or short it might turn out to be, wasn't going to be a club med experience. He was going to need all of his strength to take what was coming like a man. And that meant conserving his strength, because he was going to need it later. He was old enough to be fully aware that he wasn't going to live forever. In his line of work, he had come to that realization much sooner than men who lived safe, quiet lives. It went with the job. He had also learned that how one died was just as important, if not more so, than how one lived. He had few regrets about how he had lived, and he wanted to have none about how he was going to die. He knew that pain was the great leveler, but he vowed that he would try his best to remain true to how he had lived his life, no matter what Rostov did to him. He also knew that was an easy vow to make, but not an easy one to keep. An hour or so later, he was ready. Detloff entered, flanked by two of his hard men. Please, come with me, Mr. Brugnola. Taking a deep breath, Brugnola went calmly. Rostov was all smiles again when Brugnola was taken to him, and he acted as if their previous conversation hadn't taken place. Rather than reassuring the big fed, however, it put him on alert. He knew never to trust a man who changed his mind so easily. He was surprised, however, when the Russian said that he wanted to take him on a tour of his facility. Since I feel that I know so much about your farm, as you call it, I thought that you might like to see my operation. After being taken past a control center that Rostov immediately identified as a missile launch facility, he was taken to a war room that Rostov bragged controlled an elaborate defensive system. This facility was designed to withstand the final war. We can fight off an armored division if it comes down to that. If, Brugnola thought, he had the manpower. So far, he had seen only a couple dozen people all told, and even with automated defenses, he would need more help. Rostov next led Brignola into a large room, its walls lined with computer equipment. Now, these are my three Grodonov mainframes. I am told that they are a slightly higher capacity than the craze you have at the farm. Now that I know more about your security systems, 
My people are working to break into your cyberspace communications. As you may well know, when that happens, the game's over. Even with the powerful mainframes Rostov had, Brignola was confident that there was no way that he could crack Kurtzman's homebrew cybersecurity systems. The computer expert played with cyber cryptology the way a grand master played chess. Even so, Rostov apparently thought that he had enough information to make the attempt, which of course brought to mind the question of where he was getting his information. Brignola's capture proved that he had a spy in Valensikov's office, but the farm had been careful how much information had been passed on to the minister. There had to be another answer to how Rostov knew so much about the farm's operations. Before we go back to my office to continue our conversation, I want to show you something I'm sure will hold your interest. Wondering what was coming next, Brignola followed as Rostov led him to a window looking into what had to be a medical facility. A man was strapped in a chair while technicians in white coats attached what looked like electrical equipment to him. When they moved his head to face the window, Brignola couldn't believe his eyes. Schwartz? What's he doing here? He was reported killed in Prague. He wasn't killed. He was captured. But how? We had a witness to his death. It was child's play to capture him. After luring your so-called able team into the factory, we staged a shootout, and Mr. Lyons was forced to flee as we wanted him to. And he obviously told his Phoenix Force friends that his two teammates had died. You must have blamed yourself for their deaths. You thought that the information you passed on from Valensikov's office was responsible for the ambush, and in that you are correct. But of course, you had no way of knowing that the information originated from me. As Brignola watched, the technicians made adjustments to their equipment, and Schwartz visibly reacted in pain. The room had apparently been soundproofed, but he could see gadgets open his mouth in a scream and lunge against the restraints. Why are you doing that to him? I'm afraid that Mr. Schwartz has proved to be somewhat of a problem for me. He is stubborn, so I've had to resort to what I am sure looks like a barbaric means of getting the information I need from him. Rest assured, however, that he will have no permanent damage. The nerve induction interrogation is painful to be sure, but it has no lasting effects. He will recover just fine. Schwartz's back arched, and his mouth opened in an unheard scream as another jolt of electricity coursed down his ulnar nerve. After looking like he would break his own back in his agony, he fell limp against the restraints. Oh, he's passed out again. That is unfortunate. Now I will have to question Mr. Blancanales instead. Rosario's alive too? But of course. Do you think that I would kill him before I complete my interrogation? That would be a waste of a good source. Russians know how to care for our sources of information. With the three of you, I will learn everything I need to know to ensure that your country never meddles in Russian affairs again. Brignola knew that he was being put through a full court press. Being shown that Gadgets and the politician were alive and that they were being tortured was a calculated tactical move, one carefully crafted to break his will and soften him so he would talk freely instead of being put through that torture himself. Rostov wanted to make him afraid of what he would do when it came his turn to go under the machine. But that wasn't the way his mind worked. With him, it was the unknown that was fearful. The known, no matter how bad, wasn't to be feared, but simply to be endured. Now that he knew what he was facing, he could deal with it and wouldn't break. He almost wanted to thank the Russian for giving him this information. After that, of course, he wanted to tear the bastard's throat out with his teeth for what he had done to Schwartz and Blancanales. We're going to get you for this. You realize that, don't you? Rostov almost laughed. You think that Carl the Iron Man Lions is going to come bursting through the door with his guns blazing like an actor in one of your movies? Or do you think that Phoenix Force is going to drop on me from out of thin air? This is not one of your fanciful films, Mr. Brognola, where the American hero arrives at the last moment and achieves a dramatic rescue. Though I really do wish that your Phoenix Force would try to come after you and your friends. It would save me the trouble of sending my operatives after them later, once I own the country. Just then, Boris Detloff walked in and whispered something to Rostov in Russian. Rostov's face registered shock, and then he stormed out without a word. Without saying another word, the two Russians hurried off while the guards closed in on Brignola to take him back to his cell. 
How Brignola would have given anything to know what had put Rostov off his stride. The bastard had sure lost his superior smirk fast. It looked like the ball hadn't exactly stopped rolling yet, nor was it in Rostov's court as he wanted it to be. The Russian had enjoyed a good laugh at Phoenix Force's expense, but no one knew better than Brignola how dangerous it could be to underestimate those men. Most of the others who had made the mistake were worm food now. He knew that Barbara Price was furious at his having put himself in a position where he could get captured, but he also knew that as much as she wanted to, she wouldn't leave him swinging in the wind. Lyons, Bolan, and Phoenix Force would be coming for him, and Gregor Rostov had better make sure that he had his affairs in order. He lay on his cot to rest and tried not to think about what he had seen being done to Schwartz. Rostov had also laughed at the concept of Lyons breaking down walls to rescue his friends, but he didn't know how close that was to being a reality. If there was any way that he could let the Iron Man know that his teammates were being held prisoner here, Iron Man would chew through the concrete to get to them. As he drifted off to sleep, the image of Lyons' familiar look of grim determination kept coming into his mind. That a man like him was out there somewhere looking for him was a comforting thought. Regardless of what Rostov thought, this was a long ways yet from being a done deal. The news that had interrupted Gregor Rostov's session with Hal Brignola had been a report that Marina Valinsikov had been arrested by her husband and had disappeared into the depths of the ministry. It took a while for him to confirm the report, and when he did, he was concerned. The potential effect of her capture on his operation wasn't lost on him. Now that the minister had finally figured out that his marital pillow talk had been his downfall, he wasn't going to be happy about it. The only question that remained to be answered was how fast Marina could be made to tell what she knew, and he had no doubt that she would talk. Her husband was an old fool, but he wasn't enough of a fool not to put her under interrogation. The first thing he had to do was to inform General Belislav of this development. The general had known about Rostov's access to the ministry, but he had never been comfortable about who the spy was. Being the conventional man that he was, he hadn't liked the idea of using women as agents. But it had been done, and now they had to work with it. The fact that he had nabbed Brignola, though, would go a long way to mollify the general. Melislav. It's Colonel Rostov, General, and I have some news. Rostov quickly briefed him, first on the capture of Brignola, and lastly of Marina's imprisonment. I must know why the Americans sent Brognola to Moscow immediately. We are not ready to move yet, and I must have advance warning if they have decided to get involved to a greater extent. Brognola will be able to answer those questions, and I will have those answers for you as soon as possible. Has there been a response from the Americans to his disappearance? I have no way of knowing. Now that Marina Valinsikov has been captured, I have lost my inside line to the Ministry. I warned you about the dangers of using her. She knows nothing about my connection to you. So if she talks, all she can do is give away details of my operation. And as you well know, I can take care of myself here as long as you can keep the military from attacking me. After receiving assurances that the general would use his not inconsiderable influence to ensure that no Russian military forces would be used against Mother Site 8, Rostov hung up and turned his mind back to the problem at hand. He regretted that he hadn't placed a second agent within the ministry. Marina had worked out so well that he had ordered Detloff to stop trying to recruit another member of the staff. Recruiting efforts always carried a risk of being turned against you, and he hadn't wanted to take that chance. Now, though, he was without a way to silence Marina. Losing his eyes in the ministry made him blind, but it hadn't doomed him. He still had Velislav's influence to protect him from the military. Barbara Price frowned as Aaron Kurtzman went through the data Katz and Ellenbogen and Bolin had forwarded from Moscow. What's this mother site business? Basically, the mother sites are mini national command centers that can take over if the national command center has been taken out and direct a retaliatory nuclear strike. That's just common sense. What's the big deal about that? Hunt Weathers stepped in with the results of his research. Well, being Russians, when they designed the eight mother sites, they kind of went overboard. Not only are these independent command centers, they're also fortresses, designed to withstand both conventional ground and air attack. 
They have complete full spectra ground surveillance systems, minefields, automated defensive bunkers, both low and high altitude anti-aircraft missiles, and millions of tons of concrete. The general consensus is that a mouse can't get into one of them without being spotted and blasted out of existence. That's why they were first on the list of Russian sites to be dismantled in the SALT-2 talks. With them out of commission, we both went back to having only one national command center. The fear was that one of them would fall into unfriendly hands, and apparently, that's exactly what happened. And you say that the Russians are providing an assault force? Yes. Volinsikov is having problems with the army not wanting to get involved, but he has got a company of their special forces who have been specially trained in this kind of combat. They'll make the initial assault, and Stony Man will go in after they've breached the defenses. What if they can't break in? Apparently the Russians don't consider that to be an option. I don't know if that's good or bad. All it means is that Volinsikov has vowed to take that place out no matter what it takes. But Hal's probably being held somewhere in there. I know. Oh, and one more thing. Yes? You remember that emergency beacon we heard a little while ago? Don't tell me. The coordinates are an almost perfect match. The beacon was sent just five miles from the site. Hunt, what does that mean? I don't know. But Occam's razor would state something that should be impossible. Are you saying that Schwartz and I'm Blunt usually not prone to conjecture, Aaron, but I'd say that it's looking possible that Schwartz or Blankenalis, or maybe even both, are alive and in Mother Sight 8. Time to reload. Stony Man is continued on the next CD. What's up? Remember that time I let you borrow that Executioner audiobook? Yeah, you want it back? Yeah. <laughs> so what'd you think? It was awesome. But? Well, I accidentally left it in the middle of the living room, right? My grandmother was doing some cleaning last week, and she listened to it. Now all she does is run around the house screaming things. <laughs> so? <laughs> she thinks she's Mac Boland. <laughs> Dude, that sucks. Yeah, tell me about it. See, I really want to buy some of this graphic audio stuff. It totally rules. But if Grandma ever finds out... <laughs> no problem. Go to the Graphic Audio website, www.cuttingaudio.com. You can buy a copy of whatever book you want. Download it to your computer. So until your grandmother figures out the whole MP3 thing, huh, you're safe. Attention! We are out of brand cereal! Repeat! We are out of brand cereal! Over! Oh, snap! Run for your life! I'll come back another time. Rostov wasn't content to just sit and wait for the situation to develop around him. Nor was he going to leave his security solely in the hands of General Belislav. He expected the Americans to try something, and when they did, he would be ready for them. No commando team, no matter how good, was going to be able to crack the defenses of Mother Side 8. The bunkers and heavy weapons positions could chew up anything short of an armored battalion. I want all of our foreign associates brought into the site and put in the bunkers. You mean the terrorists? Our associates. They have been on the payroll for some time now, and it is time they earned their money. We may have some trouble bringing in the Afghanis. You know they don't like living in the same quarters with Christians. They are worried about religious contamination. They will go where they are ordered or they will die. And you will see that they do one or the other. As you command, Colonel. The last thing Detloff needed was to start a religious war between the various factions of his forces. But Rostov was right. If they were attacked, they would need every man they could get in the bunkers. Much of the mother site's defenses were automated, but the kind of automation that controlled them required a warm body at the sensors and firing controls. With the speed in which the Moscow situation was developing, Aaron Kurtzman had had little time to spare to continue his background check on Gregor Rostov. Plus, now that they had located the elusive bastard, it hardly seemed necessary. Nonetheless, he had put one of his database search engines on autopilot to work on the problem. Then he promptly forgot about it. One of the things that made Kurtzman so good at what he did was his ability to know when to quit a particular line of inquiry and when to keep at it to the exclusion of everything else. But when he dropped a topic, he dumped it from his personal short-term memory as well. When the Look at Me icon in the upper left corner of his screen started to flash, he automatically clicked on it to see what was demanding his attention. 
For a moment, he didn't remember what he had logged into this particular search engine, the thing he had tagged Bulldog. Then it clicked in his mind. Bringing it up, he saw that his search had revealed that there was one particular ex-general of the Red Army who'd had a long association with ex-Colonel Rostov. Pavel Belislav had cycled in and out of Rostov's military career many times, both as his commanding officer and his military mentor. In fact, the general had testified on Rostov's behalf at his court-martial, thereby saving the drug smuggler from a firing squad. Even more interesting, though, was the fact that Belislav had been the officer in charge of demilitarizing the ICBM launch sites to comply with the SALT II agreement. That could go a long way to explaining how one of Russia's most heavily defended military installations had ended up in the hands of the man who ran the Russian mafia. It also made him wonder what else the general had passed on to his old protege. Maybe a nuclear missile or two to go in the silos at the launch site. Rogue Russian missiles had long been a world-class problem, and having such weapons fall in the hands of criminal elements was a possibility that concerned everyone in the Western world. Reaching out, Kurtzman activated the SATCOM link to Minister Valensikov's Moscow office. This was one piece of information that might prove very useful to them. When Minister Valensikov received Kurtzman's message about the Belislav connection, he finally and fully understood the chain of events that had put Gregor Rostov where he was today. General Belislav was on a long list of ex-Soviet military officers who were kept under surveillance as being dangerous to the survival of the new republic. There wasn't a man or woman in Russia who didn't look to the military as the nation's last defense against chaos. It was also no surprise that many of the old Red Army officers weren't in favor of the new democratic reforms that had reduced their ability to control Russia's destiny. But if a man like Belislav was backing Rostov, it could only mean that the dissident officers were purposefully creating chaos in the form of the Mafia to bring themselves back to power, and it could only mean that a military coup was in the making. Such a military takeover had been feared for a long time, and since the fall of the Communist Party, several attempts had been averted already. Deciding that he needed more information, Volinsikov went to question his wife. Marina hadn't yet mentioned anything about a rostov belislav connection, but that could be because she hadn't been asked the right questions. He, however, now knew exactly what to ask, and he knew that he would get answers. When Valensikov left his interrogation room several hours later, he was convinced that Marina knew nothing about General Belislav. Beyond having heard his name as a hero of the Afghan war, she had no idea who he was. He was disappointed, but he should have expected that. One of the first tenets of tradecraft was to not let the left hand know what the right was doing. Plus, there would have been no reason for her to know. She had merely been a dupe for the conspirators. A willing dupe, true, but a dupe nonetheless, and not even a highly valued one at that. Rostov hadn't even done her the courtesy of giving her a means of killing herself to escape interrogation in case she was caught. He, however, had corrected that oversight. He was now convinced that she didn't know anything else of interest. She was wrung as dry as a husk and had no further value to him. It wouldn't even help to put her on trial, and even though she had betrayed him, he didn't want to see her suffer any longer. Her evening meal would be her last. Her body would be taken out and buried in an unmarked grave in the Moscow cemetery that was reserved for enemies of the state. The documents that he would sign would indicate that she had died of a heart attack while in custody. Even knowing that he had been betrayed, he would miss her, which was why he had decided not to witness her execution as was customary. It was also why she would be given the easy out no pistol shot in the back of the head while she knelt on the concrete floor. She would simply go to sleep and never wake up. He hoped that her last dreams would be happy ones. Shaking off these thoughts, the minister went back to his office. He still had a rebellion to put down and a nation to save. In the process, he hoped that Halbregnola would be rescued intact. But his primary mission was to put Rostov and Belislav in the same cemetery that Marina was destined for and concern for the Americans' fate would have to take second place to that. He was sure that Brignola would understand. Phoenix Force was met at Berlin's Schulfeld Airport by a Russian AN-22 heavy cargo plane. 
looking like a pumped up C-130 Hercules, the big turboprop aircraft was more than large enough to take the team's van with its weapons and camo gear inside. Valensikov had arranged for in-flight food service and sleeping accommodations for the team so they would be rested and ready to go to work when they arrived in Russia. When Mac Bolan and David McCarter walked into the briefing room at the military compound next door to the ministry, the 80 Russian soldiers waiting for them stood to attention. From the blue and white striped jumpers they wore under their khaki jackets, Bolin recognized them as the famed Spetsnaz, the Russian equivalent of the U.S. Army Special Forces and Rangers combined. These were Russia's elite, and they were as good a unit as any nation had ever produced. He had worked with them before, although not on Russian soil, and he knew that they would do the job. An officer with the pips of a major on his shoulder board saluted. Major Yuri Bagdanovich at your service. I'm Colonel Rance Pollock. It's good to meet you, Major. After showing Bolin and company to their seats in the front row, the Major went to the podium and snapped on a slide projector. An aerial view of a large camouflaged military complex filled the screen. This is Mother Site 8, the traitor Gregor Rostov's command post. This missile launch site was supposedly decommissioned in accordance to the SALT II agreement between our two governments and was put up for sale. Somehow Rostov came to possess it and, we believe, all of its military equipment as well. Including the missiles? That we do not know yet. Since the documentation for this site has proved to be funny, we cannot count that possibility out. This was a factor that Bolin hadn't expected to have to deal with. But if it was true, the stakes of this game had just gone up yet another notch. McCarter, have Katz contact Kurtzman and ask him to make a full-spectrum recon run over this place. If he still has missiles in there, the warheads might show up on one of the radiation scans. Will do. What are the site's defensive positions? The slide changed, and a diagram flashed on the screen. Bolin didn't know Russian military symbols as well as he did the American, but there was enough similarity for him to take pause. Here, here, and here are SA savings, and we have just learned that those missiles are still in their launchers. Well, surface-to-air missiles certainly nicks as a chopper air assault. How about we just bomb the place? If Hal wasn't in there, I think I'd talk to them about doing exactly that. You really think he's still alive, don't you? Until we see the body, we have to assume that he is. Rostov wouldn't have gone to the trouble of kidnapping him if he just wanted him dead. I think it's more likely that he's being questioned. After going over the defensive positions and the interior floor plan of the complex in great detail, the Major switched off the screen. Are there any questions, gentlemen? What's your fallback, Major? What happens if your men can't fight their way inside? Should we fail to take the objective, Colonel, the Minister has arranged for the complex to be taken out by a surface-to-surface -surface missile. Nuclear tipped? Of course. The mother site is much too large to neutralize quickly with chemical explosives. The population of the local area will be cleared, of course. I regret that we are unable to risk a high altitude without knowing its exact defensive capabilities. Of course. But I do not expect that it will come to that. My men will be able to handle a criminal gang no matter how well it is armed. There's also the possibility that Rostov has terrorist units on hand, as well as his Russian renegades. What do you mean by terrorists, Colonel? Twice in the past few weeks, Rostov has used ex-IRA members to attack us in Western Europe. We also have reason to believe that he's recruited other ex-communist terrorist groups from all over Europe into his private army. People like the Red Brigades. That may make things a little more difficult, but it will not change the outcome. Ex-communist terrorists are not. They are not Spetsnaz. Bolin well understood the Major's enthusiastic esprit de corps and just hoped that his optimism wasn't misplaced. Picking up briefing packets for Lyons and each of the Phoenix Force commandos, Bolin and McCarter went back to the rooms they had been assigned in the Spetsnaz compound. When Bolin and McCarter returned from the briefing, the rest of the Stony Man team was well into its mission prep phase. A call to Stony Man had gotten them a priority shipment of some of the farm's specialized weaponry, and they were surprised to see that John Kissinger accompanied the shipment. You're a long way from home, lad. Kissinger grinned. <laughs> Since Howe got himself knocked on the head and stuffed into a bag, things got so tame around the ranch that I was sitting twiddling my thumbs. So I thought I'd babysit the shipment and make sure that you guys haven't forgotten how to use this stuff. You lie like a rug on the floor, man. You just wanted to get out of Dodge before the shit hit the fan. You got that right. 
But I thought that I might be of some small use over here. You know, play water boy, pick up after you, that sort of thing. Did you bring an extra Kevlar vest with you? I brought my entire kit. And you know how to shoot an RPG-9? The latest Russian bunker-busting rocket-propelled grenade launcher? Yep. Nope. But I'm a quick study. You'd better be. Because you're our new RPG gunner. Oh, sounds fun. And you're also the assistant demo man. Once we're inside, we'll need you and Manning to take down any locked doors we come across. Oh, good. I brought several rolls of linear charge and dead cord, as well as a few shape charges. When do we leave? Early the next morning, the trip to Mother Site 8 was made in the Spetsnaz's armored personnel carriers. As the Major had explained, with the site's anti-aircraft defenses intact, a Helleborn assault was out of the question. Even in the armored vehicles, they started taking long-range fire when they were still half a mile from the outer perimeter. From a distance, the mother site didn't look all that formidable. Most of it was underground, and the topside structures had all been camouflaged to blend in with the trees. When they got closer, however, Boland started to spot the camouflaged bunkers through his field glasses. They were positioned to give covering fire to the bunkers on either side. This wasn't going to be an easy task for the Spetsnaz. But, with the detailed plans Valensikov had provided, they already knew where each bunker and heavy weapon was located. All they had to do was take them out. Halting the armored personnel carriers in hull defilade positions a quarter of a mile from the perimeter, the Spetsnaz Major sent several of his vehicles forward under the cover of suppressive fire from the rest. The approaches to the outer perimeter are mined, but we are going to cut paths through them with the minefield clearing devices on our tracks. With every onboard weapon firing as fast as it could, the single tracks halted 200 yards in front of their assigned bunkers and triggered their mine clearing devices. Trailing dirty white smoke, small rockets shot out over the open ground, pulling small explosive blocks linked together in a chain behind them. When they settled to the ground, the explosives were command detonated. The shock of their explosion detonated the mines buried for several yards to each side. A 20-yard wide lane erupted in smoke and dust as the mines went off. Several paths were cleared through the minefields at the same time to confuse the defenders as to which one would be the main avenue of attack. Before the smoke of the detonating mines had cleared, the rest of the Spetsnaz armored personnel carriers roared forward, their weapons blazing. The bunkers returned fire and scored minor hits on several of them, but they charged on. When the first track was knocked out, they all halted, dropped their rear ramps, and the Spetsnaz stormed out in six-man teams. As they took cover on the open ground, their tan, green, and brown camouflage uniforms blended in with the earth and the light brush that had foolishly been allowed to grow up around the perimeter. With the heavy weapons on the tracks firing over their heads, they charged the bunkers. In the armored personnel carrier that had been assigned to Phoenix Force, Bolin and McCarter both watched the battle from a safe distance through periscopes. The plan called for them to wait until the outer perimeter had been breached, and Katz and Ellenbogen monitored the Spetsnaz radio transmissions, giving them regular updates as he translated. From the beginning, it was apparent that the Spetsnaz Major had quickly discovered that his commandos had encountered fierce resistance. Going up against Rostov's defenses wasn't turning out to be an easy task. Even with the plans of the complex in hand, his troops were having to fight their way from one bunker position to the next. Rostov's men were criminals, but too many of them were veteran soldiers as well, so this had turned into a fight for the honor of the Russian soldier. Seeing one of his assault teams falter, the Major ordered in his last reserve team to help them. Everything was committed now, and the outcome was in the hands of God. Hawkins watched the battle through one of the vehicle's open firing ports. Is there anything we can do to help those poor bastards? They're getting their butts kicked out there. Not yet, there's not. But as soon as they can take out two adjoining bunkers in the outer ring, we can try to punch through the inner defenses. Get ready. The Major said that bunkers 8 and 9 have been mucked out. Driver, do you think you can get us past those knocked out bunkers? Can do. Switching on the microphone, Katz quickly told the driver what they were going to try to do and asked if he could provide a little suppressive fire. When the answer came back, he turned to Bolin. Let's do it. Boris Detloff was at the mother site's command center conducting the fight. The video cameras and surveillance gear gave him an almost godlike view of the battlefield. The Spetsnaz were taking terrible casualties, but true to their code, they weren't backing off. As he watched, the Russian commandos threw themselves again and again at the storm of fire from the interlocking bunkers. The attackers were slowly eliminating the positions one at a time, but at such a heavy cost that he didn't think many of them would survive. Though he had been with Gregor Rostov since the Afghan war days, in his deepest heart, he was still a Russian patriot, and it hurt him to watch the Spetsnaz die so bravely. Nonetheless, even though they were winning so far, most of Rostov's security force weren't doing very well. 
Even after calling in all of Rostov's so-called associates, he wished that he had more men on hand. The site's defenses had been designed to be manned by a full company of infantry, some 120 men, and he had only 70. What was even more critical than the numbers was the quality of the defenders. Over Detlov's objections, the colonel had placed great faith in his terrorist units, but they weren't proving to be as tough as their press. Like most of the terrorists he had known, they lacked the discipline needed to stand against dedicated fighters like the Spetsnaz, and they were proving to be the cowards that he had always thought them to be. Killing helpless women and children with car bombs wasn't the same as standing against armed men who were intent on taking your life. The Afghan war veterans of Rostov's Old Guards Regiment were holding up much better, but too many of them were past their prime. It was one thing to have fought the Mujis in the 80s, and entirely another to try to get back in that frame of mind after over a decade of peace. Ambushing drug gangs and extorting money from businessmen wasn't the same as cold, hard combat against men who were willing to die for what they believed in. As yet, he hadn't seen any men he could identify as the vaunted American Phoenix Force. They could be wearing Russian uniforms, but he didn't think that they would do that. From everything he had learned about them, when they came, they would come in as Americans and wouldn't hide behind the Russian troops for protection. Phoenix Force's armored personnel carrier shot toward the gap in the defensive line. The instant it started to move, the track drew fire. Even with bunkers 8 and 9 knocked out, they were still in the fan of fire from the positions on either side of them and the entire secondary line of defense. The Russian driver jinked the vehicle from side to side while it still drove full bore, seeming to magically sidestep everything that came at them. Almost every time he turned, the track was rocked by a near miss. David McCarter was in the command turret for the wild ride behind the firing controls of the track's auto-loading 57mm high-velocity gun. The cannon was loaded with a mix of Sabo and plastic Hesch bunker-busting rounds. Even with the gyro stabilizer on the gun mount, with the vehicle bouncing all over the place, it was difficult to bring the cannon to bear accurately. He managed to score a direct hit on the firing aperture of a bunker of the second line that was directly blocking their path. They had to luck out every now and then. A huge gout of flame blew out both the front and back of the bunker along with chunks of what he assumed had once been men. The track also had firing ports along both sides so the men inside could have something useful to do while they were waiting for the big one to knock out their vehicle. Not being men who liked to wait, Phoenix Force was taking advantage of that armored design. Hawkins was at a firing port on the left side with his H&K MP5. The subgun was a bit short range for that kind of work, but anything that could keep the bad guys' heads down was helpful. Spotting an RPG team in the underbrush, he gave them a full magazine squirt and was rewarded by seeing the unguided anti-tank rocket miss them by a wide margin. He gave them another long burst as they flashed by so they wouldn't want to try it again. Kissinger had one of the track's top hatches open and was teaching himself how to shoot the unfamiliar RPG-9. With Manning loading for him, he was firing at anything that came into view. His first two shots didn't hit what he had been aiming at, but he felt that he was starting to get the hang of it. Manning, one more! When the Canadian handed him a loaded RPG, Kissinger swayed with the movement of the vehicle as he locked a secondary bunker in his sights. Seeing a flat piece of ground coming up, he waited until they reached it before squeezing the trigger. This time, the RPG rocketed out of the launcher on its prop charge, and an instant after the main motor kicked in, it impacted right in front of the bunker. With the rocket motor still burning, the anti-tank round bounced and flew in through the bunker aperture before detonating. Yeehaw! Do it again! Hurry up! Seeing Phoenix Force make its run, the Spetsnaz Major extorted one more heroic effort from his men to take the defenders' minds off that one particular track. Only half his men were still on their feet, but they could still put out a lot of firepower. Two of his tracks also charged the perimeter, their 57mm cannon hammering. One of the tracks took a direct hit from an RPG that punched through to the fuel tanks. The armored personnel carrier erupted in a ball of flame. The second vehicle broke through the ring of bunkers before an RPG round hit it broadside and tore one of the tracks loose. Even immobile, though, the crew inside continued fighting from the side ports and top turret. With the Spetsnaz assault confusing the defenders, Phoenix Force's track drove past the defenses and charged for the main building. Driver, open to the right! Locking his right track, the driver turned the vehicle and they shot off in the new direction. Stop at that building on your left! The driver locked his treads and brought the track to a skidding halt a few yards from what looked like a concrete loading dock. When the track's rear ramp dropped, the Phoenix Force commandos sprinted out, keeping to the cover behind the armored vehicle. The driver repositioned himself in the commander's turret and prepared to use the 57mm gun to cover his crazy passengers while they tried to break into the mother site. 
From a command and control van, safely parked 20 miles away, Minister Volinsikov was monitoring the fight through the Spetsnaz radio transmissions. He didn't have communications with Phoenix Force, but the Spetsnaz Major reported that they had penetrated the mother site's inner defenses and should be on their way inside. How much eight men would be able to do against it was yet to be seen, but he had to admit that they had been successful so far. Should they falter, however, he was prepared to carry out his threat of using a tactical nuclear strike to eradicate the mother site and everyone in it. In fact, the SS-9 rocket on its mobile launcher was parked 500 yards from his van, and its crew was busy bringing it up to firing status. One way or the other, Mother Site 8 would die today. He was also monitoring the radio transmissions of another Spetsnaz unit that was closing in on the dacha of General Belislav. They too were meeting resistance, but nothing like what was going on at the Mother Site. And, unlike the troops at the mother site, they had orders to make sure that the general survived the assault even if they had to take extra casualties to keep him alive. Now that Marina was dead, he had a vacancy in his interrogation room, and it was reserved for Belislav. He could afford to leave Rostov to American vengeance if he had the general in his basement, because he would know the name of every other traitor in Mother Russia. As long as he was cleaning house, he would clean it all the way up to the rafters and down to the cellar. The skill of their Russian driver and the sacrifice of the Spetsnaz got the Stony Man team close enough to try to force an entry. The plans they had been given listed the building where they were as a service area annex. What that meant they had no idea, but the plans had also shown two short corridors leading from there to the main building. Normally they would have taken a more direct approach, like the front door. But the plans had also shown that the main doors of the launch complex were hydraulically operated, steel-faced, concrete glass doors that weighed tons. With their current equipment, there was no practical way to breach them. In the middle of the concrete wall in front of the service area loading dock was a huge door that looked like it belonged to a bank vault. It was formidable, but the plans had shown that the doors of the service area annexes, while large, were merely steel. And steel gave way in the face of the proper explosives. Had they been going for a silent entry, a door that size might have presented a problem. But with the battle raging all around them, who would notice another small explosion or two? While the rest of the team stood guard, Manning and Kissinger pulled a roll of linear-shaped charge from the demo pack and quickly ran a smaller loop of it all the way around the face of the door. As Kissinger held it in place, Manning pressed it against the surface to activate the adhesive strip on the back. Taking a two-ounce block of C4 plastic explosive from his pack, Kissinger molded it around the line charge and stuck it to the door. Manning had the electronic detonator ready, stuck it in the C4 and backed away, unrolling the firing wires. Line charges didn't have much backblast, and the men didn't have to move far out of the way before hitting the switch. When the smoke cleared, a smaller opening had been cut in the door and blown back inside to lie on the floor of what appeared to be an airlock. Considering that the site had been designed to withstand a nearby nuclear attack, that wasn't surprising. Even the service areas would have to be sealed from possible contamination. When the inside door turned out to be locked as well, Manning put a two-pound shaped charge over the center of the locking mechanism and backed out of the chamber. No need to be covert now. When the smoke cleared, Calvin James and T.J. Hawkins hurried forward, tossed grenades into the corridor beyond, and stepped back while they detonated. As soon as the shrapnel stopped singing through the air, they charged through the opening. When Boris Detlov saw the indicator light for one of the service area doors come on, he instantly knew that he had been outflanked. Somehow, the Americans had got through the bunker line and blasted their way inside the mother site. Calling up the diagram of the complex, he immediately saw which door they had forced. He saw that they had blasted their way in, but they were still in the service area. The area had been designed to be cut off when the complex went on alert, and if he could keep them confined there, he could move in troops to take care of them. Reaching for his controls, he hit the switches that locked the access doors to that area. Since they were concrete blast doors, he felt secure and turned his attention back to the Spetsnaz. It took but a few minutes for the Stony Man commandos to sweep through the service area and find it empty. They also found that the corridors leading into the main building were closed with more concrete blast doors. Damn, I'm not sure I have enough charges to even crack this sucker, much less move it out of the way. Is there an emergency override? There's some kind of control panel over here, but it's all in Russian. Bag that. I think there's some kind of small airlock door over here. From the wheeled dumb boxes parked around it, I think it's some kind of garbage chute. Garbage chute or not, if it led inside the mother site, they would use it. 
The small explosive charge peeled the round door back, revealing a metal lined tunnel a few yards long that ended with another hatch. I'll get it. Manning pulled another charge and detonator out of his pack. Detloff was surprised to see yet another one of the indicators on the master security panel light up. Reading the legend beside it, he saw that it was the inside door to the trash chute to the annex. He hadn't realized that it opened into the main corridor, and that meant that the Yankees were inside. He hadn't told Rostov about the Yankees getting into the service annex, but he had to inform him about this. Maybe he could move in some of the reserve forces to trap them and finally kill them. Rostov was wearing a set of his old Afghan war fatigues and had a faded sweatband tied around his forehead. A 9mm Stechen machine pistol was strapped to his waist belt, an AK-47 assault rifle was slung over his shoulder, and he had a Czech Scorpion subgun in his hands. It was time for him to go to war again. He hadn't expected Detloff's report that the Yankees had broken in somehow, but he wasn't going to go down without a fight. He had tried to put a call through to General Belislav, but had found that the phone line wasn't in operation. Considering the state of the general's communications equipment, that could only mean that Valinsikov was moving against him as well. It was apparent now that he had seriously underestimated the minister. He should have used Marina to assassinate the old bastard while he still had the chance. Even so, all wasn't lost yet. He had come so far that he didn't really need Belislav anymore. In fact, he had been coming to the conclusion already that he would be better off without him. A Russia dominated by the military might actually hamper his criminal enterprises rather than give him free reign. Before he worried about that, though, he had to deal with the immediate threat. Detloff was still defending the mother site against the Spetsnaz commandos, so it was up to him to take on Phoenix Force. That was actually the way he wanted it. These men had brought him trouble, and he intended to give it back to them in full measure. Walking into the separate barracks room Detloff had assigned to the Afghanis, he saw that they were ready to go into action. But rather than send them outside to finish off the faltering Spetsnaz, he would use them against the Americans. Come! The infidels have broken in, and I need you to kill them for me! Which infidels? You are all infidels in this country. These infidels are my American enemies, and they have come from the great Satan across the ocean to try to bring an end to a very profitable association. I will give a bonus in gold for each of their heads you bring to me! <laughs> The cheers weren't unexpected. In a culture that didn't allow men to drink alcohol, they easily became drunk on gold. Though Rostov was a Russian infidel, the Afghanis respected him as a warrior. He had killed hundreds of their countrymen, but then so had they. So many, in fact, that they had been outlawed in their own country and had to sell their services to men like him. Now that they were inside the complex itself, the Stony Man warriors split into teams to search for Hal Brignola and Rostov. With Kissinger working with Phoenix Force for the duration, that gave them four two-man teams so they could cover the underground maze that much faster. Bolin was teamed up with Lyons again, as he had been since Prague. This was payback time for the Iron Man, and Bolin wanted to make sure that he came out of it alive. What he would decide to do once this was over, Bolin didn't have a clue. With Schwartz and Blancanales gone, Maybe he would finally hang up his gun and retire. But to reach that decision point, they had to clean out this place first, and that was something Lyons was good at. The minute that he stepped into the main complex, Carl Lyons was well aware that this could be the day he died. But it was going to take a lot of killing to put him down, and he didn't think that any of the Russians were tough enough to get the job done. He wasn't going to let anyone keep him from getting his hands on and his knife into Gregor Rostov. During the briefing, Belinsikov had said that he wanted prisoners taken so he could put them on trial. But the minister didn't understand the realities of fighting under these conditions. Unless someone just happened to fall into their hands when they weren't busy, their chances of taking prisoners were slim to none. Rostov in particular wasn't ever going to stand trial. Not as long as Lyons had anything to say about it. James and Hawkins made their way through a wide corridor, pressed against the opposite walls. So far, they had encountered only two Russians. One had fled, and the other died before they moved on. Their map of the complex had been translated into English, and they were now headed for what was listed as the Command Prime. They had no idea exactly what that was, but it certainly sounded important. They were nearing a T intersection when they heard voices. Halting, they tried to pinpoint the sounds, but the metal walls echoed and it was difficult to hear which way they were coming from. James signaled for Hawkins to move forward and see if he could hear better. 
Crouching, Hawkins made his way along the wall, halting at the corner. Putting his ear to the floor, he heard voices coming from his right, and they weren't speaking English. Signaling his intentions to James, he pulled a fragmentation grenade from his assault harness and pulled the pin. James got ready to back his play, and on a silent count of three, Hawkins heaved the grenade down the right branch of the corridor. The two then stepped from cover, H and K's ready. Shit! Hawkins ducked back to reload and cupped his hand over his ear. This is TJ. Calvin and I have a bunch of them cornered in the corridor, leading to what we think is a control room. Keep them busy. Roger. Kissinger and Manning were headed for what was listed as the power generator deck. Since they had night vision goggles, fighting in the dark wasn't a problem for them, but it might confuse the enemy. Coming to a juncture in the corridor, Manning stopped to check around the corner. They hadn't run into any opposition so far, but he knew the enemy was somewhere. Peering around the edge of the wall, he spotted half a dozen men spread out to cover the door they needed to go through. The gunners were dressed in standard Russian army battle dress, but they all wore turbans. They're Mujahideen. Rostov is pushing Afghani hash, and it looks like he brought his business partners with him. David, we've come across what looks like Muji's guarding the generator deck. We've run into them too. Take them out and get on with it. I heard the man, and I've got just the thing to send him to God. One of my monsters. He dug into his demo pack and came out with two two-ounce blocks of C4 studded with what looked like roofing nails. He put a standard grenade fuse between the two blocks and slapped a couple of wraps of tape around them to hold the improvised grenade together. Get ready to cover me. Kissinger pulled the pin on his monster grenade and cocked his arm back to throw. Now! Ah. Faint noises broke through to Hal Brignola and brought him out of a light sleep. Over the background mechanical sounds of the forced air ventilation system, he thought that he heard the unmistakable sound of automatic weapons fire. There, he heard it again. Swinging his legs to the floor, he looked around his Spartan cell one more time, but he didn't see anything more than he had seen the first two dozen times he had surveyed his stark surroundings. There was absolutely nothing in the cell he could use as a weapon. The gunfire had to mean that Phoenix Force had figured out where he was being held and were coming for him. He vowed that if Rostov's men got to him first, he wasn't going to go down easy. He was going to fight. He quickly took off his shirt, twisted it into a bulky rope, and held it in his hands like a garrote. If he could get it around someone's neck, he could take at least one of the bastards with him. Brignola took his place behind the door, his makeshift garrote ready. Hell? Ah, Stryker! Over here! Bolin and Lyons quickly appeared and punched the button to open the cell door. Hey, you don't look too bad off. Never mind me. Gadgets and Rosario are someplace in here, too. They're dead. I saw them die. No, they're not. Rostov staged their deaths. And they were captured and brought here. He made me watch while Gadgets was being tortured. Lyons seemed unable to speak. Do you know where they're being held? No, but they've got to be somewhere close. I saw Gadgets yesterday. Then something hardened in Lyons' eyes. Stryker, you take care of Hal. I'll go find them. I'm not staying here. Give me a gun and I'll come with you. Hal, we have to get you out of here alive, and that means keeping you out of the line of fire. Just give me a damn gun. I can take care of myself. Bolin drew the Beretta 93R from his shoulder rig and handed it to the big fed. You got the extra magazines for this? The executioner handed him the two spare clips from the pouch on his harness, and Brignola stuffed them in his left front pocket. Let's go. This is Stryker. We've secured the package. Hey, great! We've received new information. Be on the lookout for Schwartz and Blancanales. What? They're alive? I'll explain it later. Just keep an eye out for them. If they're in here, we'll find them. Yeah, and save Rostov for me. I want that bastard. Blancanales, just like Brignola, had heard the sounds of gunfire echoing through the complex. His partner, however, was still unconscious from Rostov's last interrogation session. Schwartz had been in bad shape when the guards brought him back. His body had been jerking as if he were having seizures, and his heartbeat had been erratic. He seemed more stable now, and Blancanales knew that sleep was good for him. He was going to the door to see if he could see anything in the corridor outside when Lyons burst through the door with Brignola and Bolin at his heels. Lyons stopped cold, not believing his eyes. It's about time you showed up. We were beginning to think that you'd split for Hawaii or something. 
Lyons closed his eyes for a moment. I thought you guys were dead. I saw you get shot all to hell. That's what Rostov wanted you to think. They shot us with tranquilizer darts. What happened to Gadgets? He's been tortured pretty badly. Rostov used a nerve induction machine and kept asking him questions about how, wanting to know why he had come to Moscow. Of course, Gadgets didn't know anything, so they kept zapping him until he passed out. Lyons kneeled beside the narrow cot and checked his pulse. Damn it, Gadgets. You'd better not die on me now, you bastard. Schwartz's eyes opened and he tried to lift his head. Carl, how are you feeling? Help me up. I'm coming with you guys. You two are going to stay right here. Lyons stripped off his comm link and handed it to Blancanales. Use this to call for help if you guys get in trouble, but I want you to keep out of this. We'll get back to you when this is over. Hal, I want you to stay here too while we secure the rest of this place. I know you want to get at Rostov, but I think Carl has a prior claim. So if you don't want to have to tangle with the Iron Man as well, I think you should stay put here. Uh, you got a point. I'll stay and guard them. Good man. I promise you that I'll take care of Rostov. Boland made a call over the comm link. Stryker here. We found our men. Requesting status. All right. Good to hear, Stryker. Hawkins and I are still working on getting into the control room. I'll radio in for further updates. All right, James. Manning, how are you and the cowboy doing? We've secured the generator room. You want me to cut the power? No, we need to keep the ventilator system running. But stand by there. Roger. Boris Detloff was trying to follow the battle inside the mother site, but the Americans were smart enough to shoot out the video cameras each time they came across one. From what little he could see, though, the battle wasn't going well. Outside, the Spetsnaz had taken heavy casualties, but they had managed to roll up half of the defenses. And for all of Rostov's combat experience, he wasn't performing well this time either. He could see the defenders starting to flee their bunkers, and it had become very clear that it was time for him to abandon his post in the command center and try to save his life as well. He knew that Rostov would stay and die, but he had no intention of going down with him. Picking up his AK-74, he headed for the soundproof door. Dedloff didn't want any part of the firefight going on outside his door. He walked over to the elevator. When the elevator door opened, he waited to see if there was any gunfire, but it seemed that this section of the complex was clear. With his AK at the ready, he raced down the corridor to one of the emergency airlocks that led outside. Hal Brignola heard the sounds of hard leather boot soles running toward their cell. He had disabled the lock, but had swung the door shut for their protection. Looking through the barred window, he saw one of the Russians racing down the corridor. He started to back up when he recognized who it was, Rostov's second in command. He waited until the last moment to slam the door open. What the fuck? Hey, scumbag! Brignola pulled the door shut behind him as he stepped back into the room. One more for the good guys. Rostov was down to only a handful of Afghani defenders. Even with his extensive knowledge of the complex, the Yankees were proving to be more than his men could handle. Every time they had tried to ambush them, it had been turned around on them. Too late, he realized that it had been too long since he had come up against real professionals. Boris, come in. No answer. Detloff, answer me, damn it! Boris! He realized that Detloff was either dead or had run out on him. But he still had his few Afghanis, and they could fight their way out. As long as he was alive, his empire was intact, and he could run it from anywhere in Russia. Ah! The Afghani on point suddenly fell to the floor. The other Afghanis dived for cover as a firestorm erupted in the close quarters. One by one, the Afghanis collapsed to the floor. When his AK locked on an empty magazine, Rostov frantically jumped the magazine and was searching for a fresh one when he realized that his ammo pouch was empty. At the same time, he saw that he was the last man standing and that several submachine guns were aimed at him. Don't shoot him! He's mine! Seeing the invaders relax, but not pulling their weapons off target, Rostov slowly bent to lay his empty assault rifle at his feet. Since he wasn't dead yet, this wasn't over. When the Yankee who had shouted for the others not to shoot put down his shotgun, Rostov realized that he had to be the so-called Iron Man. The Russian's hand went down to his boot top and he came up with a jumbia, the curved dagger of the Arabic world. He had killed more men than he could remember with the blade, and he would send this American down to hell with him. He beckoned with his other hand. Come on, Yankee. 
Lion smiled as he drew his Tonto fighting knife from his harness. The Russian's curved dagger was a good slashing weapon, but the chisel-pointed Tonto was far better for what he had in mind. All he would have to do was block the Russian's slashes until he could get close enough to gut him. Rostov liked seeing Lyons' smile. It told him that the American was a little too confident. He had never seen a straight-bladed knife like the one the Yankee carried, but it didn't look that fast, and it was single-edged, so that it was no good for a backslash. Since this was going to be his last knife fight, he might as well put all he had into it. Rostov made the first move, a slashing attack from left to right with a nasty backslash at the end of it. The Jumbia's backslash caught him across the top of his left forearm. Rostov smiled when he saw the blood and stepped forward for a second attack. Rostov slashed down to parry, aiming for Lyons' knife arm. But the big ex-cop used the bottom of his left forearm to deliver a stunning blow to the top of Rostov's wrist, knocking the curved dagger off target. The second half of his move drove the Tonto fighting knife all the way to the guard in the pit of Rostov's stomach, the chisel-shaped point severing his aorta. The Russian's eyes grew wide at the sudden loss of blood, but before he could die, Lyons ripped the knife upward, gutting him. The last thing the Russian saw was his intestines spilling out of his belly. Lyons retrieved his knife, wiped off the blood on Rostov's uniform, and sheathed it. Now we can go home. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Hal Brignola found the war room packed to the walls when he walked in. It had been a week since he had returned from Russia, and since this was expected to be the final gathering of the Stony Man Farm crew before the expected presidential axe fell, everyone who could find a seat or a place to stand was in attendance. First off, Gadget Schwartz is going to be okay. The neuro people at Walter Reed say that no permanent damage was done to his arm. I gave him a couple of weeks off, R&R &R, as it were, but he'll be back to duty right after that. Did he say where he was going? Um, he said something about trying to look in on the Abalone Festival in the British Virgin Islands. Blancanales and Lyons exchanged grins. Their partner was headed for one of the Caribbean's finer cat houses, the Abalone Shell on St. Thomas. As soon as this meeting was over and they had received their walking papers, they'd join him there for a well-deserved rum punch, or three. As most of you know, Gregor Rostov and most of his henchmen are dead, and the Russian Mafia is in complete disarray. It's gone back to being a collection of petty gangsters, without any central guiding hand, and they'll be a lot easier to deal with. To keep after them, Minister Volinsikov has been appointed the new head of the Russian Justice Department, and they'll be working closely with our government. Equally important, the planned military coup of General Belislav has been put down as well. There will be no military rule in Russia for a while, at least. The intercepts cats made in Budapest have been turned over to Interpol, and they're conducting massive sweeps in Western Europe. So far, they've been getting good results and expect them to continue. This was more good news because many of the European gangs had established U.S. connections, and the last thing America needed was to find itself awash in Afghan hashish. And lastly, Barbara, your little revolt here didn't happen. Say again? I told the president that nothing out of the ordinary happened here at the farm during the last mission. How in the hell did you manage to pull that off, Hal? Brignola smiled like a Cheshire cat. Well, as it turns out, Minister Volinsikov and I had this plan in place to find the leak in his ministry, and it included having cats and the field teams fade out of sight for a while. That forced Rostov to have to expose himself more and more until we were able to get a hook into him and shut him down. Hal, I've heard a lot of bullshit in my day, but that's the biggest load of crap I've ever heard. Isn't it, though? I thought it was rather clever. Are you trying to tell me that the president bought that story? Of course he did. All politicians like to hear bedtime stories with happy endings. It lets them sleep at night without worrying. And since the story came on the minister's own letterhead, it's a classic example of the new spirit of cooperation between our two governments. Letters of commendation from the Russians with endorsements from the White House have been placed in all of your files. Are you telling me that it's over? That's all there is? Yep. 
You can unpack your gear now, and go back to work. Well, I'll be damned. And Kurtzman, you will be, if you ever try anything like that again. One free revolt per lifetime is all you get. The next time any of you people try to pull something like that, I'll be all over you like white on rice. Brignola then reached into his briefcase. Oh, yeah. There's one more thing. Here it comes. Grab your ankles. This cooperative effort works so well that the President wants you to look into assisting the Red Chinese with putting down the Tong groups in Hong Kong. Now that China's taken over the city, the Tongs have become a real problem. It seems that they have a new leader, and he's become more than they can deal with. Price shook her head in disbelief and looked over at Kurtzman. Since we're still packed up and ready to go, Aaron, you want to drive over to that chicken farm and get settled in? Kurtzman unlocked his wheelchair and started to back away from the table. Yeah, let's get the hell out of here before they chain us to the floor again. Stony Man Breach of Trust is a graphic audio production. Copyright 2006, The Cutting Corporation. Performed by Terence Aselford, Nanette Savard, Richard Rowan, Thomas Penny, Christopher Grayville, David Coyne, Jeff Baker, Karen Carbone, Casey Jones, Dolores King-Williams, and Mort Shelby. Additional red shirts by The Dead Giveaways. Directed by Terence Aselford. Produced by Rick Rowan and Dwayne Beeman. Executive producers James Cutting, Mary Cutting, and Angie Cornett. Dialogue editing by Johann Detweiler and Brian Rogers. Graphic audio sound design by Brian Rogers and Johann Detweiler. Script adaptation by Dan Smith. The Stony Man theme was composed by Mark Ashby. Additional original music by Matt Webb, Nathaniel Perry, and Chris Rowan. If you enjoyed Stony Man, be sure to look for Don Pendleton's Mac Bolan and The Executioner. Available at road stops everywhere at 1-800-670-5220 or at www.cuttingaudio.com. Keep listening for previews of other graphic audio titles. Graphic Audio announces Crimson Karaoke. You're wasting beauty to stay alive. Got to be ruthless. And now let's hear from our panel of celebrity judges. First, that psychopathic killer with the heart of pitch, Court Strasser. Listening to that makes me want to peel your eyelids away from your skull. What? Drive hot smoking irons into the sockets no. and suck the no. jelly from out of your ears. Huh? Why? Why would you say such a thing? Why would you say such a thing? I'm the greatest singer in the world! And everyone's favorite Russian villain, from such Deathlands titles as Red Holocaust and Red Equinox, Grigory Zimyanyan. Yes, um, it's um, most terrible. Most terrible sounds coming from you with this... Uh, uh, I agree with the school face over here. What? Death to you. I, I, I don't understand. And from Deathlands 47, Mutie number 6. <sighs> I would have to disagree, gentlemen. I found it rather moving. Yeah! It possesses a tonal quality not unlike that of a young Tom Jones. You did it, did it, did it. What? Am I the only one who thinks so? So, you want to be a recording superstar? Here's your chance. First, listen to our new Deathlands song, Stuck in the Deathlands. The first version of it contains the lyrics, the second version is just the music. Here's what you do. Either change or write your own lyrics, record yourself singing along with the music only track and then email the files to crimsonsuperstar at cuttingaudio.com or you can call and sing or recite into the phone at 
Wait for the machine to start recording and say your name, phone number, or email address, and then start singing or reciting your lyrics. And remember, the answering system can only record up to four minutes. The winner will have their version of the song published in upcoming graphic audio titles, as well as posted on our website, and will receive five free graphic audio titles in the format of their choice. The contest ends July 31st, 2006, so start recording. For full contest rules, go to our website, www.cuttingaudio.com. You're wasting beauties just to stay alive. Got to be ruthless if you wanna survive. I see you headed for another bill. To meet a baron, you might have to chill a well, When it's time to rock and roll, you'll be the first one to lock and load. Stuck in the death lands and nowhere to go. It won't be easy just to duck and die Here comes the enemy coming in quick So draw your six hour 226 And now when it's time to rock and roll You'll be the first one to lock and load Stuck in the deathlands and nowhere to go
Deathlands number 15, Chill Factor. Ryan Cotter and his band of Outlanders have finally found a safe haven in New Mexico, until the unthinkable happens. Ryan, Dean, been kidnapped. What? When did it happen? Who took him? Yesterday. Slavers from the north and their leader. Ryan, it was Zimyanyan. Zimyanyan? Now, Ryan must venture alone into a freezing wasteland to find his son, while being pursued by a pre-dark technological nightmare. Fucking bastard sectroid! You won't take me down! He's impervious to bullets! And all the while, Dean Carter must endure the harsh reality of slave labor without revealing himself to the sadistic Grigori Zimyanyan. Why do I have the sense of something hidden about you, young man? I don't know. I look at you, and my memory stirs. Why is that? I said I don't know! <clears throat> Watch yourself, boy. There are many here that would spread your lower limbs and attempt to penetrate your young body. I can do little to prevent it. Ryan must go undercover as one of Zimyanyan's slaves in order to save the newest member of his family. You there! What happened to your eye? Injured in a rock fall, Major Commissar. I'll wash it and put a rag over it, and I'll be fine. And when Zamyanyan finally discovers the truth, it remains to be seen whether Ryan and Dean will be able to escape his clutches. You, boy, with your curly brown hair. The man with the eye wound. His left eye. Of course. My father will kill you for kidnapping me, Major. Not if I kill him first. I want to rip out his heart and devour it, so bitter is my hatred for him, Master Cotter. And now he is coming for you. <laughs> I will use you as bait to capture him. <laughs> Deathlands number 15, Chill Factor, seven unabridged hours in graphic audio. Deathlands 15, Chill Factor, will be in travel centers and truck stops throughout North America starting July 2006. Or call 1-800-670-5220 to reserve or download your advanced copy of Chill Factor. For your convenience, this information is also printed on the cover of this book. Ryan Cotter has fought his way through hell, a terrain that covers far too much of the Deathlands. With his son Dean at his side, he finds himself close to a safe haven for friends and comrades that has been burned to the ground. Hurried notes from his beloved Christy guide the way to answers, but the solution and his missing friends will only lead to more peril, at the hands of someone Ryan should have killed when he had the chance. Ryan must free himself from the clutches of a mutant who's as clever as he is sadistic, and wants Carter's blood by the gallons. My people follow me, long as I chill norms. More norms I chill, more they think I'm close to a god. <laughs> You'll go out with a big bang, Carter. That I promise you, real big bang. You murderous freak bastard. As good as Ryan Carter is, he's still only human. And one of his closest allies may pay for his shortcomings with his life. Oh, Christ, Jack. No. I'll never forgive that one-eyed bastard if anything's happened to Jack. I swear it. New friendships are made, old allies are rediscovered, and fresh hatred is forged in the Deathlands. Don't miss one minute of Deathlands number 16, Moon Fate. Deathlands 16, Moon Fate, will be in travel centers and truck stops throughout North America starting July 2006. Or call 1-800-670-5220 to reserve or download your advanced copy of Moon Fate. For your convenience, this information is also printed on the cover of this book.
Over the skies of Tibet streaks the cutting edge in American technology. My God, what a plane! The new ES-1 spy plane, the best America has to offer. Enjoying the flight there, Jack? You would not believe how this baby handles. The envy of the world. Well, what do you see? And a target for America's enemies. Oh my God. What is it, Jack? Migs. Jack, what is it? Jack? Mayday! 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 Jack! Barbara, what is it? I think Jack is dead. This plane has gone down somewhere in Tibet. I don't believe it. There were MiGs, Stryker. I'm afraid he's lost. I don't care. I'm going in. Macpolin number 89. Strike and retrieve. Macbolin 89, Strike and Retrieve, will be in travel centers and truck stops throughout North America starting July 2006. Or call 1-800-670-5220 to reserve or download your advanced copy of Strike and Retrieve. For your convenience, this information is also printed on the cover of this book. Don't waste time searching the stores for the next installment of your favorite series or stories you've missed. Call 1-800-670-5220 and order direct in CD, cassette, or MP3 CD formats. Or plug into Graphic Audio's website where you can order it in those formats. Or for accelerated gratification, download it right now for your computer or digital player. It'll be online before anywhere else. You'll also get free screensavers, ringtones, games, and other goodies. www.cuttingaudio.com and 1-800-670-5220.